to the hesitating purchaser. If sailor tales to sailor tunes, storm and adventure, heat and cold, if schooners, islands and maroons, and buccaneers and buried gold, and all the old romance retold exactly in the ancient way, can please, as me they pleased of old, the wiser youngsters of today, so be it and fall on. If not, if studious youth no longer crave, his ancient appetites forgot, Kingston or Ballantyne the brave, or Cooper of the wood and wave, so be it also. And may I and all my pirates share the grave where these and their creations lie. Part One, The Old Buccaneer. Chapter One, The Old Sea Dog at the Admiral Benbow. Squire Trelawney, Dr. Livesey, and the rest of these gentlemen, having asked me to write down the whole particulars about Treasure Island, from the beginning to the end, keeping nothing back but the bearings of the island, and that only because there is still treasure not yet lifted, I take up my pen in the year of grace 1783 and go back to the time when my father kept the Admiral Benbow in, and the brown old seaman with the sabre cut first took up his lodging under our roof. I remember him as if it were yesterday, as he came plodding to the inn door, his sea chest following behind him in a hand barrow, a tall, strong, heavy, nut-brown man, his tarry pigtail falling over the shoulder of his soiled blue coat, his hands ragged and scarred, with black broken nails, and the sabre cut across one cheek, a dirty, livid white. I remember him looking round the cover and whistling to himself as he did so, and then breaking out in that old sea song that he sang so often afterwards. Fifteen men on the dead man's chest, yo-ho-ho ho, and a bottle of rum. In the high old tottering voice, that seemed to have been tuned and broken at the capstan bars. Then he rapped on the door with a bit of stick like a handspike that he carried. And when my father appeared, called roughly for a glass of rum. This, when it was brought to him, he drank slowly like a connoisseur, lingering on the taste and still looking about him at the cliffs and up at our signboard. This is a handy cove, says he at length, and a pleasant sitiated grog shop. Much company, mate? My father told him no, very little company, the more was the pity. Well then, says he, this is the berth for me. Here, you matey, he cried to the man who trundled the barrow. Bring up alongside and help up my chest. I'll stay here a bit, he continued. I'm a plain man, rum and bacon and eggs is what I want and that head up there for to watch ships off. What you might call me? You might call me Captain. Oh, I see what you're at. There. And he threw down three or four gold pieces on the threshold. You can tell me when I work through that, says he, looking as fierce as a commander. And indeed, bad as his clothes were, and coarsely as he spoke, he had none of the appearance of a man who sailed before the mast but seemed like a mate or skipper, accustomed to be obeyed or to strike. The man who came with the barrow told us the mail had set him down the morning before at the Royal George, that he'd inquired what inns there were along the coast, and hearing ours well spoken of, I suppose, and described as lonely, had chosen it from the others for his place of residence. And that was all we could learn of our guest. He was a very silent man by custom, all day he hung round the cave or upon the cliffs with a brass telescope. All evening he sat in a corner of the parlour next to the fire and drank rum and water very strong. Mostly he would not speak when spoken to, only look up sudden and fierce and blow through his nose like a foghorn. And we and the people who came about our house soon learned to let him be. Every day when he came back from his stroll, he would ask if any seafaring man had gone by along the road. At first we thought it was the want of company of his own kind that made him ask this question, but at last we began to see he was desirous to avoid them. When a seaman did put up at the Admiral Benbow, 
as now and then some did, making by the coast road for Bristol. He would look in at him through the curtained door before he entered the parlour. And he was always sure to be as silent as a mouse when any such was present. For me, at least, there was no secret about the matter, for I was, in a way, a sharer in his alarms. He had taken me aside one day and promised me a silver fortney on the first of every month if I would only keep my weather eye open for a seafaring man with one leg and let him know the moment he appeared. Often enough, when the first of the month came round and I applied to him for my wage, he would only blow through his nose at me and stare me down. But before the week was out, he was sure to think better of it, bring me my fortnight piece, and repeat his orders to look out for the seafaring man with one leg. How that personage haunted my dreams, I need scarcely tell you. On stormy nights, when the wind shook the four corners of the house, and the surf roared along the cove and up the cliffs, I would see him in a thousand forms and with a thousand diabolical expressions. Now the leg would be cut off at the knee, now at the hip. Now he was a monstrous kind of creature who had never had but the one leg, and that in the middle of his body. To see him leap and run and pursue me over hedge and ditch was the worst of nightmares. And altogether I paid pretty dear for my monthly fortnight piece in the shape of these abominable fancies. But though I was so terrified by the idea of the seafaring man with one leg, I was far less afraid of the captain himself than anybody else who knew him. There were nights when he took a good deal more rum and water than his head would carry, and then he would sometimes sit and sing his wicked old wild sea songs, minding nobody. But sometimes, he would call for glasses round and force all the trembling company to listen to his stories or bear a chorus to his singing. Often I've heard the house shaking with yo-ho-ho -ho and a bottle of rum, all the neighbours joining in for dear life with the fear of death upon them, and each singing louder than the other to avoid remark. For in these fits he was the most overriding companion ever known. He would slap his hand on the table for silence all round, he would fly up in a passion of anger at a question, or sometimes because none was put, and so he judged the company was not following his story. Nor would he allow anyone to leave the inn till he had drunk himself sleepy and reeled off to bed. His stories were what frightened people worst of all. Dreadful stories they were, about hanging and walking the plank and storms at sea and the dry tortugas and wild deeds and places on the Spanish main. By his own account, he must have lived his life among some of the wickedest men God ever allowed upon the sea. And the language in which he told these stories shocked our plain country people almost as much as the crimes that he described. My father was always saying the inn would be ruined, for people would soon cease coming there to be tyrannized over and put down and sent shivering to their beds. But I really believe his presence did us good. People were frightened at the time, but on looking back, they rather liked it. It was a fine excitement in a quiet country life, and there was even a party of the younger men who pretended to admire him, calling him a true sea dog and a real old salt and such like names, and saying there was the sort of man that made England terrible at sea. In one way, indeed, he bade fair to ruin us, for he kept on staying week after week and at last month after month, so that all the money had been long exhausted. And still my father never plucked up the heart to insist on having more. If ever he mentioned it, the captain blew through his nose so loudly you might say he roared and stared my poor father out of the room. I've seen him wringing his hands after such a rebuff, and I'm sure the annoyance and the terror he lived in must have greatly hastened his early and unhappy death. All the time he lived with us, the captain made no change whatever in his dress but to buy some stockings from a hawker. One of the cocks of his hat having fallen down, he let it hang from that day forth, though it was a great annoyance when it blew. I remember the appearance of his coat, which he patched himself upstairs in his room, and which before the end was nothing but patches. He never wrote or received a letter, and he never spoke with any but the neighbors, and with these, for the most part, only when drunk on rum. The great sea chest none of us had ever seen open. 
He was only once crossed, and that was towards the end, when my poor father was far gone in a decline that took him off. Dr. Livesey came late one afternoon to see the patient, took a bit of dinner for my mother, and went into the parlour to smoke a pipe till his horse should come down from the hamlet, for we had no stabling at the old Benbow. I followed him in, and I remember observing the contrast. The neat, bright doctor, with his powder as white as snow, and his bright black eyes and pleasant manners, made with the coatish country folk, and above all, with that filthy, heavy, blared scarecrow of a pirate of ours, sitting far gone in rum, with his arms on the table. Suddenly, he, the captain, that is, began to pipe up his eternal song. Fifteen men on the dead man's chest. Yo ho ho, and a bottle of rum. Drink, and the devil had done for the rest. Yo ho ho, and a bottle of rum. At first, I'd supposed the dead man's chest to be that identical big box of his upstairs in the front room. And the thought had been mingled in my nightmares with that of the one-legged seafaring man. But by this time, we had all long ceased to pay any particular notice to the song. It was new that night to nobody but Dr. Livesey, and on him I observed it did not produce an agreeable effect, for he looked up for a moment quite angrily before he went on with his talk to old Taylor, the gardener, on a new cure for the rheumatics. In the meantime, the captain gradually brightened up at his own music, and at last flapped his hand upon the table before him in a way we all knew to mean silence. The voices stopped at once, all but Dr. Livesey's. He went on as before, speaking clear and kind and drawing briskly at his pipe between every word or two. The captain glared at him for a while, flapped his hand again, glared still harder, and at last broke out with a villainous low oath. Silence there between decks! Were you addressing me, sir? says the doctor. And when the ruffian had told him with another oath that this was so, I have only one thing to say to you, sir, replies the doctor, that if you keep on drinking rum, the world will soon be quit of a very dirty scoundrel. The old fellow's fury was awful. He sprang to his feet, drew and opened a sailor's clasp knife, and balancing it open on the palm of his hand, threatened to pin the doctor to the wall. The doctor never so much as moved. He spoke to him as before, over his shoulder and in the same tone of voice, rather high, so that all the room might hear, but perfectly calm and steady. If you do not put that knife this instant in your pocket, I promise upon my honour you shall hang at the next assizes. Then followed a battle of looks between them. But the captain soon knuckled under, put up his weapon, and resumed his seat, grumbling like a beaten dog. And now, sir, continued the doctor, since I now know there's such a fellow in my district, you may count I'll have an eye upon you day and night. I'm not a doctor only, I'm a magistrate. And if I catch a breath of complaint against you, if it's only for a piece of incivility like tonight's, I'll take effectual means to have you hunted down and routed out of this. Let that suffice. Soon after, Dr. Livesey's horse came to the door and he rode away. But the captain held his peace that evening, and for many evenings to come. Chapter 2 Black Dog Appears and Disappears It was not very long after this that there occurred the first of the mysterious events that rid us at last of the captain. Though not, as you will see, of his affairs. It was a bitter cold winter, with long, hard frosts and heavy gales, and it was plain from the first that my poor father was little likely to see the spring. He sank daily, and my mother and I had all the inn upon our hands, and were kept busy enough without paying much regard to our unpleasant guest. It was one January morning, very early, a pinching frosty morning, the cove all grey with hoar frost, the ripple lapping softly on the stones, the sun still low and only touching the hilltops and shining far to seaward. The captain had risen earlier than usual and set out down the beach, his cutlass swinging under the broad skirts of his old blue coat, his brass telescope under his arm, his hat tilted back upon his head. I remember his breath hanging like smoke in his wake as he strode off. 
and the last sound I heard of him as he turned the big rock was a loud snort of indignation as though his mind was still running upon Dr. Livesey. Well, Mother was upstairs with Father and I was laying the breakfast table against the captain's return when the parlour door opened and a man stepped in on whom I'd never set my eyes before. He was a pale, tallowy creature, wanting two fingers of the left hand. And though he wore a cutlass, he did not look much like a fighter. I had always my eye open for seafaring men, with one leg or two, and I remember this one puzzled me. He was not sailorly, and yet he had a smack of the sea about him too. I asked him what was for his service, and he said he would take rum. But as I was going out of the room to fetch it, he sat down upon a table and motioned me to draw near. I paused where I was with my napkin in my hand. Come here, Sonny, says he. Come nearer here. I took a step nearer. Is this here table for my mate Bill? He asked with a kind of leer. I told him I did not know his mate Bill, and this was for a person who stayed in our house, whom we called the captain. Well, said he, my mate Bill would be called the captain as like as not. He has a cut on one cheek in a mighty pleasant way with him, particularly in drink, as my mate Bill. We'll put it for argument, like, that your captain has a cut on one cheek, and we'll put it, if you like, that that cheek's the right one. Ah, well, I told you. Now, is my mate Bill in this here house? I told him he was out walking. Which way, Sonny? Which way has he gone? And when I pointed out the rock and told him how the captain was likely to return and how soon, and answered a few other questions, I said he, this'll be as good as drink to my mate, Bill. The expression of his face as he said these words was not at all pleasant, and I had my own reasons for thinking that the stranger was mistaken, even supposing he meant what he said. But it was no affair of mine, I thought, and besides, it was difficult to know what to do. The stranger kept hanging about just inside the inn door, peering round the corner like a cat waiting for a mouse. Once I stepped out myself into the road, but he immediately called me back. And as I did not obey quick enough for his fancy, a most horrible change came over his tallowy face, and he ordered me in with an oath that made me jump. As soon as I was back again, he returned to his former manner. Half fawning, half sneering, patted me on the shoulder, told me I was a good boy and he had taken quite a fancy to me. I have a son of my own, said he, as like you as two blocks, and he's all the pride of my heart. But the great thing for boys is discipline, sonny, discipline. Now, if you'd sailed along a bill, you wouldn't have stood there to be spoke to twice, not you. That was never Bill's way, nor the way as such as sailed with him. And he is sure enough is my mate, Bill, with a spyglass under his arm, bless his old heart, to be sure. You and me will just go back into the parlour, Sonny, and get behind the door, and we'll give Bill a little surprise, bless his heart, I say again. So saying, the stranger backed along with me into the parlour and put me behind him in the corner, so that we were both hidden by the open door. I was very uneasy and alarmed, as you may fancy, and it rather added to my fears to observe that the stranger was certainly frightened himself. He cleared the hilt of his cutlass and loosened the blade in the sheath, and all the time we were waiting there, he kept swallowing as if he felt what we used to call a lump in the throat. At last, in strode the captain, slammed the door behind him without looking to the right or left, and marched straight across the room to where his breakfast awaited him. Bill! said the stranger, in a voice I thought he'd tried to make bold and big. The captain spun round on his heel and fronted us. All the brown had gone out of his face, and even his nose was blue. He had the look of a man who sees a ghost, or the evil one, or something worse, if anything can be. And upon my word, I felt sorry to see him all in a moment turn so old and sick. Come, Bill, you know me. You know an old shipmate, Bill, surely, said the stranger. The captain made a sort of gasp. Black dog, said he. And who else, returned the other, getting more at his ease. Black dog as ever was, 
come for to see his old shipmate Billy and the Admiral Ben Bowen. Ah, Bill, Bill. We've seen a sight of times, us two, since I lost them two talons, holding up his mutilated hand. Now look here, said the captain. You've run me down, here I am. Well then, speak up, what is it? That's you, Bill, returned Black Dog. You're in the right of it, Billy. I'll have a glass of rum from this dear child here, as I've took such a liking to, and we'll sit down, if you please, and talk square like old shipmates. When I returned with the rum, they were already seated on either side of the captain's breakfast table. Black Dog next to the door and sitting sideways so as to have one eye on his old shipmate, and one, as I thought, on his retreat. He bade me go and leave the door wide open. None of your keyholes for me, Sonny, he said, and I left them together and retired into the bar. For a long time, though, I certainly did my best to listen. I could hear nothing but a low gatling, but at last the voices began to grow higher, and I could pick up a word or two, mostly oaths, from the captain. No, 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 and there's an end of it, he cried once, and again, if it comes to swinging, swing all, say I. Then, all of a sudden, there was a tremendous explosion of oaths and other noises. The chair and table went over in a lump. A clash of steel followed, and then a cry of pain. And the next instant, I saw Black Dog in full flight, and the captain hotly pursuing, both with drawn cutlasses, and the former streaming blood from the left shoulder. Just at the door, the captain aimed at the fugitive one last tremendous cut, which would certainly have split him to the chine had it not been intercepted by our big signboard of Admiral Benbow, you may see the notch on the lower side of the frame to this day. That blow was the last of the battle. Once out upon the road, Black Dog, in spite of his wound, showed a wonderful clean pair of heels and disappeared over the edge of the hill in half a minute. The captain, for his part, stood staring at the signboard like a bewildered man. Then he passed his hand over his eyes several times, and at last turned back into the house. Jim, says he, rum. And as he spoke, he reeled a little and caught himself with one hand against the wall. Are you hurt? cried I. Rum, he repeated. I must get away from here. Rum, rum. I ran to fetch it, but I was quite unsteadied by all that had fallen out, and I broke one glass and fouled the tap, and while I was getting in my own way, I heard a loud fall in the parlour, and running in, beheld the captain lying full length upon the floor. At the same instant, my mother, alarmed by the cries and fighting, came running downstairs to help me. Between us, we raised his head. He was breathing very loud and hard, but his eyes were closed and his face a horrible colour. Dear, deary me, cried my mother. What a disgrace upon the house. And your poor father's sick. In the meantime, we had no idea what to do to help the captain, nor any other thought but that he had got his death hurt in the scuffle with the stranger. I got the rum, to be sure, and tried to put it down his throat, but his teeth were tightly shut and his jaws as strong as iron. It was a happy relief for us when the door opened and Dr. Livesey came in on his visit to my father. Oh, doctor, he cried, what shall we do? Where is he wounded? Wounded? A fiddlestick's end, said the doctor. No more wounded than your eye. The man has had a stroke, as I warned him. Now, Mrs. Hawkins, just you run upstairs to your husband and tell him, if possible, nothing about it. For my part, I must do my best to save this fellow's trebly worthless life. Jim, you get me a basin. When I got back with the basin, the doctor had already ripped up the captain's sleeve and exposed his great sinewy arm. It was tattooed in several places. Here's luck, a fair wind, and Billy Bones' his fancy were very neatly and clearly executed on the forearm. And up near the shoulder, there was a sketch of a gallows and a man hanging from it, done, as I thought, with great spirit. Prophetic, said the doctor touching this picture with his finger. And now, Master Billy Bones, if that be your name, we'll have a look at the colour of your blood. Jim, he said, are you afraid of blood? No, sir, said I. Well then, said he, you hold the basin. And with that, he took his lancet and opened a vein. 
A great deal of blood was taken before the captain opened his eyes and looked mistily about him. First he recognized the doctor with an unmistakable frown. Then his glance fell upon me, and he looked relieved. But suddenly his color changed, and he tried to raise himself, crying, Where's Black Dog? There is no Black Dog here, said the doctor, except what you have on your own back. You've been drinking rum, you've had a stroke, precisely as I told you. And I have just, very much against my own will, dragged you head foremost out of the grave. Now, Mr. Bones... That's not my name, he interrupted. Much I care, returned the doctor. It's the name of a buccaneer of my acquaintance, and I call you by it for the sake of shortness. And what I have to say to you is this. One glass of rum won't kill you. But if you take one, you'll take another and another. And I'll stake my wig, if you don't break off short, you'll die. You understand that? Die and go to your own place, like the man in the Bible. Come now, make an effort. I'll help you to your bed for once. Between us, with much trouble, we managed to hoist him upstairs and laid him on his bed, where his head fell back on the pillow as if he were almost fainting. Now, mind you, said the doctor, I clear my conscience. The name of rum for you is death. And with that, he went off to see my father, taking me with him by the arm. This is nothing, he said as soon as he closed the door. I've drawn blood enough to keep him quiet a while. He should lie for a week where he is. That's the best thing for him and you. But another stroke would settle him. Chapter 3 the black spot. About noon, I stopped at the captain's door with some cooling drinks and medicines. He was lying very much as we left him, only a little higher, and he seemed both weak and excited. Jim, he said, you're the only one here that's worth anything, and you know I've always been good to you. Never a month but I've given you a silver fork me for yourself. And now you see, mate, I'm pretty low deserted by all. And, Jim, you bring me one noggin of rum now, won't you, matey? The doctor, I began. But he broke in cursing the doctor, in a feeble voice, but heartily. Doctors is all swamps, he said. And that doctor there, why, what do we know about seafaring men? I've been in places hot as pitch and mates dropping round with Yellow Jack and the blessed land a heaving like the sea with earthquakes. What did the doctor know of lands like that? And I lived on rum, I tell you. It's been meat and drink, a man and wife to me. If I'm not to have my rum now, I'm a poor old hulk on a lee shore. My blood will be on you, Jim, and that doctor swab. And he ran on again for a while with curses. Look, Jim, how my fingers fidges, he continued in the pleading tone. I can't keep them still, not I. I haven't had a drop this blessed day. That doctor's a fool, I tell you. If I don't have my drain of rum, Jim, I'll have the horrors. I've seen some of them already. I've seen old Flint in the corner there behind you. As plain as print, I've seen him. And if I get the horrors, I'm a man that has lived rough, and I'll raise Cain. Your doctor himself said one glass wouldn't hurt me. I'll give you a golden guinea for a noggin, Jim. He was growing more and more excited, and this alarmed me for my father, who was very low that day and needed quiet. Besides, I was reassured by the doctor's words, now quoted to me, and rather offended by the offer of a bribe. I want none of your money, said I, but what you owe my father. I get you one glass and no more. When I brought it to him, he seized it greedily and drank it out. Aye, aye, said he. Ask some better, sure enough. And now, matey, did that doctor say how long I was to lie here in this old berth? A week at least, said I. Thunder, he cried. A week? I can't do that. They'll have the black spot on me by then. The lubbers is going about to get the wind of me this blessed moment. Lubbers as couldn't keep what they got, and want to nail what is another's. Is that seemingly behaviour now, I want to know? But I'm a saving soul. I never wasted good money of mine, nor lost it neither. And I'll trick them again. 
I'm not afraid of him. I'll shake out another reef, matey, and daddle him again. As he was thus speaking, he'd risen from bed with great difficulty, hold into my shoulder with a grip that almost made me cry out, and moving his legs like so much dead weight. His words, spirited as they were in meaning, contrasted sadly with the weakness of the voice in which they were uttered. He paused when he got into a sitting position on the edge. A doctor's done me, he murmured. My ears is singing. Lay me back. Before I could do much to help him, he'd fallen back again to his former place, where he lay for a while silent. Jem, he said at length, you saw that seafaring man today. Black dog, I asked. Ah, black dog, says he. He's a bad one, but there's worse that put him harm. Now, if I can't get away, no how, and they tip me the black spot, Mind you, it's my own sea chest they're after. You get on a horse. You can, can't you? Well, then, you get on a horse and go to... Well, yes, I will. To that eternal doctor swab and tell him to pipe all hands, magistrates and such, and he'll lay him aboard to the Admiral Benbow. All old Flint's crew, man and boy, all of them that's left. I was first mate, I was. Old Flint's first mate. And I'm the only one as knows the place. He gave it me at Savannah when he lay a-dying. Like as if I was too, now, you see. But you won't peach unless they get the black spot on me. Or unless you see that black dog again. Or a seafaring man with one leg, Jim. Him above all. What is the black spot, Captain? I asked. That's a summons, mate. I tell you, if they get that. But you keep your weather eye open, Jim, and I'll share with you equals upon my honor. He wandered a little longer, his voice growing weaker. But soon after I'd given him his medicine, which he took like a child with the remark, if ever a seaman wanted drugs, it's me. He fell at last into a heavy, swoon-like sleep in which I left him. What I should have done had all gone well, I do not know. Probably I should have told the whole story to the doctor, for I was in mortal fear lest the captain should repent of his confessions and make an end of me. But, as things fell out, my poor father died quite suddenly that evening, which put all other matters on one side. Our natural distress, the visits of the neighbors, the arranging of the funeral, and all the work of the inn to be carried on in the meanwhile kept me so busy that I had scarcely time to think of the captain, far less to be afraid of him. He got downstairs next morning, to be sure, and had his meals as usual. Though he ate little, and had more, I'm afraid, than his usual supply of rum, for he helped himself out of the bar scowling and blowing through his nose, and no one dared to cross him. On the night before the funeral, he was as drunk as ever, and it was shocking in that house of mourning to hear him singing away at his ugly old sea song. But, weak as he was, we were all in the fear of death for him, and the doctor was suddenly taken up with the case many miles away and was never near the house after my father's death. I have said the captain was weak, and indeed he seemed rather to grow weaker than regain his strength. He clambered up and down stairs and went from the parlour to the bar and back again and sometimes put his nose out of doors to smell the sea, holding onto the walls as he went for support and breathing hard and fast like a man on a steep mountain. He never particularly addressed me and it is my belief he had as good as forgotten his confidences, but his temper was more flighty and allowing for his bodily weakness, more violent than ever. He had an alarming way now when he was drunk of drawing his cutlass and laying it bare before him on the table. But with all that, he minded people less and seemed shut up in his own thoughts, and rather wandering. Once, for instance, to our extreme wonder, he piped up to a different air, a kind of country love song, he must have learned in his youth, 
before he'd begun to follow the sea. So things passed until the day after the funeral, at about three o'clock of a bitter, foggy, frosty afternoon, I was standing at the door for a moment, full of sad thoughts about my father, when I saw someone drawing slowly near along the road. He was plainly blind, for he tapped before him with a stick and wore a great green shade over his eyes and nose. And he was hunched, as if with age or weakness, and wore a huge old tattered sea cloak with a hood that made him appear positively deformed. I never saw in my life a more dreadful-looking figure. He stopped a little from the inn, and raising his voice in an odd sing-song, addressed the air in front of him. Will any kind friend inform a poor blind man who has lost the precious sight of his eyes in the gracious defence of his native country, England, and God bless King George, where or in what part of this country he may now be? You are at the Admiral Benbow Black Hill Cove, my good man, said I. I hear a voice, said he, a young voice. Will you give me your hand, my kind young friend, and lead me in? I held out my hand, and the horrible, soft-spoken, eyeless creature gripped it in a moment like a vice. I was so much startled that I struggled to withdraw, but the blind man pulled me close up to him with a single action of his arm. Now, boy, he said, take me in to the captain. Sir, said I, upon my word, I dare not. Oh, he sneered, that's it. Take me in straight or I'll break your arm. And he gave it, as he spoke, a wrench that made me cry out. Sir, said I, it is for yourself, I mean. The captain is not what he used to be. He sits with a drawn cutlass. Another gentleman, come now, march, interrupted he. And I never heard a voice so cruel and cold and ugly as that blind man's. It cowed me more than the pain, and I began to obey him at once, walking straight in at the door and towards the parlour where our sick old buccaneer was sitting, dazed with rum. The blind man clung close to me, holding me in one iron fist and leaning almost more of his weight on me than I could carry. Lead me straight up to him, and when I'm in view, cry out, Here's a friend for you, Bill. If you don't, I'll do this. And with that, he gave me a twitch that I thought would have made me faint. Between this and that, I was so utterly terrified of the blind beggar that I forgot my terror of the captain. And as I opened the parlour door, cried out the words he had ordered in a trembling voice. The poor captain raised his eyes, and at one look the rum went out of him and left him staring sober. The expression of his face was not so much of terror as a mortal sickness. He made a movement to rise, but I do not believe he had enough force left in his body. No, Bill, sit where you are, said the beggar. If I can't see, I can hear a finger stirring. Business is business. Hold out your left hand. Boy, take his left hand by the wrist and bring it near to my right. We both obeyed him to the letter, and I saw him pass something from the hollow of the hand that held his stick into the palm of the captain's, which closed upon it instantly. And now... That's done, said the blind man. And at the words, he suddenly left hold of me and with incredible accuracy and nimbleness skipped out of the parlour and into the road where, as I still stood motionless, I could hear his stick go tap, tap, tapping into the distance. It was some time before either I or the captain seemed to gather our senses, but at length and about at the same moment, I released his wrist, which I was still holding, and he drew in his hand and looked sharply into the palm. Ten o'clock, he cried. Six hours. We'll do them yet. And he sprang to his feet. Even as he did so, he reeled, put his hand to his throat, stood swaying for a moment, and then, with a peculiar sound, fell from his whole height, face foremost to the floor. I ran to him at once, calling to my mother. But haste was all in vain. The captain had been struck dead by thundering apoplexy. It is a curious thing to understand, for I had certainly never liked the man, though of late I had begun to pity him, but as soon as I saw that he was dead, I burst into a flood of tears. It was the second death I had known, 
and the sorrow of the first was still fresh in my heart. Chapter 4 The Sea Chest I lost no time, of course, in telling my mother all that I knew, and perhaps should have told her long before. And we saw ourselves at once in a difficult and dangerous position. Some of the man's money, if he had any, was certainly due to us, but it was not likely that our captain's shipmates, above all the two specimens seen by me, Black Dog and the Blind Beggar, would be inclined to give up their booty in payment of the dead man's debts. The captain's order to mount at once and ride for Dr. Livesey would have left my mother alone and unprotected, which was not to be thought of. Indeed, it seemed impossible for either of us to remain much longer in the house. The fall of coals in the kitchen grate, the very ticking of the clock, filled us with alarms. The neighbourhood, to our ears, seemed haunted by approaching footsteps. And what between the dead body of the captain on the parlour floor and the thought of that detestable blind beggar hovering near at hand and ready to return, there were moments when, as the saying goes, I jumped in my skin for terror. Something must speedily be resolved upon, and it occurred to us at last to go forth together and seek help in the neighbouring hamlet. No sooner said than done. Bareheaded as we were, we ran out at once in the gathering evening and the frosty fog. The hamlet lay not many hundred yards away, though out of view, on the other side of the next cove. And what greatly encouraged me, it was in an opposite direction from that whence the blind man had made his appearance and whither he had presumably returned. We were not many minutes on the road, though we sometimes stopped to lay hold of each other and hearken. But there was no unusual sound, nothing but the low wash of the ripple and the croaking of the inmates of the wood. It was already candlelight when we reached the hamlet, and I shall never forget how much I was cheered to see the yellow shine in doors and windows, but that, as it proved, was the best of the help we were likely to get in that quarter. For you would have thought men would have been ashamed of themselves. No soul would consent to return with us to the Admiral Benbow. The more we told of our troubles, the more man, woman, and child, they clung to the shelter of their houses. The name of Captain Flint, though it was strange to me, was well known enough to some there, and carried a great weight of terror. Some of the men who had been to field work on the far side of the Admiral Benbow remembered besides to have seen several strangers on the road and taking them to be smugglers to have bolted away. And one at least had seen a little lugger in what we called Kit's Hole, for that matter, anyone who was a comrade of the captain's was enough to frighten them to death. And the short and the long of the matter was that while we could get several who were willing enough to ride to Dr. Livesey's, which lay in another direction, not one would help us to defend the inn. They say cowardice is infectious, but then argument is, on the other hand, a great emboldener. And so, when each had had his say, my mother made them a speech. She would not, she declared, lose money that belonged to her fatherless boy. If none of the rest of you dare, she said, Jim and I dare. Back we will go the way we came, and small thanks to you, big hulking, chicken-hearted men. We'll have that chest open if we die for it. And I'll thank you for that bag, Mrs. Crossley, to bring back our lawful money in. Of course, I said I would go with my mother, and of course they all cried out at our foolhardiness, but even then not a man would go along with us. All they would do was to give me a loaded pistol, lest we were attacked, and to promise to have horses ready saddled in case we were pursued on our return. While one lad was to ride forward to the doctors in search of armed assistance. My heart was beating finely when we two set forth in the cold night upon this dangerous venture. A full moon was beginning to rise and peered redly through the upper edges of the fog, and this increased our haste, for it was plain before we came forth again that all would be as bright as day and our departure exposed to the eyes of any watchers. We slipped along the hedges, noiseless and swift, nor did we see or hear anything to increase our terrors, till, to our relief, 
the door of the Admiral Benbow had closed behind us. I slipped the bolt at once, and we stood and panted for a moment in the dark, alone in the house with the dead captain's body. Then my mother got a candle in the bar, and holding each other's hands, we advanced into the parlour. He lay as we'd left him, on his back, with his eyes open and one arm stretched out. Draw down the blind, Jim, whispered my mother. They might come and watch outside. And now, said she when I'd done so, we have to get the key off that. And who's to touch it, I should like to know. And she gave a kind of sob as she said the words. I went down on my knees at once. On the floor, close to his hand, there was a little round of paper, blackened on the one side. I could not doubt that this was the black spot. And taking it up, I found written on the other side, in a very good, clear hand, this short message. You have till ten tonight. He had till ten, mother, said I. And just as I said it, our old clock began striking. This sudden noise startled us shockingly, but the news was good, for it was only six. Now, Jim, she said, that key. I felt in his pockets, one after another. A few small coins, a thimble, and some thread and big needles, a piece of pigtail tobacco bitten away at the end, his gully with the crooked handle, a pocket compass, and a tinder box were all that they contained, and I began to despair. Perhaps it's round his neck, suggested my mother. Overcoming a strong repugnance, I tore open his shirt at the neck, and there, sure enough, hanging to a bit of tarry string, which I cut with his own gully, we found the key. At this triumph, we were filled with hope, and hurried upstairs without delay to the little room where he'd slept so long, and where his box had stood since the day of his arrival. It was like any other seaman's chest on the outside. The initial B burned on the top of it with a hot iron, and the corners somewhat smashed and broken as by long, rough usage. Give me the key, said my mother, and though the lock was very stiff, she turned it and thrown back the lid in a twinkling. A strong smell of tobacco and tar rose from the interior, but nothing was to be seen on the top, except a suit of very good clothes, carefully brushed and folded. They'd never been worn, my mother said. Under that, the miscellany began. A quadrant, a tin canakin, several sticks of tobacco, two brace of very handsome pistols, a piece of bar silver, an old Spanish watch and some other trinkets of little value and mostly of foreign make, a pair of compasses mounted with brass, and five or six curious West Indian shells. I've often wondered since why he should have carried about those shells with him in his wandering, guilty and hunted life. In the meantime, we'd found nothing of any value but the silver and the trinkets, and neither of these were in our way. Underneath, there was an old boat cloak, whitened with sea salt on many a harbour bar. My mother pulled it up with impatience, and there lay before us the last things in the chest. A bundle tied up in oilcloth and looking like papers, and a canvas bag that gave forth at a touch the jingle of gold. I'll show these rogues that I'm an honest woman, said my mother. I'll have my dues and not a farthing over. Hold Mrs. Crossley's bag. And she began to count over the amount of the captain's score from the sailor's bag into the one that I was holding. It was a long and difficult business, for the coins were of all countries and sizes, doubloons and louis d'ors and guineas and pieces of eight, and I know not what besides, all shaken together at random. The guineas, too, were about the scarcest, and it was with these only that my mother knew how to make her count. When we were about halfway through, I suddenly put my hand upon her arm, for I'd heard in the silent, frosty air a sound that brought my heart into my mouth the tap tapping of the blind man's stick upon the frozen road. It drew nearer and nearer while we sat holding our breath. Then it struck sharp on the indoor, 
Then we could hear the handle being turned and the bolt rattling as the wretched being tried to enter. And then there was a long time of silence, both within and without. At last, the tapping recommenced, and to our indescribable joy and gratitude, died slowly away again until it ceased to be heard. Mother, said I, take the hole and let's be going. For I was sure the bolted door must have seemed suspicious and would bring the whole hornet's nest about our ears. Though how thankful I was that I bolted it, none could tell who had never met that terrible blind man. But my mother, frightened as she was, would not consent to take a fraction more than was due to her, and was obstinately unwilling to be content with less. It was not yet seven, she said, by a long way. She knew her rights and she would have them. And she was still arguing with me when a little low whistle sounded a good way off upon the hill. That was enough, and more than enough, for both of us. I'll take what I have, she said, jumping to her feet. And I'll take this to square the count, said I, picking up the oilskin packet. Next moment we were both groping downstairs, leaving the candle by the empty chest. And the next we had opened the door and were in full retreat. We would not started a moment too soon. The fog was rapidly dispersing. Already the moon shone quite clear on the high ground on either side, and it was only in the exact bottom of the dell and round the tavern door that the thin veil still hung unbroken to conceal the first steps of our escape. Far less than halfway to the hamlet, very little beyond the bottom of the hill, we must come forth into the moonlight. Nor was this all, for the sound of several footsteps running came already to our ears, and as we looked back in their direction, a light tossing to and fro and still rapidly advancing showed that one of the newcomers carried a lantern. My dear, said my mother suddenly, take the money and run on. I'm going to faint. This was certainly the end for both of us, I thought. How I cursed the cowardice of the neighbours. How I blamed my poor mother for her honesty and her greed, for her past foolhardiness and present weakness. We were just at the little bridge by good fortune and I helped her tottering as she was to the edge of the bank where sure enough she gave a sigh and fell on my shoulder I do not know how I found the strength to do it at all and I'm afraid it was roughly done but I managed to drag her down the bank and a little way under the arch farther I could not move her for the bridge was too low to let me do more than crawl below it so there we had to stay my mother almost entirely exposed and both of us within earshot of the inn. Chapter 5. The Last of the Blind Man My curiosity, in a sense, was stronger than my fear, for I could not remain where I was, but crept back to the bank again, whence, sheltering my head behind a bush of broom, I might command the road before our door. I was scarcely in position, ere my enemies began to arrive, seven or eight of them, running hard, their feet beating out of time along the road, and the man with a lantern some paces in front. Three men ran together, hand in hand, and I made out, even through the mist, that the middle man of this trio was the blind beggar. The next moment his voice showed me that I was right. Down with the door, he cried. Aye, aye, sir, answered two or three, and a rush was made upon the Admiral Benbow, the lantern-bearer following. And then I could see them pause, and hear speeches passed in a lower key, as if they were surprised to find the door open. But the pause was brief, for the blind man again issued his commands. His voice sounded louder and higher, as if he were afire with eagerness and rage. In, 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 he shouted, and cursed them for their delay. Four or five of them obeyed at once, two remaining on the road with the formidable beggar. There was a pause, then a cry of surprise, and then a voice shouting from the house, Bill's dead! But the third man swore at them again for their delay. Search him, some of you shirking lubbers, and the rest of you are laughed and get the chest, he cried. I could hear their feet rattling up our old stairs, so that the house must have shook with it. Promptly afterwards, fresh sounds of astonishment arose. The window of the captain's room was thrown open with a slam and a jingle of broken glass, and a man leaned out into the moonlight, head and shoulders, and addressed the blind beggar on the road below him. Pew! he cried. They've been before us. 
Someone's turned the chest out alow in the loft. Is it there? roared Pew. The money's there. The blind man cursed the money. Flint's fist, I mean, he cried. We don't see it here, no how, returned the man. Here, you below, is it on bill? cried the blind man again. At that, another fellow, probably him who'd remained below to search the captain's body, came to the door of the inn. Bill's been overhauled already, said he. Nothing left. It's these people of the inn, it's that boy. I wish I'd put his eyes out, cried the blind man, Pew. They were here no time ago. They had the door bolted when I tried it. Scatter, lads, and find them. Sure enough, they left their glim here, said the fellow from the window. Scatter and find them, rode the house out, reiterated Pew, striking with his stick upon the road. And there followed a great to-do through all our old inn. Heavy feet pounding to and fro, furniture thrown over, doors kicked in, until the very rocks re-echoed. And the men came out again, one after another, on the road, and declared that we were nowhere to be found. And just the same whistle that had alarmed my mother and myself over the dead captain's money was once more clearly audible through the night, but this time twice repeated. I had thought it to be the blind man's trumpet, so to speak, summoning his crew to the assault, but I now found that it was a signal from the hillside towards the hamlet, and from its effect upon the buccaneers, a signal to warn them of approaching danger. There's Dirk again, said one. Twice. We'll have to budge, mates. Budge, you skulk, cried Pew. Dirk was a fool and a coward from the first. You wouldn't mind him. They must be close by. They can't be far. You have your hands on it. Scatter and look for them, dogs. Oh, shiver my soul, he cried. If I had eyes. This appeal seemed to produce some effect, for two of the fellows began to look here and there among the lumber, but half-heartedly, I thought, and with half an eye to their own danger all the time, while the rest stood irresolute on the road. You have your hands on thousands, you fools, and you hang a leg. You'll be as rich as kings if you could find it, and you know it's here, and you stand there skulking. There wasn't one of you dared face Bill, and I did it, a blind man, and I'm to lose my chance for you. I'm to be a poor, crawling beggar, sponging for rum, when I might be rolling in a coach. If you had the plug of a weevil in a biscuit, you'd catch them still. Hang it, Pew, we've got the doubloons, grumbled one. They might have hid the blessed thing, said another. Take the George's pew and don't stand here squalling. Squalling was the word for it. Pew's anger rose so high at these objections, till at last, his passion completely taking the upper hand, he struck at them right and left in his blindness, and his stick sounded heavily on more than one. These, in their turn, cursed back at the blind miscreant, threatened him in horrid terms, and tried in vain to catch the stick and wrest it from his grasp. This quarrel was the saving of us, for while it was still raging, another sound came from the top of the hill on the side of the hamlet. The tramp of horses galloping. Almost at the same time, a pistol shot, flash and report, came from the hedge side. And that was plainly the last signal of danger, for the buccaneers turned at once and ran, separating in every direction, one seaward along the cove, another slant across the hill, and so on, so that in half a minute not a sign of them remained. But Pew. Him they had deserted, whether in sheer panic or out of revenge for his ill words and blows, I know not. But there he remained behind, tapping up and down the road in a frenzy, still groping and calling for his comrades. Finally he took a wrong turn and ran a few steps past me towards the hamlet, crying, Johnny, Black Dog, Dirk, and other names, you won't leave old Pew, mates, not old Pew. Just then, the noise of horses topped the rise, and four or five riders came in sight in the moonlight and swept at full gallop down the slope. At this, Pew saw his error, turned with a scream and ran straight for the ditch, into which he rolled. But he was on his feet again in a second and made another dash, now utterly bewildered, right under the nearest of the coming horses. The rider tried to save him, but in vain. Down went Pew with a cry that rang high into the night and the four hoofs trampled and spurned him and passed by. He fell on his side, then gently collapsed upon his face and moved no more. I leapt to my feet and hailed the riders. They were pulling up at any rate, horrified at the accident, and I soon saw what they were. One, tailing out behind the rest, was a lad who had gone from the hamlet to Dr. Livesey's. 
The rest were revenue officers whom he'd met by the way, and with whom he'd had the intelligence to return at once. Some news of the lugger in Kit's hole had found his way to Supervisor Dance, and set him forth that night in our direction. And to that circumstance, my mother and I owed our preservation from death. Pew was dead, stone dead. As for my mother, when we'd carried her up to the hamlet, a little cold water and salts and that brought her back again, and she was none the worse for her terror, though she still continued to deplore the balance of the money. In the meantime, the supervisor rode on as fast as he could to Kit's hole. But his men had to dismount and grope down the dingle, leading and sometimes supporting their horses, and in continual fear of ambushes, so it was no great matter for surprise that when they got down to the hole, the lugger was already underway, though still close in. He hailed her. A voice replied, telling him to keep out of the moonlight or he would get some lead in him. And at the same time, a bullet whistled close by his arm. Soon after, the lugger doubled the point and disappeared. Mr. Dance stood there, as he said, like a fish out of water, and all he could do was to dispatch a man to Burnham to warn the cutter. And that, said he, is just about as good as nothing. They've got off clean, and there's an end. Only, he added, I'm glad I trod on Master Pew's corns, for by this time he'd heard my story. I went back with him to the Admiral Bembo, and you cannot imagine a house in such a state of smash. The very clock had been thrown down by these fellows in their furious hunt after my mother and myself, and though nothing had actually been taken away, except the captain's money bag and a little silver from the till, I could see at once that we were ruined. Mr. Dance could make nothing of the scene. They got the money, you say? Well then, Hawkins, what in fortune were they after? More money, I suppose. No, sir, not money, I think, replied I. In fact, sir, I believe I have the thing in my breast pocket. And to tell you the truth, I should like to get it put in safety. To be sure, boy, quite right, said he. I'll take it if you like. I thought perhaps Dr. Livesey, I began. Perfectly right, he interrupted very cheerily. Perfectly right, a gentleman and a magistrate. And now I come to think of it. I might as well ride there myself and report to him or Squire. Master Pew's dead when all's done. Not that I regret it, but he's dead, you see, and people will make it out against an officer of His Majesty's revenue if make it out they can. Now, I'll tell you, Hawkins, if you like, I'll take you along. I thanked him heartily for the offer, and we walked back to the hamlet where the horses were. By the time I told Mother of my purpose, they were all in the saddle. Dogger, said Mr. Dance, you have a good horse. Take up this lad behind you. As soon as I was mounted, holding on to Dogger's belt, the supervisor gave the word, and the party struck out at a bouncing trot on the road to Dr. Livesey's house. Chapter 6 The Captain's Papers. We rode hard all the way till we drew up before Dr. Livesey's door. The house was all dark to the front. Mr. Dance told me to jump down and knock, and Dogger gave me a stirrup to descend by. The door was opened almost at once by the maid. Is Dr. Livesey in? I asked. No, she said. He had come home in the afternoon, but had gone up to the hall to dine and pass the evening with the squire. So, there we go, boys, said Mr. Dance. This time, as the distance was short, I did not mount, but ran with Dogger's stirrup leather to the lodge gates and up the long, leafless, moonlit avenue to where the white line of the hall buildings looked on either hand on great old gardens. Here Mr. Dance dismounted, and taking me along with him, was admitted at a word into the house. The servant led us down a matted passage and showed us at the end into a great library, all lined with bookcases and busts upon the top of them, where the squire and Dr. Livesey sat, pipe in hand, on either side of a bright fire. I had never seen the squire so near at hand. He was a tall man, over six feet high, and broad in proportion, and he had a bluff, rough-and-ready face, all roughened and reddened and lined in his long travels. His eyebrows were very black and moved readily, and this gave him a look of some temper. Not bad, you would say, but quick and high. Come in, Mr. Dance, 
says he, very stately and condescending. Good evening, Dance, says the doctor with a nod. And good evening to you, friend Jim. What good wind brings you here? The supervisor stood up straight and stiff and told his story like a lesson. And you should have seen how the two gentlemen leaned forward and looked at each other and forgot to smoke in their surprise and interest. When they heard how my mother went back to the inn, Dr. Livesey fairly slapped his thigh and the squire cried, Bravo! and broke his long pipe against the grate. Long before it was done, Mr. Trelawney, that you will remember was the squire's name, had got up from his seat and was striding about the room, and the doctor, as if to hear the better, had taken off his powdered wig and sat there looking very strange indeed in his own close-cropped black pole. At last, Mr. Dance finished the story. Mr. Dance, said the squire, you are a very noble fellow. And as for riding down that black, atrocious miscreant, I regard it as an act of virtue, sir, like stamping on a cockroach. This lad, Hawkins, is a trump, I perceive. Hawkins, will you ring that bell? Mr. Dance must have some ale. And so, Jim, said the doctor, you have the thing that they were after, have you? Here it is, sir, said I, and gave him the oilskin packet. The doctor looked it all over, as if his fingers were itching to open it. But instead of doing that, he put it quietly in the pocket of his coat. Squire, said he, when Dance has had his ale, he must, of course, be off on His Majesty's service, but I mean to keep Jim Hawkins here to sleep at my house. And with your permission, I propose we should have up the cold pie and let him sup. As you will, lives him, said the squire. Hawkins has earned better than cold pie. So a big pigeon pie was brought in and put on a side table, and I made a hearty supper, for I was as hungry as a hawk while Mr. Dance was further complimented and at last dismissed. And now, squire, said the doctor. And now, lives it, said the squire, in the same breath. <laughs> one at a time, one at a time, laughed Dr. Livesey. You have heard of this Flint, I suppose. Heard of him, cried the squire. Heard of him, you say? He was the bloodthirstiest buccaneer that sailed. Blackbeard was a child to Flint. The Spaniards were so prodigiously afraid of him that I tell you, sir, I was sometimes proud he was an Englishman. I've seen his topsails with these eyes off Trinidad and the cowardly son of a rum puncheon that I sailed with put back, put back, sir, into Port of Spain. Well, I've heard of him myself in England, said the doctor. But the point is, had he money? Money, cried the squire. Have you heard the story? What were these villains after but money? What did they care for but money? For what would they risk their rascal carcasses but money? That we shall soon know, replied the doctor. But you are so confoundedly hot-headed and exclamatory that I cannot get a word in. What I want to know is this. Supposing that I have here in my pocket some clue to where Flint buried his treasure, will that treasure amount to much? Amount, sir? cried the squire. It will amount to this. If we have the clue you talk about, I fit out a ship in Bristol Dock and take you and Hawkins here along, and I'll have that treasure if I search a year. Very well, said the doctor. Now then, if Jim is agreeable, we'll open the packet. And he laid it before him on the table. The bundle was sewn together, and the doctor had to get out his instrument case and cut the stitches with his medical scissors. It contained two things, a book and a sealed paper. First of all, we'll try the book, observed the doctor. The squire and I were both peering over his shoulder as he opened it, for Dr. Livesey had kindly motioned me to come round from the side table where I'd been eating to enjoy the sport of the search. On the first page, there were only some scraps of writing, such as a man with a pen in his hand might make for idleness or practice. One was the same as the tattoo mark, Billy Bones' his fancy. Then there was Mr. W. Bones' mate. No more rum. Off Pam Key he got it. And some other snatches, mostly single words and unintelligible. I could not help wondering who it was that had got it and what it was that he got. A knife in his back as like as not. Not much instruction there said Dr. Livesey as he passed on. 
The next 10 or 12 pages were filled with a curious series of entries. There was a date at one end of the line, and at the other a sum of money, as in common account books, but instead of explanatory writing, only a varying number of crosses between the two. On the 12th of June, 1745, for instance, a sum of 70 pounds had plainly become due to someone, and there was nothing but six crosses to explain the cause. In a few cases, to be sure, the name of a place would be added, as off Caracas, or a mere entry of latitude and longitude, as in 62 degrees, 17 minutes, 20 seconds, 19 degrees, 2 minutes, 40 seconds. The record lasted over nearly 20 years, the amount of the separate entries going larger as time went on, and at the end, a grand total had been made out, after five or six wrong additions, and these words appended, Bones his pile. I can't make head or tail of this, said Dr. Livesey. The thing is as clear as noonday, cried the squire. This is the black-hearted hound's account book. These crosses stand for the names of ships or towns that they sank or plundered. The sums are the scoundrel's share, and where he feared an ambiguity, you see, he added something clearer. Off Caracas now, you see, here was some unhappy vessel boarded off that coast. God help the poor souls that manned her coral long ago. Right, said the doctor. See what it is to be a traveller. Right, and the amounts increase, you see, as he rose in rank. There was little else in the volume, but a few bearings of places noted in the blank leaves towards the end, and a table for reducing French, English and Spanish monies to a common value. Thrifty man, cried the doctor. He wasn't the one to be cheated. And now, said the squire, for the other. The paper had been sealed in several places with a thimble by way of seal. The very thimble, perhaps, that I'd found in the captain's pocket. The doctor opened the seals with great care, and there fell out the map of an island, with latitude and longitude, soundings, names of hills and bays and inlets, and every particular that would be needed to bring a ship to a safe anchorage upon its shores. It was about nine miles long and five across. Shaped, you might say, like a fat dragon standing up. And had two fine landlocked harbours. And a hill in the centre part, marked the Spyglass. There were several editions of a later date, but above all, three crosses of red ink. Two on the north part of the island, one in the southwest. And beside this last, in the same red ink and in a small, neat hand, very different from the captain's tottery characters, these words, bulk of treasure here. Over on the back, the same hand had written this further information. Tall tree, spyglass shoulder, bearing a point to the north of north-northeast. Skeleton island, east-southeast and by east. Ten feet. The bar silver is in the north cache. You can find it by the trend of the east hummock, ten fathoms south of the black crag with the face on it. The arms are easy found in the sand hill, north point of north inlet cape, bearing east and a quarter north. J.F. That was all, but brief as it was, and to me incomprehensible, it filled the squire and Dr. Livesey with delight. Livesey, said the squire, you will give up this wretched practice at once. Tomorrow I start for Bristol. In three weeks' time, three weeks, two weeks, ten days, we'll have the best ship, sir, and the choicest crew in England. Hawkins shall come as cabin boy. You'll make a famous cabin boy, Hawkins. You, Livesey, are ship's doctor. I'm admiral. We'll take Redruth, Joyce and Hunter. We'll have favourable winds, a quick passage and not the least difficulty in finding the spot. And money to eat, to roll in, to play duck and drake with ever after. Trelawney, said the doctor, I'll go with you and I'll go bail for it, so will Jim, and be a credit to the undertaking. There's only one man I'm afraid of. And who's that? cried the squire. Name the dog, sir. You, replied the doctor, for you cannot hold your tongue. We are not the only men who know of this paper. 
These fellows who attacked the inn tonight, bold, desperate blades for sure, and the rest who stayed aboard that lugger, and more, I dare say, not far off, are, one and all, through thick and thin, bound that they'll get that money. We must none of us go alone till we get to sea. Jim and I shall stick together in the meantime. You'll take Joyce and Hunter when you ride to Bristol, and from first to last, not one of us must breathe a word of what we've found. Lives in, returned the squire. You are always in the right of him. I'll be as silent as the grave. Part two, the sea cook. Chapter seven, I go to Bristol. It was longer than the squire imagined ere we were ready for the sea. And none of our first plans, not even Dr. Livesey's of keeping me beside him, could be carried out as we intended. The doctor had to go to London for a physician to take charge of his practice. The squire was hard at work at Bristol, and I lived on at the hall under the charge of old Redruth, the gamekeeper. Almost a prisoner, but full of sea dreams and the most charming anticipations of strange islands and adventures. I brooded by the hour together over the map, all the details of which I well remembered. Sitting by the fire in the housekeeper's room, I approached that island in my fancy from every possible direction. I explored every acre of its surface. I climbed a thousand times to that tall hill they call the Spyglass, and from the top enjoyed the most wonderful and changing prospects. Sometimes the isle was thick with savages with whom we fought, sometimes full of dangerous animals that hunted us. But in all my fancies, Nothing occurred to me so strange and tragic as our actual adventures. So the weeks passed on, till one fine day there came a letter addressed to Dr. Livesey, with this addition to be opened in the case of his absence by Tom Redruth or young Hawkins. Obeying this order, we found, or rather I found, for the gamekeeper was a poor hand at reading anything but print, the following important news. Old Anchor in Bristol, March the 1st, 1755. Dear Livesey, as I do not know whether you are at the hall or still in London, I send this in double to both places. The ship is bought and fitted. She lies at anchor, ready for sea. You never imagined a sweeter schooner. A child might sail her. 200 tons, name Hispaniola. I got her through my old friend Blandley, who has proved himself throughout the most surprising trump. The admirable fellow literally slaved at my interest, and so, I may say, did everyone in Bristol as soon as they got wind of the port we sailed for. Treasure, I mean. Redruth, said I, interrupting the letter. Dr. Livesey will not like that. The squire has been talking, after all. Well, who's a better right? growled the gamekeeper. A pretty rum go of squire ain't to talk for Dr. Livesey, I should think. At that, I gave up all attempts at commentary and read straight on. Blandly himself found the Hispaniola, and by the most admirable management, got her for the merest trifle. There is a class of men in Bristol monstrously prejudiced against Blandly. They go the length of declaring that this honest creature would do anything for money, that the Hispaniola belonged to him, and that he sold it me absurdly high, the most transparent calibers. None of them dare, however, to deny the merits of the ship. So far, there was not a hitch. The work people, to be sure, riggers and what not, were most annoyingly slow, but time cured that. It was the crew that troubled me. I wished a round score of men, in case of natives, buccaneers, or the odious French, and I had the worry of the deuce itself to find so much as half a dozen. Till the most remarkable stroke of fortune brought me the very man that I required. I was standing on the dock when, by the merest accident, I fell in talk with him. I found he was an old sailor, kept a public house, knew all the seafaring men in Bristol, had lost his health ashore, and wanted a good berth as cook to get to sea again. He had hobbled down there that morning, he said, to get a smell of the salt. I was monstrously touched. So would you have been, and out of pure pity, I engaged him on the spot to be ship's cook. Long John Silver, he is called, and has lost a leg. But that I regard as a recommendation, since he lost it in the country's service under the immortal hawk. 
He has no pension, lives he? Imagine the abominable age we live in. Well, sir, I thought I'd only found a cook, but it was a crew I had discovered. Between Silver and myself, we got together in a few days a company of the toughest old salts imaginable. Not pretty to look at, but fellows by their faces of the most indomitable spirit. I declare, we could fight a frigate. Long John even got rid of two out of the six or seven I had already engaged. He showed me in a trice that they were just the sort of freshwater swabs we had to fear in an adventure of importance. I am in the most magnificent health and spirits, eating like a bull, sleeping like a tree, yet I shall not enjoy a moment till I hear my old tarpaulins tramping round the capstan. Seaward ho! Hang the treasure! It's the glory of the sea that has turned my head. So now, Livesey, come post. Do not lose an hour if you respect me. Let young Hawkins go at once to see his mother, with Redruth for a guard, and then both come full speed to Bristol. John Trelawney. Postscript. I did not tell you that Blandly, who, by the way, is to send a consort after us if we don't turn up by the end of August, had found an admirable fellow for sailing master. Um, a stiff man, which I regret, but in all other respects a treasure. Long John Silver unearthed a very competent man for a mate, a man named Arrow. I have a bosun who pipes lives in, so things shall go manor war fashion on board the good ship Hispaniola. I forgot to tell you, that Silver is a man of substance. I know of my own knowledge that he has a banker's account, which has never been overdrawn. He leaves his wife to manage the inn, and as she is a woman of color, a pair of old bachelors like you and I may be excused for guessing that it is the wife quite as much as the health that sends him back to roving. JT. PPS. Hawkins may stay one night with his mother. JT. You can fancy the excitement into which that letter put me. I was half beside myself with glee. And if ever I despised a man, it was old Tom Redruth, who could do nothing but grumble and lament. Any of the under-gamekeepers would gladly have changed places with him. But such was not the squire's pleasure, and the squire's pleasure was like law among them all. Nobody but old Redruth would have dared so much as even to grumble. The next morning, he and I set out on foot for the Admiral Benbow. And there I found my mother in good health and spirits. The captain, who had so long been a cause of so much discomfort, was gone where the wicked cease from troubling. The squire had had everything repaired, and the public rooms and the sign repainted, and had added some furniture, above all a beautiful armchair for mother in the bar. He had found her a boy, as an apprentice also, so that she should not want help while I was gone. It was on seeing that boy that I understood for the first time my situation. I had thought, up to that moment, of the adventures before me, not at all of the home that I was leaving. And now, at sight of this clumsy stranger, who was to stay here in my place beside my mother, I had my first attack of tears. I'm afraid I led that boy a dog's life. For as he was new to the work, I had a hundred opportunities for setting him right and putting him down. And I was not slow to profit by them. The night passed, and the next day, after dinner, Red Ruth and I were afoot again and on the road. I said goodbye to Mother, and the cove where I had lived since I was born, and the dear old Admiral Benbow, since he was repainted, no longer quite so dear. One of my last thoughts was of the captain, who had so often strolled along the beach with his cocked hat, his sabre-cut cheek, and his old brass telescope. Next moment, we turned the corner, and my home was out of sight. The mail picked us up about dusk at the Royal George on the heath. I was wedged in between Red Ruth and a stout old gentleman, and in spite of the swift motion and the cold night air, I must have dozed a great deal from the very first, and then slept like a log up hill and down dale, through stage after stage, for when I was awakened at last, it was by a punch in the ribs, and I opened my eyes to find that we were standing still before a large building in a city street, and that the day had already broken a long time. Where are we? I asked. Bristol, said Tom. Get down. 
Mr. Trelawney had taken up his residence at an inn far down the docks to superintend the work upon the schooner. Thither we had now to walk, and our way, to my great delight, lay along the quays and beside the great multitude of ships of all sizes and rigs and nations. In one, sailors were singing at their work. In another, there were men aloft, high over my head, hanging to threads that seemed no thicker than a spider's. Though I lived by the shore all my life, I seemed never to have been near the sea till then. The smell of tar and salt was something new. I saw the most wonderful figureheads that had been far over the ocean. I saw besides many old sailors with rings in their ears and whiskers curled in ringlets and tarry pigtails and their swaggering clumsy sea walk. And if I'd seen as many kings or archbishops, I could not have been more delighted. And I was going to see myself, to see in a schooner with a piping boatswain and pigtailed singing seamen, to see bound for an unknown island and to seek for buried treasure. While I was still in this delightful dream, we came suddenly in front of a large inn and met Squire Trelawney, all dressed out like a sea officer in stout blue cloth, coming out of the door with a smile on his face and a capital imitation of a sailor's walk. Here you are, he cried, and the doctor came last night from London. Bravo, the ship's company complete. Oh, sir, cried I, when do we sail? Sail, says he. We sail tomorrow. Chapter 8 At the Sign of the Spyglass When I'd done breakfasting, the squire gave me a note addressed to John Silver at the Sign of the Spyglass and told me I should easily find the place by following the line of the docks and keeping a bright lookout for a little tavern with a large brass telescope for sign. I set off, overjoyed at this opportunity to see some more of the ships and seamen, and picked my way among a great crowd of people and carts and bales, for the dock was now at its busiest, until I found the tavern in question. It was a bright enough little place of entertainment. The sign was newly painted, the windows had neat red curtains, the floor was cleanly sanded. There was a street on each side and an open door on both, which made the large low room pretty clear to see in, in spite of clouds of tobacco smoke. The customers were mostly seafaring men, and they talked so loudly that I hung at the door, almost afraid to enter. As I was waiting, a man came out of a side room, and at a glance I was sure he must be Long John. His left leg was cut off close by the hip, and under the left shoulder he carried a crutch, which he managed with wonderful dexterity, hopping about on it like a bird. He was very tall and strong, with a face as big as a ham, plain and pale, but intelligent and smiling. Indeed, he seemed in the most cheerful spirits, whistling as he moved about among the tables with a merry word or a slap on the shoulder for the more favoured of his guests. Now, to tell you the truth, from the very first mention of Long John in Squire Trelawney's letter, I had taken a fear in my mind that he might prove to be the very one-legged sailor whom I had watched for so long at the old Benbow. But one look at the man before me was enough. I'd seen the captain and Black Dog and the blind man Pew, and I thought I knew what a buccaneer was like. A very different creature, according to me, from this clean and pleasant-tempered landlord. I plucked up courage at once, crossed the threshold, and walked right up to the man where he stood, propped on his crutch, talking to a customer. Mr. Silver, sir? I asked, holding out the note. Yes, my lad, said he. Such is my name, to be sure. And who may you be? And then, as he saw the squire's letter, he seemed to me to give something almost like a start. Oh, said he, quite loud and offering his hand. I see you are our new cabin boy. Pleased I am to see you. And he took my hand in his large, firm grasp. Just then, one of the customers at the far side rose suddenly and made for the door. It was close by him, and he was out in the street in a moment, but his hurry had attracted my notice, and I recognized him at once. It was the tallow-faced man wanting two fingers who had come first to the Admiral Benbow. Oh, I cried, stop him, it's Black Dog! I don't care two coppers who he is, cried Silver, but he hasn't paid his score. Harry, run and catch him. 
one of the others who was nearest the door, leapt up and started in pursuit. If he were Admiral Hawke, he shall pay his score, cried Silver, and then relinquishing my hand. Who did you say he was? he asked. Black what? Dog, sir, said I. Has Mr. Trelawney not told you of the buccaneers? He was one of them. So, cried Silver, in my house, Ben, run and help Harry. One of those swabs, was he? Was that you drinking with him, Morgan? Step up here. The man whom he called Morgan, an old grey-haired mahogany-faced sailor, came forward pretty sheepishly, rolling his quid. No, Morgan, said Long John very sternly. You never clapped your eyes on that black, black dog before, did you now? Not I, sir, said Morgan with a salute. You didn't know his name, did you? No, sir. By the powers, Tom Morgan, it's as good for you, exclaimed the landlord. If you had been mixed up with the likes of that, you would never have put another foot in my house you may lay to that. And what was he saying to you? I don't rightly know, sir, answered Morgan. Do you call that a head on your shoulders or a blessed dead eye? cried Long John. Don't rightly know, don't you? Perhaps you don't happen to rightly know who you were speaking to, perhaps. Come now, what was he drawing? Voyages, cams, ships? Pipe up, what was it? We was a talking of keel hauling, answered Morgan. Keel hauling, was you? And a mighty suitable thing, too, and you may lay to that. <laughs> Get back to your place for a lubber, Tom. And then, as Morgan rolled back to his seat, Silver added to me in a confidential whisper that was very flattering, as I thought. He's quite an honest man, Tom Morgan, only stupid. And now, he read on again aloud, let's see, Black Dark. No, I don't know the name, not I. Yet I kind of think I've... Yes, I've seen the swab. He used to come here with a blind beggar, he used. That he did, you may be sure, said I. I knew the blind man, too. His name was Pew. It was, cried Silver, now quite excited. Pew, that were his name for certain. Ah, he looked as sharp he did. If we run down this black dog now, there'll be news for Captain Trelawney. Ben's a good runner. Few seamen run better than Ben. He should run him down, hand over hand, by the powers. He talked to keel hauling, did he? I'll keel haul him. All the time he was jerking out these phrases, he was stumping up and down the tavern on his crutch, slapping tables with his hand, and giving such a show of excitement as would have convinced an old Bailey judge or a Bow Street runner. My suspicions had been thoroughly awakened on finding Black Dog at the spyglass, and I watched the cook narrowly. But he was too deep and too ready and too clever for me. By the time the two men had come back out of breath and confessed that they had lost the track in a crowd and been scolded like thieves, I would have gone bail for the innocence of Long John Silver. See here now, Hawkins, said he. Here's a blessed thing on a man like me, now ain't it? Here's Captain Trelawney, what's he to think? Here I have this confounded son of a Dutchman sitting in my own house, drinking of my own rum. Here you comes and tells me of it plain, and here I let him give us all the slip before my blessed deadlines. Now, Hawkins, you do me justice with the captain. You're a lad, you are, but you're as smart as paint. I see that when you first come in. Now, here it is. What could I do with this old timber I hobble on? When I was an A.B. master mariner, I'd have come up alongside of him hand over hand and broached him too in a brace of old shakes, I would. But now... And then, all of a sudden, he stopped and his jaw dropped as though he'd remembered something. The score, he burst out. Three goes of rum. Why, shiver my timbers if I hadn't forgotten my score. And falling on a bench, he laughed until the tears ran down his cheeks. I could not help joining, and we laughed together, peal after peal, until the tavern rang again. Boy, what a precious old sea calf I am, he said at last, wiping his cheeks. You and me should get on well, Hawkins, for I'll take my davy. I should be rated ship's boy. <laughs> uh, but come now, stand by to go about. This won't do. Duty is duty, messmates. 
I'll put on my old cockerel hat and step along of you to Captain Trelawney and report this here affair. For mind you, it's serious, young Hawkins, and neither you nor me's come out of it with what I should make so bold as to call credit. Nor you neither, says you. Not smart. None of the pair of us smart. But, <laughs> dash my buttons, that was a good and about my score. And he began to laugh again, and that so heartily that, though I did not see the joke as he did, I was again obliged to join him in his mirth. On our little walk along the quays, he made himself the most interesting companion, telling me about the different ships that we passed by, their rig, tonnage and nationality, explaining the work that was going forward, how one was discharging, another had taken in cargo, and a third making ready for sea and every now and then telling me some little anecdote of ships or seamen or repeating a nautical phrase till I'd learnt it perfectly. I began to see that here was one of the best of possible shipmates. When we got to the inn, the squire and Dr Livesey were seated together, finishing a quart of ale with a toast in it, before they should go aboard the schooner on a visit of inspection. Long John told the story from first to last, with a great deal of spirit and the most perfect truth. That was how it were now, when did Hawkins, he would say now and again. And I could always bear him entirely out. The two gentlemen regretted that black dog had got away, but we all agreed there was nothing to be done. And after he'd been complimented, Long John took up his crutch and departed. All hands aboard by four this afternoon, shouted the squire after him. Aye, aye, sir, cried the cook in the passage. Well, squire, said Dr. Livesey, I don't put much faith in your discoveries as a general thing, but I will say this, John Silver suits me. The man's a perfect trump, declared the squire. And now, added the doctor, Jim may come on board with us, may he not? To be sure he may, says squire. Take your hat, Hawkins, and we'll see the ship. Chapter 9. Powder and Arms The Hispaniola lay some way out, and we went under the figureheads and round the sterns of many other ships, and their cables sometimes grated underneath our keel and sometimes swung above us. At last, however, we got alongside and were met and saluted as we stepped aboard by the mate, Mr. Arrow, a brown old sailor with earrings in his ears and a squint. He and the squire were very thick and friendly, but I soon observed that things were not the same between Mr. Trelawney and the captain. This last was a sharp-looking man who seemed angry with everything on board and was soon to tell us why, for we'd hardly got down into the cabin when a sailor followed us. Captain Smollett, sir, asking to speak with you, said he. I am always at the captain's orders. Show him in, said the squire. The captain, who was close behind his messenger, entered at once and shut the door behind him. Well, Captain Smollett, what have you to say? All well, I hope, all shipshape and seaworthy. Well, sir, said the captain, better speak plain, I believe, even at the risk of offence. I don't like this cruise, I don't like the men, and I don't like my officer. That's short and sweet. Perhaps, sir, you don't like the ship, inquired the squire, very angry as I could see. I can't speak as to that, sir, not having seen her tried, said the captain. She seems a clever craft, more I can't say. Possibly, sir, you may not like your employer either, says the squire. But here Dr. Livesey cut in. Stay a bit, said he, stay a bit. No use of such questions as that but to produce ill feeling. The captain has said too much or he has said too little, and I'm bound to say that I require an explanation of his words. You don't, you say, like this cruise. Now why? I was engaged, sir, on what we call sealed orders to sail this ship for that gentleman where he should bid me said the captain. So far, so good. But now I find that every man before the mast knows more than I do. I don't call that fair now, do you? No, said Dr. Livesey. I don't. Next, said the captain, I learn we are going after treasure. Here it's from my own hands, mind you. Now, treasure is ticklish work. I don't like treasure voyages on any account, and I don't like them above all when they are secret, and when, begging your pardon, Mr. Trelawney, the secret has been told to the parrot. Silver's parrot, asked the squire. It's a way of speaking, said the captain. Blabbed, I mean. It's my belief neither of you gentlemen know what you are about, but I'll tell you my way of it. 
Life or death and a close run. That is all clear and I dare say true enough, replied Dr. Livesey. We take the risk, but we're not so ignorant as you believe us. Next, you say you don't like the crew. Are they not good seamen? I don't like them, sir, returned Captain Smalley. And I think I should have had the choosing of my own hands if you go to that. Perhaps you should, replied the doctor. My friend should perhaps have taken you along with him, but the slight, if there be one, was unintentional. And you don't like Mr. Arrow? I don't, sir. I believe he's a good seaman, but he's too free with the crew to be a good officer. A mate should keep himself to himself, shouldn't drink with the men before the mast. Do you mean he drinks? cried the squire. No, sir, replied the captain, only that he's too familiar. Well now, and the short and the long of it, captain, asked the doctor. Tell us what you want. Well, gentlemen, are you determined to go on this cruise? Like iron, answered the squire. Very good, said the captain. Then, as you've heard me very patiently saying things I could not prove, hear me a few words more. They are putting the powder and the arms in the fore hold. Now, you have a good place under the cabin. Why not put them there? First point. Then, you are bringing four of your own people with you, and they tell me some of them are to be berthed forward. Why not give them the berths here, beside the cabin? Second point. Any more? asked Mr. Trelawney. One more said the captain. There's been too much blabbing already. Far too much, agreed the doctor. I'll tell you what I've heard myself, continued Captain Smollett, that you have a map of an island, that there's crosses on the map to show where treasure is, and that the island lies... And then he named the latitude and longitude exactly. I never told that, cried the squire, to a soul. The hands know it, sir, returned the captain. Livesey, that must have been you or Hawkins, cried the squire. It doesn't much matter who it was, replied the doctor. And I could see that neither he nor the captain paid much regard to Mr. Trelawney's protestations. Neither did I, to be sure, he was so loose a talker. Yet, in this case, I believe he was really right. And that nobody had told the situation of the island. Well, gentlemen, continued the captain, I don't know who has this map. But I make it a point it shall be kept secret even from me and Mr. Arrow. Otherwise, I would ask you to let me resign. I see, said the doctor. You wish us to keep this matter dark and to make a garrison of the stern part of the ship, manned with my friend's own people, and provided with all the arms and powder on board. In other words, you fear a mutiny. Sir, said Captain Smollett, with no intention to take offence, I deny your right to put words into my mouth. No captain, sir, would be justified in going to sea at all if he had ground enough to say that. As for Mr. Arrow, I believe him to be thoroughly honest. Some of the men are the same. All may be, for what I know. But I am responsible for the ship's safety and the life of every man jack aboard of her. I see things going, as I think, not quite right. And I ask you to take certain precautions or let me resign my berth. And that's all. Captain Smollett, began the doctor with a smile, did you ever hear the fable of the mountain and the mouse? You'll excuse me, I dare say, but you remind me of that fable. When you came in here, I'll stake my wig, you meant more than this. Doctor, said the captain, you're smart. When I came in here, I meant to get discharged. I had no thought that Mr. Trelawney would hear a word. No more I would, cried the squire. Had Livesey not been here, I should have seen you to the deuce. As it is, I've heard you, I will do as you desire, but I think the worse of you. That's as you please, sir, said the captain. You'll find I do my duty. And with that he took his leave. Trelawney, said the doctor, contrary to all my notions, I believe you have managed to get two honest men on board with you. That man and John Silver. Silver, if you like, cried the squire. But as for that intolerable humbug, I declare I think his conduct unmanly, unsailorly, and downright un-English. Well, says the doctor, we shall see. When we came on deck, the men had begun already to take out the arms and powder, yo-hoing at their work, 
while the captain and Mr. Arrow stood by superintending. The new arrangement was quite to my liking. The whole schooner had been overhauled. Six berths had been made astern out of what had been the after part of the main hold. And this set of cabins was only joined to the galley and forecastle by a sparred passage on the port side. It had been originally meant that the captain, Mr. Arrow, Hunter, Joyce, the doctor and the squire were to occupy these six berths. Now Red Ruth and I were to get two of them and Mr. Arrow and the captain were to sleep on deck in the companion which had been enlarged on each side till you might almost have called it a roundhouse. Very low it was still, of course, but there was room to swing two hammocks, and even the mate seemed pleased with the arrangement. Even he, perhaps, had been doubtful as to the crew, but that is only guess, for, as you shall hear, we had not long the benefit of his opinion. We were all hard at work, changing the powder and the berths, when the last man or two, and Long John along with them, came off in a shore boat. The cook came up the side like a monkey for cleverness. And as soon as he saw what was doing, So ho, mates, says he, what's this? We're changing over powder, Jack, answers one. Why, by the powers, cried Long John, if we do, we'll miss the morning tide. My orders, said the captain shortly. You may go below, my man. Hands will want supper. Aye, aye, sir, answered the cook. And touching his forelock, he disappeared at once in the direction of his galley. That's a good man, Captain, said the doctor. Very likely, sir, replied Captain Smollett. Easy with that, men, easy, he ran on to the fellows who were shifting the powder. And then, suddenly observing me, examining the swivel we carried amidships along Brass Nine. Here, you, ship's boy, he cried. Out of that, off with you to the cook and get some work. And then, as I was hurrying off, I heard him say quite loudly to the doctor, I'll have no favourites on my ship. I assure you, I was quite of the squire's way of thinking, and hated the captain deeply. Chapter 10. The Voyage All that night we were in a great bustle, getting things stowed in their place, and boatfuls of the squire's friends, Mr. Blandley and the like, coming off to wish him a good voyage and a safe return. We never had a night at the Admiral Benbow when I had half the work, and I was dog-tired when, a little before dawn, the boatswain sounded his pipe and the crew began to man the capstan bars. I might have been twice as weary, yet I would not have left the deck. All was so new and interesting to me. The brief commands, the shrill note of the whistle, the men bustling to their places in the glimmer of the ship's lanterns. No barbecue, tip us a stave, cried one voice. The old one, cried another. <laughs> aye, aye, mates, said Long John who was standing by with his crutch under his arm, and at once broke out in the air and words I knew so well. Fifteen men on the dead man's chest, and then the whole crew bore chorus. Yo, ho, ho, and a bottle of rum. And at the third ho, drove the bars before them with a will. Even at that exciting moment, it carried me back to the old Admiral Benbow in a second, and I seemed to hear the voice of the captain piping in the chorus. But soon the anchor was short up, soon it was hanging, dripping at the bows, soon the sails began to draw, and the land and shipping to flit by on either side. And before I could lie down to snatch an hour of slumber, the Hispaniola had begun her voyage to the Isle of Treasure. I'm not going to relate that voyage in detail. It was fairly prosperous. The ship proved to be a good ship, the crew were capable seamen, and the captain thoroughly understood his business. But before we came the length of Treasure Island, two or three things had happened which required to be known. Mr. Arrow, first of all, turned out even worse than the captain had feared. He had no command among the men, and people did what they pleased with him. But that was by no means the worst of it. For after a day or two at sea, he began to appear on deck with hazy eye, red cheeks, stuttering tongue, and other marks of drunkenness. Time after time he was ordered below in disgrace. Sometimes he fell and cut himself. Sometimes he lay all day long in his little bunk at one side of the companion. Sometimes for a day or two he would be almost sober and attend to his work at least passably. In the meantime, we could never make out where he got the drink. That was the ship's mystery. 
Watch him as we pleased, we could do nothing to solve it. And when we asked him to his face, he would only laugh if he were drunk, and if he were sober, deny solemnly that he ever tasted anything but water. He was not only useless as an officer, and a bad influence amongst the men, but it was plain that at this rate he must soon kill himself outright. So nobody was much surprised, nor very sorry, when one dark night, with a head sea, he disappeared entirely and was seen no more. Overboard, said the captain. Well, gentlemen, that saves the trouble of putting him in irons. But there we were, without a mate. And it was necessary, of course, to advance one of the men. The boatswain, Joe Banderson, was the likeliest man aboard, and though he kept his old title, he served in a way as mate. Mr. Trelawney had followed the sea, and his knowledge made him very useful, for he often took a watch himself in easy weather. And the coxswain, Israel Hands, was a careful, wily old experienced seaman who could be trusted at a pinch with almost anything. He was a great confidant of Long John Silver, and so the mention of his name leads me on to speak of our ship's cook, Barbecue, as the men called him. Aboard ship, he carried his crutch by a lanyard round his neck to have both hands as free as possible. It was something to see him wedge the foot of the crutch against a bulkhead and propped against it, yielding to every movement of the ship, get on with his cooking like someone safe ashore. Still more strange was it to see him in the heaviest of weather cross the deck. He had a line or two rigged up to help him across the widest spaces, Long John's earrings they were called, and he would hand himself from one place to another, now using the crutch, now trailing it alongside by the lanyard, as quickly as another man could walk. Yet some of the men who had sailed with him before expressed their pity to see him so reduced. He's no common man, Barbecue, said the coxswain to me. He had good schooling in his young days, and can speak like a book when so minded. And brave, a lion's nothing alongside a long john. I've seen him grapple for and knock their heads together. Him unarmed. All the crew respected and even obeyed him. He had a way of talking to each and doing everybody some particular service. To me, he was unweariedly kind and always glad to see me in the galley, which he kept as clean as a new pin, the dishes hanging up burnished and his parrot in a cage in one corner. Come away, Hawkins, he would say. Come and have a yarn with John. Nobody more welcome than yourself, my son. Sit you down and hear the news. Here's Captain Flint. I calls my parrot Captain Flint after the famous buccaneer. Here's Captain Flint predicting success to our voyage. Wasn't you, Captain? And the parrot would say with great rapidity, Pieces of eight! Pieces of eight! Pieces of eight! Till you wondered that it was not out of breath, or till John flew his handkerchief over the cage. Now that bird, he would say, is maybe... Two hundred years old, Hawkins. They live forever, mostly. And if anybody's seen more wickedness, it must be the devil himself. She sailed with England, the great Captain England, the pirate. She's been at Madagascar, and at Malabar, and Suriname, and Providence, and Portobello. She was at the fishing up of the wrecked plate ships. It's there she learned pieces of eight, and little wonder. Three hundred and fifty thousand of them, Hawkins. She was at the boarding of the Viceroy of the Indies, out of Goa she was. And to look at her, you would think she was a babby. Then you smelt powder, didn't you, Captain? Stand by to go about, the parrot would scream. Ah, she's a handsome craft, she is, the cook would say, and give her sugar from his pocket. And then the bird would peck at the bars and swear straight on, passing belief for wickedness. There, John would add, you can't touch pitch and not be mucked, lad. Here's this poor old innocent bird of mine swearing blue fire, and none the wiser you may lay to that. She would swear the same, in a manner of speaking, before chaplain. And John would touch his forelock with a solemn way he had that made me think he was the best of men. In the meantime, the squire and Captain Smollett were still on pretty distant terms with one another. The squire made no bones about the matter. He despised the captain. The captain, on his part, never spoke but when he was spoken to, and then, sharp and short and dry, and not a word wasted. 
He owned when driven into a corner that he seemed to have been wrong about the crew, that some of them were as brisk as he wanted to see, and all had behaved fairly well. As for the ship, he had taken a downright fancy to her. She'll lie a point nearer the wind than a man has a right to expect of his own married wife, sir. But, he would add, all I say is, we're not home again, and I don't like the cruise. The squire at this would turn away and march up and down the deck, chin in air. A trifle more of that man, he would say, and I shall explode. We had some heavy weather, which only proved the qualities of the Hispaniola. Every man on board seemed well content, and they must have been hard to please if they'd been otherwise, for it is my belief there never was a ship's company so spoiled since Noah put to sea. Double grog was going on the least excuse. There was duff on odd days, as for instance, if the squire heard it was any man's birthday, and always a barrel of apples standing broached in the waist for anyone to help himself that had a fancy. Never knew good come of it yet, the captain said to Dr. Livesey. Spoil forecastle hands, make devils. That's my belief. But good did come of the apple barrel, as you shall hear. For if it had not been for that, we should have had no note of warning, and might all have perished by the hand of treachery. This was how it came about. We had run up the trades to get wind of the island we were after. I'm not allowed to be more plain. And now we were running down for it, with a bright lookout day and night. It was about the last day of our outward voyage by the largest computation. Sometime that night, or the latest before noon on the morrow, we should sight the treasure island. We were heading south-south-west, and had a steady breeze abeam and a quiet sea. The Hispaniola rolled steadily, dipping her bowsprit now and then with a whiff of spray. All was drawing, a low and aloft, Everyone was in the bravest spirits because we were now so near an end of the first part of our adventure. Now, just after sundown, when all my work was over and I was on my way to my berth, it occurred to me that I should like an apple. I ran on deck. The watch was all foreign, looking out for the island. The man at the helm was watching the luff of the sail and whistling away gently to himself, and that was the only sound excepting the swish of the sea against the bows and around the sides of the ship. In I got, bodily, into the apple barrel, and found there was scarce an apple left, but sitting down there in the dark, what with the sound of the waters and the rocking movement of the ship, I had either fallen asleep or was on the point of doing so, when a heavy man sat down with rather a clash close by. The barrel shook as he leaned his shoulders against it, and I was just about to jump up when the man began to speak. It was Silver's voice, and before I'd heard a dozen words, I would not have shown myself for all the world, but lay there, trembling and listening, in the extreme of fear and curiosity, for, from these dozen words, I understood that the lives of all the honest men aboard depended upon me alone. Chapter 11. What I Heard in the Apple Barrel No, not I, said Silver. Flint was captain. I was quartermaster along my timber leg. The same broadside I lost my leg, old Pew lost his deadlights. It was a master surgeon, him that amputated me, out of college and all, Latin by the bucket and what not. But he was hanged like a dog and sun-dried like the rest at Corso Castle. That was Roberts's men, that was, and come of changing names to their ships, Royal Fortune and so on. Now what a ship was christened, so let her stay, I says. So it was with the Cassandra, as brought us all safe home from Malabar, after England took the Viceroy of the Indies. So it was with the old Walrus, Flint's old ship, as I've seen a muck with the red blood and fit to sink with gold. Ah, cried another voice, that of the youngest hand on board, and evidently full of admiration. He was the flower of the flock, was Flint. Davis was a man too, by all accounts, said Silver. I never sailed along of him. First with England, then with Flint, that's my story. And now here, on my own account, the manner of speaking, 
I laid by 900 safe from England and 2,000 after Flint. That ain't bad for a man before the mast, all safe in bank. Tain't earning now, it's saving does it, you may lay to that. Where's all England's men now? I don't know. Where's Flint? Why, most of them are bored here and glad to get the duff. Been begging before that, some of them. Old Pew has lost his sight and might have thought shame spends twelve hundred pound in a year like a lord in Parliament. Where is he now? Well, he's dead now and under hatches. But for two years before that shiver my timbers, the man was starving. He begged and he stole and he cut throats and starved at that by the powers. Well, it ain't much use after all, said the young seaman. It ain't much use for fools, you may lay to it. That or nothing, cried Silver. But now, you look here. You're young, you are, but you're smart as paint. I see that when I set my eyes on you, and I'll talk to you like a man. You may imagine how I felt when I heard this abominable old rogue addressing another in the very same words of flattery as he'd used to myself. I think if I'd been able that I would have killed him through the barrel. Meantime, he ran on, little supposing he was overheard. Here it is about gentlemen of fortune. They live rough and they risk swinging, but they eat and drink like fighting cocks. And when a cruise is done, why, it's hundreds of pounds instead of hundreds of farthings in their pockets. Now, the most goes for rum and a good fling, and to sea again in their shirts. But that's not the course I lay. I puts it all away, some here, some there, and none too much anywheres by reason of suspicion. I'm fifty, mark you. Once back from this cruise, I set up gentlemen in earnest. Time enough too, says you. Ah, but I lived easy in the meantime. Never denied myself a nothing heart desires. And slept soft and ate dainty all my days but when at sea. And how did I begin? Before the mass like you. Well, said the other, but all the other money's gone now, isn't it? You don't show face in Bristol after this. Why, where might you suppose it was? Asked Silver derisively. At Bristol, in banks and places answered his companion. It were, said the cook, it were when we weighed anchor. But my old missus has it all by now, and the spyglass is sold, lease and goodwill and rigging, and the old girl's off to meet me. I would tell you were, for I trust you, but it'd make jealousy among the mates. And can you trust your missus? asked the other. Gentlemen of fortune, returned the cook, usually trusts little among themselves, and right they are, you may lay to it. But I have a way with me, I have. When a mate brings a slip on his cable, one as knows me, I mean, it won't be in the same world with old John. There were some that was feared of Pew, and some that was feared of Flint, but Flint his own self was feared of me. Feared he was, and proud. They was the roughest crew afloat, was Flint's. The devil himself would have been feared to go to sea with them. Well, now, I tell you, I'm not a boasting man, and you've seen yourself how easy I keep company. But when I was quartermaster, lambs wasn't the word for Flint's old buccaneers. Ah, you may be sure of yourself in old John's ship. Well, I tell you now, replied the lad, I didn't half a quarter like the job till I had this talk with you, John, but there's my hand on it now. And a brave lad you were, and smart too, answered Silver, shaking hands so heartily that all the barrels shook. And a finer figurehead for a gentleman of fortune I never clapped my eyes on. By this time I had begun to understand the meaning of their terms. By a gentleman of fortune, they plainly meant neither more nor less than a common pirate. And the little scene that I had overheard was the last act in the corruption of one of the honest hands, perhaps of the last one left aboard. But on this point, I was soon to be relieved, for Silver giving a little whistle, a third man strolled up and sat down by the party. 
Dick square, said Silver. Oh, I know Dick was square, returned the voice of the cox in his real hands. He's no fool, is Dick. And he turned his quid and spat. But look here, he went on. Here's what I want to know, Barbecue. How long are we a going to stand off and on like a blessed bum boat? I've had almost enough of Captain Smollett. He's hazed me long enough by thunder. I want to go into that cabin, I do. I want their pickles and wines and that. Israel, said Silver, your head ain't much account, nor never was. But you're able to hear, I reckon. Leastways, your ears is big enough. Now, here's what I say. You'll berth forward, and you'll live hard, and you'll speak soft, and you'll keep sober till I give the word, and you may lay to that, my son. Well, I don't say no, do I? growled the coxswain. What I say is when, that's what I say. When, by the powers, cried Silver. Well, now, if you want to know, I'll tell you when. The last moment I can manage, and that's when. Here's a first-rate seaman, Captain Smollett, sails the blessed ship for us. Here's the squire and the doctor, with a map and such. I don't know where it is, do I? No more do you, says you. Well, then, I mean this squire and doctor shall find the stuff and help us to get it aboard by the powers. Then we'll see. If I was sure of you all, sons of double Dutchmen, I'd have Captain Smollett navigators halfway back again before I struck. Why, well, we're all seamen aboard here, I should think, said the lad Dick. We're all forecastle hands, you mean, snapped Silver. We can steer a course, but who's to set one? That's what all you gentlemen split on, first and last. If I had my way, I'd have Captain Smollett work us back into the trades, at least. Then we'd have no blessed miscalculations and a spoonful of water a day. But I know the sort you are. I'll finish with them at the island, as soon as the blunt's on board. And a pity it is. But you're never happy till you're drunk. Split my sides of a sick heart to sail with the likes of you. Easy all, Long John, cried Israel. Who's a crossing of you? Why, how many tall ships, think you now, have I seen laid aboard? And how many brisk lads drying in the sun at execution dock? cried Silver. And all for this same hurry and hurry and hurry. You hear me? I've seen a thing or two at sea, I have. If you'd only lay your course and a point to windward, you would ride in carriages, you would. But not you. I know you. You'll have your mouthful of rum tomorrow and go hang. Everybody knowed you was a kind of chaplain, John. But there's others that could hand and steer as well as you, said Israel. They liked a bit of fun, they did. They wasn't so high and dry, no how, but took their fling like jolly companions, every one. So, says Silver, well, and where are they now? Pew was that short, and he died a beggar man. Flint was, and he died of rum at Savannah. Oh, they was a sweet crew, they was. Only, where are they? But, asked Dick, when we do lay them athwart, what are we to do with them anyhow? There's the man for me, cried the cook admiringly. That's what I call business. Well, what do you think? Put them ashore like maroons? That would have been England's way. Or cut them down like that much pork. That would have been Flint's. Or Billy Bones's. Billy was the man for that, said Israel. Dead men don't bite, says he. Well, he's dead now himself. He knows the long and the short of it now. And if ever a rough hand come to port, it was Billy. Right you are, said Silver. Rough and ready. But mark you here. I'm an easy man. I'm quite the gentleman, says you, but this time it's serious. Duty is duty, mates. I give my vote death. When I'm in Parliament and riding in my coach, I don't want none of these sea lawyers in the cabin a coming home unlooked for, like the devil at prayers. Wait is what I say, but when the time comes, why let her rip? John cries the coxswain. You're a man. You'll say so, Israel, when you see, said Silver. 
Only one thing I claim. I claim Trelawney. I'll wring his calf's head off his body with these hands. Dick, he added, breaking off, you just jump up like a sweet lad and get me an apple to wet my pipe like. You may fancy the terror I was in. I should have leapt out and run for it if I'd found the strength, but my limbs and heart alike misgave me. I heard Dick begin to rise, and then someone seemingly stopped him, and the voice of Hans exclaimed, Oh, stow that! Don't you go sucking at that bilge, John. Let's have a go of the rum. Dick, said Silver, I trust you. I've a gauge on the keg, mind. There's the key. You fill a pannikin and bring it up. Terrified as I was, I could not help thinking to myself that this must have been how Mr. Arrow got the strong waters that destroyed him. Dick was gone but a little while, and during his absence, Israel spoke straight on in the cook's ear. It was but a word or two that I could catch, and yet I gathered some important news, for besides other scraps that tended to the same purpose, this whole clause was audible. Not another man of them will join. Hence there were still faithful men on board. When Dick returned, one after another of the trio took the pannikin and drank. One to luck, another with a years to old flint, and Silver himself saying in a kind of song, Here's to ourselves and hold your luff, plenty of prizes and plenty of duff. Just then a sort of brightness fell upon me in the barrel, and looking up, I found the moon had risen and was silvering the mizzen top and shining white on the love of the foresaw. And almost at the same time, the voice of the lookout shouted, Land Ho! Chapter 12 Council of War There was a great rush of feet across the deck. I could hear people tumbling up from the cabin and the forecastle, and slipping in an instant outside my barrel. I dived behind the foresaw, made a double towards the stern, and came out upon the open deck in time to join Hunter and Dr. Livesey in the rush for the weather bow. There all hands were already congregated. A belt of fog had lifted almost simultaneously with the appearance of the moon. Away to the southwest of us we saw two low hills about a couple of miles apart, and rising behind one of them a third and higher hill whose peak was still buried in the fog. All three seemed sharp and conical in figure. So much I saw, almost in a dream, for I had not yet recovered from my horrid fear of a minute or two before. And then I heard the voice of Captain Smollett issuing orders. The Hispaniola was laid a couple of points nearer the wind, and now sailed a course that would just clear the island to the east. And now, men, said the captain, when all was sheeted home, has any one of you ever seen that land ahead? I have, sir, said Silver. I watered there with a trader I was cooking. The anchorage is on the south, behind an islet, I fancy, asked the captain. Yes, sir. A skeleton island, they calls it. It were a main place for pirates once, and a hand we had on board knowed all their names for it. That hill to the norad they calls the Foremast Hill. There are three hills in a row, running southward, four main and mizzen, sir. But the main, that's the big one with the cloud on it, they usually calls the spyglass, by reason of a lookout they kept when they was in the anchorage cleaning. For it's there they cleaned their ships, sir, <laughs> asking your pardon. I have a chart here, says Captain Smollett. See if that's the place. Long John's eyes burned in his head as he took the chart. But by the fresh look of the paper, I knew he was doomed to disappointment. This was not the map we found in Billy Bones's chest, but an accurate copy, complete in all things, names and heights and soundings, with the single exception of the red crosses and the written notes. Sharp as must have been his annoyance, Silver had the strength of mind to hide it. Yes, sir, said he, this is the spot, to be sure, and very prettily drawn out. <laughs> Who might have done that, I wonder? The pirates were too ignorant, I reckon. <laughs> Aye, here it is. Captain Kidd's Anchorage, just the name my shipmate called it. There's a strong current runs along the south, and then away norad up the west coast. Right you was, sir, 
says he, to haul your wind and keep the weather of the island. Leastways, if such was your intention to enter and careen, and there ain't no better place for that in these waters. Thank you, my man, says Captain Smollett. I'll ask you later on to give us a help. You may go. I was surprised at the coolness with which John avowed his knowledge of the island, and I own I was half frightened when I saw him drawing nearer to myself. He did not know, to be sure, that I had overheard his counsel from the apple barrel, and yet I had by this time taken such a horror of his cruelty, duplicity, and power that I could scarce conceal a shudder when he laid his hand upon my arm. Ah, says he, this here is a sweet spot, this island. A sweet spot for a lad to get ashore on. You'll bathe and you'll climb trees and you'll hunt goats, you will, and you'll get aloft on them hills like a goat yourself. <laughs> Why, it makes me young again. I was going to forget my timber leg, I was. <laughs> it's a pleasant thing to be young and to have ten toes. You may lay to that. <laughs> When you want to go a bit of exploring, you just ask old John, and he'll put up a snack for you to take along. And clapping me in the friendliest way upon the shoulder, he hobbled off forward and went below. Captain Smollett, the squire, and Dr. Lipsy were talking together on the quarter-deck, and anxious as I was to tell them my story, I durst not interrupt them openly. While I was still casting about in my thoughts to find some probable excuse, Dr. Livesey called me to his side. He'd left his pipe below, and being a slave to tobacco had meant that I should fetch it, but as soon as I was near enough to speak and not be overheard, I broke immediately. Doctor, let me speak. Get the captain and squire down to the cabin, and then make some pretense to send for me. I have terrible news. Doctor changed countenance a little, but next moment he was master of himself. Thank you, Jim, said he quite loudly. That was all I wanted to know, as if he'd asked me a question. And with that, he turned on his heel and rejoined the other two. They spoke together for a little, and though none of them started or raised his voice or so much as whistled, it was plain enough that Dr. Livesey had communicated my request. For the next thing that I heard was the captain giving an order to Joe Anderson, and all hands were piped on deck. My lads, said Captain Smollett, I've a word to say to you. This land that we have sighted is the place we've been sailing for. Mr. Trelawney, being a very open-handed gentleman, as we all know, has just asked me a word or two, and as I was able to tell him that every man on board had done his duty, alow and aloft, as I never asked to see it done better, why, he and I and the doctor are going below to the cabin to drink your health and luck. And you'll have grog served out to you to drink our health and luck. I'll tell you what I think of this. I think it handsome. And if you think as I do, you'll give a good sea cheer for the gentleman that does it. The cheer followed. That was a matter of course. But it rang out so full and hearty that I confess I could hardly believe these same men were plotting for our blood. One more cheer for Captain Smollett, cried Long John, when the first had subsided. And this also was given with a will. On the top of that, the three gentlemen went below. And not long after, word was sent forward that Jim Hawkins was wanted in the cabin. I found them all three seated round the table, a bottle of Spanish wine and some raisins before them, and the doctor smoking away with his wig on his lap, and that I knew was a sign that he was agitated. The stern window was open, for it was a warm night, and you could see the moon shining behind on the ship's wake. No, Hawkins, said the squire. You have something to say. Speak up. I did as I was bid, and, as short as I could make it, told the whole details of Silver's conversation. Nobody interrupted me till I was done, nor did any one of the three of them make so much as a movement, but they kept their eyes upon my face from first to last. Jim, said Dr. Livesey, take a seat, and they may be sit down at table beside them poured me out a glass of wine, filled my hands with raisins, and all three, one after the other, and each with a bow, drank my good health and their service to me for my luck and courage. Now, Captain, said the squire, you were right and I was wrong. I own myself an ass and I await your orders. 
No more an ass than I, sir, returned the captain. I never heard of a crew that meant to mutiny but what showed signs before, for any man that had an eye in his head to see the mischief and take steps according. But this crew, he added, beats me. Captain, said the doctor, with your permission, that's Silver, a very remarkable man. He'd look remarkably well from a yard arm, sir, returned the captain. But this is talk. This don't lead to anything. I see three or four points, and with Mr. Trelawney's permission, I'll name them. You, sir, are the captain. It's for you to speak, says Mr. Trelawney grandly. First point, began Mr. Smollett. We must go on because we can't turn back. If I gave the word to go about, they would rise at once. Second point. We have time before us, at least until this treasure is found. Third point, there are faithful hands. Now, sir, it's got to come to blows sooner or later, and what I propose is to take time by the forelock, as the saying is, and to come to blows some fine day when they least expect it. We can count, I take it, on your own home servants, Mr. Trelawney. As upon myself, declared the squire. Three, reckoned the captain. Ourselves make seven, counting Hawkins here. Now, about the honest hands. Most likely Trelawney's own men, said the doctor. Those he'd picked up for himself before he lit on silver. Nay, replied the squire, hands was one of mine. I did think I could have trusted hands, added the captain. And to think that they're all Englishmen, broke out the squire. Sir, I could find it in my heart to blow the ship up. Well, gentlemen, said the captain, the best I can say is not much. We must lay to, if you please, and keep a bright lookout. It's trying on a man I know. It would be pleasanter to come to blows, but there's no help for it till we know our men. Lay to and whistle for a wind, that's my view. Jim here, said the doctor, can help us more than anyone. The men are not shy with him, and Jim is a noticing man. Hawkins, I put prodigious faith in you, added the squire. I began to feel pretty desperate at this, for I felt altogether helpless. And yet, by an odd train of circumstances, it was indeed through me that safety came. In the meantime, talk as we pleased, there were only seven out of the twenty-six on whom we knew we could rely. And out of these seven, one was a boy, so that the grown men on our side was six to their nineteen. Part Three, My Shore Adventure. Chapter Thirteen, How My Shore Adventure Began. The appearance of the island when I came on deck next morning was altogether changed. Although the breeze had now utterly ceased, we had made a great deal of way during the night and were now lying becalmed about half a mile to the southeast of the low eastern coast. Grey-coloured woods covered a large part of the surface. This even tint was indeed broken up by streaks of yellow sand break in the lower lands, and by many tall trees of the pine family, outtopping the others, some singly, some in clumps, but the general colouring was uniform and sad. The hills ran up clear above the vegetation in spires of naked rock. All were strangely shaped, and the spyglass, which was by three or four hundred feet the tallest on the island, was likewise the strangest in configuration, running up sheer from almost every side, and then suddenly cut off at the top, like a pedestal to put a statue on. The Hispaniola was rolling scuppers under in the ocean swell, the booms were tearing at the blocks, the rudder was banging to and fro, and the whole ship creaking, groaning, and jumping like a manufactory. I had to cling tight to the backstay, and the world turned giddily before my eyes, for though I was a good enough sailor when there was way on, this standing still and being rolled about like a bottle was a thing I never learned to stand without a qualm or so, above all in the morning on an empty stomach. Perhaps it was this, perhaps it was the look of the island with its grey, melancholy woods, wild stone spires, and the surf that we could both see and hear foaming and thundering on the steep beach. 
At least, although the sun shone bright and hot, and the shore birds were fishing and crying all around us, and you would have thought anyone would have been glad to get to land after being so long at sea, my heart sank, as the saying is, into my boots. And from the first look onward, I hated the very thought of Treasure Island. We had a dreary morning's work before us, for there was no sign of any wind, and the boats had to be got out and manned, and the ship warped three or four miles round the corner of the island and up the narrow passage to the haven behind Skeleton Island. I volunteered for one of the boats, where I had, of course, no business. The heat was sweltering, and the men grumbled fiercely over their work. Anderson was in command of my boat, and instead of keeping the crew in order, he grumbled as loud as the worst. Well, he said with an oath, it's not forever. I thought this was a very bad sign, for up to that day the men had gone briskly and willingly about their business, but the very sight of the island had relaxed the cords of discipline. All the way in, Long John stood by the steersman and conned the ship. He knew the passage like the palm of his hand, and though the man in the chains got everywhere more water than was down in the chart, John never hesitated once. There's a strong scour with the ebb, he said, and this here passage has been dug out in a manner of speaking with a spade. We brought up just where the anchor was in the chart, and about a third of a mile from each shore, the mainland on one side and Skeleton Island on the other. The bottom was clean sand. The plunge of our anchor sent up clouds of birds wheeling and crying over the woods. But in less than a minute they were down again, and all was once more silent. The place was entirely landlocked, buried in woods, the trees coming right down to high water mark, the shores mostly flat, and the hilltops standing round at a distance in a sort of amphitheatre, one here, one there. Two little rivers, or rather two swamps, emptied out into this pond, as you might call it, and the foliage round that part of the shore had a kind of poisonous brightness. From the ship we could see nothing of the house or stockade, for they were quite buried among trees, and if it had not been for the chart on the companion, we might have been the first that had ever anchored there since the island arose out of the seas. There was not a breath of air moving, nor a sound but that of the surf booming half a mile away along the beaches and against the rocks outside. A peculiar stagnant smell hung over the anchorage, the smell of sodden leaves and rotting tree trunks. I observed the doctor sniffing and sniffing, like someone tasting a bad egg. I don't know about treasure, he said, but I'll stake my wig this fever here. If the conduct of the men had been alarming in the boat, it became truly threatening when they'd come aboard. They lay about the deck, growling together in talk. The slightest order was received with a black look and grudgingly and carelessly obeyed. Even the honest hands must have caught the infection, for there was not one man aboard to mend another. Mutiny, it was plain, hung over us like a thundercloud. And it was not only we of the cabin party who perceived the danger. Long John was hard at work going from group to group, spending himself in good advice. And as for example, no man could have shown a better. He fairly outstripped himself in willingness and civility. He was all smiles to everyone. If an order were given, John would be on his crutch in an instant with the cheeriest aye aye sir in the world. And when there was nothing else to do, he kept up one song after another, as if to conceal the discontent of the rest. Of all the gloomy features of that gloomy afternoon, this obvious anxiety on the part of Long John appeared the worst. We held a council in the cabin. Sir, said the captain, if I risk another order, the whole ship will come about our ears by the run. You see, sir, here it is. I get a rough answer, do I not? Well, if I speak back, pikes will be going in two shakes. If I don't, Silver will see there's something under that, and the game's up. Now, we've only one man to rely on. And who is that? asked the squire. Silver, sir, returned the captain. He's as anxious as you and I to smother things up. 
This is a tiff. He'd soon talk him out of it if he had the chance. And what I propose to do is to give him the chance. Let's allow the men an afternoon ashore. If they all go, why, we'll fight the ship. If they none of them go, well then, we hold the cabin and God defend the right. If some go, you mark my word, sir, Silver will bring them aboard again as mild as lambs. It was so decided. Loaded pistols were served out to all the shore men. Hunter, Joyce and Red Ruth were taken into our confidence and received the news with less surprise and a better spirit than we had looked for. And then the captain went on deck and addressed the crew. My lads, said he, we've had a hot day and are all tired and out of sorts. A turn ashore will hurt nobody. The boats are still in the water. You can take the gigs and as many as please may go ashore for the afternoon. I'll fire a gun half an hour before sundown. I believe the silly fellows must have thought they would break their shins over treasure as soon as they were landed. For they all came out of their sulks in a moment, and gave a cheer that started the echo in a faraway hill, and sent the birds once more flying and squalling round the anchorage. The captain was too bright to be in the way. He whipped out of sight in a moment, leaving Silver to arrange the party. And I fancy it was as well he did so. Had he been on deck, he could no longer so much as have pretended not to understand the situation. It was as plain as day. Silver was the captain, and a mighty rebellious crew he had of it. The honest hands, and I was soon to see it proved that there were such on board, must have been very stupid fellows. Or rather, I suppose the truth was this, that all hands were disaffected by the example of the ringleaders, only some more, some less, and a few, being good fellows in the main, could neither be led nor driven any further. It is one thing to be idle and sulk, and quite another to take a ship and murder a number of innocent men. At last, however, the party was made up. Six fellows were to stay on board, and the remaining thirteen, including Silver, began to embark. Then it was that there came into my head the first of the mad notions that contributed so much to save our lives. If six men were left by Silver, it was plain our party could not take and fight the ship, and since only six were left, it was equally plain that the cabin party had no present need of my assistance. It occurred to me at once to go ashore. In a jiffy I'd slipped over the side and curled up in the foresheets of the nearest boat, and almost at the same moment she shoved off. No one took notice of me, only the bow oar saying, Is that you, Jim? Keep your head down. But Silver, from the other boat, looked sharply over and called out to know if that were me. And from that moment, I began to regret what I had done. The crews raced for the beach, but the boat I was in, having some start and being at once the lighter and the better manned, shot far ahead of her consort. And the bow had struck among the shoreside trees, and I caught a branch and swung myself out and plunged into the nearest thicket while Silver and the rest were still a hundred yards behind. Jim! Jim! I heard him shouting, but you may suppose I paid no heed. Jumping, ducking, and breaking through, I ran straight before my nose till I could run no longer. Chapter 14 The First Blow I was so pleased at having given the slip to Long John that I began to enjoy myself and look around me with some interest on the strange land that I was in. I crossed a marshy tract full of willows, bulrushes, and odd, outlandish, swampy trees, and I'd now come out upon the skirts of an open piece of undulating, sandy country, about a mile long, dotted with a few pines and a great number of contorted trees, not unlike the oak in growth, but pale in the foliage, like willows. On the far side of the open stood one of the hills, with two quaint craggy peaks shining vividly in the sun. I now felt for the first time the joy of exploration. The isle was uninhabited, my shipmates I'd left behind, and nothing lived in front of me but dumb brutes and fowls. I turned hither and thither among the trees. Here and there there were flowering plants, unknown to me. Here and there I saw snakes, and one raised his head from a ledge of rock and hissed at me with a noise not unlike the spinning of a top. 
Little did I suppose that he was a deadly enemy, and that the noise was the famous rattle. Then I came to a long thicket of these oak-like trees, live or evergreen oaks, I heard afterwards they should be called, which grew low along the sand like brambles, the boughs curiously twisted, the foliage compact, like thatch. The thicket stretched down from the top of one of the sandy knolls, spreading and growing taller as it went, until it reached the margin of the broad reedy fen, through which the nearest of the little rivers soaked its way into the anchorage. The marsh was steaming in the strong sun, and the outline of the spyglass trembled through the haze. All at once, there began to be a sort of bustle among the bulrushes. A wild duck flew up with a quack, another followed, and soon, over the whole surface of the marsh, a great cloud of birds hung screaming and circling in the air. I judged at once that some of my shipmates must be drawing near along the borders of the fen. Nor was I deceived, for soon I heard the very distant and low tones of a human voice, which, as I continued to give ear, grew steadily louder and nearer. This put me in a great fear, and I crawled under cover of the nearest live oak, and squatted there, hearkening, as silent as a mouse. Another voice answered, and then the first voice, which I now recognized to be Silver's, once more took up the story and ran on for a long while in a stream, only now and again interrupted by the other. By the sound they must have been talking earnestly and almost fiercely, but no distinct word came to my hearing. At last, the speakers seemed to have paused and perhaps to have sat down for not only did they cease to draw any nearer, but the birds themselves began to grow more quiet and to settle again to their places in the swamp. And now I began to feel that I was neglecting my business, that since I had been so foolhardy as to come ashore with these desperadoes, the least I could do was to overhear them at their councils, and that my plain and obvious duty was to draw as close as I could manage under the favourable ambush of the crouching trees. I could tell the direction of the speakers pretty exactly, not only by the sound of their voices, but by the behaviour of the few birds that still hung in alarm above the heads of the intruders. Crawling on all fours, I made steadily but slowly towards them, till at last, raising my head to an aperture among the leaves, I could see clear down into a little green dell beside the marsh and closely set about with trees, where Long John Silver and another of the crew stood face to face in conversation. The sun beat full upon them. Silver had thrown his hat beside him on the ground, and his great smooth blonde face, all shining with heat, was lifted to the other man's in a kind of appeal. Mate, he was saying, it's because I think it's gold dust of you. Gold dust and you may lay to that. If I hadn't took to you like pitch, do you think I'd have been here a warning of you? All's up. You can't make nor mend. It's to save your neck that I was speaking. And if one of the wild uns knew it, where'd I be, Tom? Now, tell me, where'd I be? Silver, said the other man. And I observed he was not only red in the face, but spoke as hoarse as a crow. And his voice shook, too, like a taut rope. Silver says he. You're old, and you're honest, or has the name for it. And you've money, too, which lots of poor sailors hasn't. And you're brave, or I'm mistook. And will you tell me you let yourself be led away with that kind of a mess of swamps? Not you. As sure as God sees me, I'd sooner lose my hand. If I turn against my duty... And then, all of a sudden, he was interrupted by a noise. I had found one of the honest hands. Well, here at the same moment came news of another. Far away out in the marsh, there arose all of a sudden a sound like the cry of anger, then another on the back of it, and then one horrid, long-drawn scream. The rocks of the spyglass re-echoed it a score of times. The whole troop of marsh birds rose again, darkening heaven with a simultaneous whirr. And, long after that death yell was still ringing in my brain, silence had re-established its empire, and only the rustle of the redescending birds 
and the boom of the distant surges disturbed the languor of the afternoon. Tom had leapt at the sound, like a horse at the spur, but Silver had not winked an eye. He stood where he was, resting lightly on his crutch, watching his companion like a snake about to spring. John, said the sailor, stretching out his hand. Hands off, cried Silver, leaping back a yard, as it seemed to me, with the speed and security of a trained gymnast. Hands off if you like, John Silver, said the other. It's a black conscience that can make you fear to me. But in heaven's name, tell me what was that? That, returned Silver, smiling away, but warier than ever, his eye a mere pinpoint in his big face, but gleaming like a crumb of glass. That, oh, I reckon that'll be Alan. And at this point, Tom flashed out like a hero. Alan, he cried, then rest his soul for a true seaman. And as for you, John Silver, long you've been a mate of mine, but you're a mate of mine no more. If I die like a dog, I'll die in my duty. You've killed Alan, have you? Kill me too if you can, but I defies you. And with that, this brave fellow turned his back directly on the cook and set off walking for the beach. But he was not destined to go far. With a cry, John seized the branch of a tree, whipped the crutch out of his armpit and sent that uncouth missile hurtling through the air. It struck poor Tom, point foremost and with stunning violence, right between the shoulders in the middle of his back. His hands flew up, he gave a sort of gasp and fell. Whether he were injured much or little, none could ever tell. Like enough to judge from the sound, his back was broken on the spot. But he had no time given him to recover. Silver, agile as a monkey, even without leg or crutch, was on the top of him next moment, and had twice buried his knife up to the hilt in that defenseless body. From my place of ambush, I could hear him pant aloud as he struck the blows. I do not know what it rightly is to faint, but I do know that for the next little while, the whole world swam away from before me in a whirling mist. Silver and the birds and the tall spyglass hilltop going round and round and topsy-turvy before my eyes, and all manner of bells ringing and distant voices shouting in my ear. When I came again to myself, the monster had pulled himself together, his crutch under his arm, his hat upon his head. Just before him, Tom lay motionless upon the sward, but the murderer minded him not of wit cleansing his blood-stained knife the while upon a wisp of grass. Everything else was unchanged, the sun still shining mercilessly on the steaming marsh and the tall pinnacle of the mountain, and I could scarce persuade myself that murder had been actually done, and a human life cruelly cut short a moment since before my eyes. But now John put his hand into his pocket, brought out a whistle, and blew upon it several modulated blasts that rang far across the heated air. I could not tell, of course, the meaning of the signal, but it instantly awoke my fears. More men would be coming. I might be discovered. They had already slain two of the honest people. After Tom and Alan, might not I come next? Instantly I began to extricate myself and crawl back again, with what speed and silence I could manage, to the more open portion of the wood. As I did so, I could hear hails coming and going between the old buccaneer and his comrades, and this sound of danger lent me wings. As soon as I was clear of the thicket, I ran as I never ran before, scarce minding the direction of my flight so long as it led me from the murderers. And as I ran, fear grew and grew upon me until it turned into a kind of frenzy. Indeed, could anyone be more entirely lost than I? When the gun fired, how should I dare go down to the boats among those fiends still smoking from their crime? Would not the first of them who saw me wring my neck like a snipe's? Would not my absence itself be an evidence to them of my alarm and therefore of my fatal knowledge? It was all over, I thought. Goodbye to the Hispaniola. Goodbye to the squire, the doctor, and the captain. There was nothing left for me but death by starvation or death by the hands of the mutineers. 
All this while, as I say, I was still running, and without taking any notice, I draw near to the foot of the little hill with the two peaks, and I got into a part of the island where the live oaks grew more widely apart, and seemed more like forest trees in their bearing and dimensions. Mingled with these were a few scattered pines, some fifty, some nearer seventy feet high. The air, too, smelt more freshly than down beside the marsh. And here, a fresh alarm brought me to a standstill with a thumping heart. Chapter 15 The Man of the Island From the side of the hill, which was here steep and stony, a spout of gravel was dislodged and fell rattling and bounding through the trees. My eyes turned instinctively in that direction, and I saw a figure leap with great rapidity behind the trunk of a pine. What it was, whether bear or man or monkey, I could in no wise tell. It seemed dark and shaggy, more I knew not. But the terror of this new apparition brought me to a stand. I was now, it seemed, cut off upon both sides. Behind me the murderers, before me this lurking nondescript. And immediately I began to prefer the dangers that I knew to those I knew not. Silver himself appeared less terrible in contrast with this creature of the woods. And I turned on my heel and, looking sharply behind me over my shoulder, began to retrace my steps in the direction of the boats. Instantly the figure reappeared making a wide circuit, began to head me off. I was tired at any rate, but had I been as fresh as when I rose, I could see it was in vain for me to contend in speed with such an adversary. From trunk to trunk, the creature flitted like a deer, running man-like on two legs, but unlike any man that I'd ever seen, stooping almost double as it ran. Yet, a man it was. I could no longer be in doubt about that. I began to recall what I had heard of cannibals. I was within an ace of calling for help, but the mere fact that he was a man, however wild, had somehow reassured me, and my fear of silver began to revive in proportion. I stood still, therefore, and cast about for some method of escape, and as I was so thinking, the recollection of my pistol flashed into my mind. As soon as I remembered I was not defenseless, Courage glowed again in my heart, and I set my face resolutely for this man of the island, and walked briskly towards him. He was concealed by this time behind another tree trunk, but he must have been watching me closely, for as soon as I began to move in his direction, he reappeared and took a step to meet me. Then he hesitated, drew back, came forward again, and at last, to my wonder and confusion, threw himself on his knees and held out his clasped hands in supplication. At that, I once more stopped. Who are you? I asked. Ben Gunn, he answered, and his voice sounded hoarse and awkward like a rusty lock. I'm poor Ben Gunn, I am, and I haven't spoke with a Christian these three years. I could now see that he was a white man like myself, and that his features were even pleasing. His skin, wherever it was exposed, was burnt by the sun. Even his lips were black, and his fair eyes looked quite startling in so dark a face. Of all the beggar men that I had seen or fancied, he was the chief for raggedness. He was clothed with tatters of old ship's canvas and old sea cloth and this extraordinary patchwork was all held together by a system of the most various and incongruous fastenings, brass buttons, bits of stick, and loops of tarry gasket. About his waist he wore an old brass buckled leather belt, which was the one thing solid in his whole accoutrement. Three years, I cried. Were you shipwrecked? Nay, mate, said he, marooned. I had heard the word, and I knew it stood for a horrible kind of punishment common enough among the buccaneers, in which the offender is put ashore with a little powder and shot and left behind on some desolate and distant island. Marooned three years ago, he continued, and 
lived on goats since then, and berries and oysters. Wherever a man is, says I, a man can do for himself. But, mate, my heart is sore for Christian diet. You mightn't happen to have a piece of cheese about you now. No? Well, many's the long night I've dreamed of cheese, toasted mostly, and woke up again, and here I were. If ever I can get aboard again, said I, you shall have cheese by the stone. All this time he had been feeling the stuff of my jacket, smoothing my hands, looking at my boots, and generally in the intervals of his speech, showing a childish pleasure in the presence of a fellow creature. But at my last words, he perked up into a kind of startled slyness. If ever you can get aboard again, says you, he repeated. Why now, who's to hinder you? Not you, I know, was my reply. And right you was, he cried. Now you, what do you call yourself, mate? Jim, I told him. Jim, Jim says he, quite pleased apparently. Well now, Jim, I've lived that rough as you'd be ashamed to hear of. Now, for instance, you wouldn't think I had had a pious mother to look at me, he asked. Why, no, not in particular, I answered. Ah, well, said he, but I had remarkable pious, and I was a civil pious boy and could rattle off my catechism that fast you couldn't tell one word from another. <laughs> and here's what it come to, Jim. And it begun with Chuck Farthen on the blessed gravestones. That's what it begun with, but it went further than that. And so my mother told me, and predict the whole she did, the pious woman. But it were Providence that put me here. I've thought it all out in this here lonely island, and I'm back on piety. You don't catch me tasting rum so much, but just a thimbleful for luck, of course, the first chance I have. I'm bound to be good, and now I see the way to. And Jim, looking all round him and lowering his voice to a whisper, I'm rich. I now felt sure that the poor fellow had gone crazy in his solitude, and I suppose I must have shown the feeling in my face, for he repeated the statement hotly. Rich! Rich, I says! And I tell you what, I'll make a man of you, Jim. Ah, Jim, you'll bless your stars, you will. You was the first that found me. And at this... There came suddenly a lowering shadow over his face, and he tightened his grasp upon my hand and raised a forefinger threateningly before my eyes. Ah, Jim, you tell me true. That ain't Flint's ship, he asked. At this I had a happy inspiration. I began to believe that I had found an ally, and I answered him at once. It's not Flint's ship, and Flint is dead, but I'll tell you true, as you ask me. There are some of Flint's hands aboard. Worse luck for the rest of us. Not a man with one leg, he gasped. Silver, I asked. Ah, Silver, says he. That were his name. He's the cook, and the ringleader, too. He was still holding me by the wrist, and at that he gave it quite a ring. If you were sent by Long John, he said, I'm as good as pork, and I know it. Where was you, do you suppose? I had made up my mind in a moment, and by way of answer, told him the whole story of our voyage and the predicament in which we found ourselves. He heard me with the keenest interest, and when I had done, he patted me on the head. You're a good lad, Jim, he said, and you're all in a clove hitch, ain't you? Well, you just put your trust in Ben Gunn. Ben Gunn's the man to do it. Would you think it likely now that your squire would prove a liberal-minded one in case of help? Him being in a clove hitch, as you remark. 
I told him the squire was the most liberal of men. But you see, returned Ben Gunn, that didn't mean giving me a gate to keep and a suit of livery clothes and such. That's not my mark, Jim. What I mean is, would he be likely to come down to the tune of, uh, say, one thousand pounds out of money that's as good as a man's own already? I'm sure he would, said I. As it was, all hands were to share. And a passage home, he added with a look of great shrewdness. Why, I cried, the squire's a gentleman. And besides, if we got rid of the others, we should want you to help work the vessel home. Ah, said he, so you would. And he seemed very much relieved. Now, I'll tell you what, he went on. So much I'll tell you, and no more. I were in Flint's ship, and he buried the treasure. He and six along, six strong seamen. They was ashore nigh on a week, and us standing off and on in the old walrus. One fine day, up went the signal, and here come Flint by himself in a little boat, and his head done up in a blue scarf. The sun was getting up, and mortal white he looked about the cut water. But there he was, you mind, and the six all dead, dead and buried. How we done it? Not a man aboard us could make out. It was battle, murder, and sudden death, least ways. Him against six. Billy Bones was the mate. Long John, he was quartermaster. And they asked him where the treasure was. Ah, says he, you can go ashore if you like, and stay, he says. But as for the ship, she'll beat up for more by thunder. That's what he said. Well, I was in another ship three years back, and we sighted this island. Boys, said I, here's Flint's treasure. Let's land and find it. The captain was displeased at that, but my messmates were all of a mind and landed. Twelve days they looked for it. And every day they had a worse word for me, until one fine morning all hands went aboard. As for you, Benjamin Gunn, says they, here's a musket, he says, and a spade, and pickaxe. You can stay here and find Flint's money for yourself, they says. Well, Jim, three years have I been here, and not a bite of Christian diet from that day to this. But now you look here, look at me. Do I look like a man before the mast? No, says you. Nor I weren't neither, I says. And with that he winked and pinched me hard. Just you mention them words to your squire, Jim, he went on. Nor he weren't neither, that's the words. Three years he were the man of this island. Light and dark, fair and rain. And sometimes he would maybe think upon a prayer, says you. And sometimes he would maybe think of his old mother. So be as she's alive, you'll say. But the most part of Gunn's time, this is what you'll say, the most part of his time was took up with another matter. And then you give him a nip, like I do. And he pinched me again in the most confidential manner. Then, he continued, then you'll up and you'll say this, Gunn is a good man, you'll say, and he puts a precious sight more confidence, a precious sight, mind that, in a gentleman born than in these gentlemen of fortune, having been one himself. Well, I said, I don't understand one word that you've been saying. But well, that's neither here nor there. For how am I to get on board? Ah, said he, that's the hitch for sure. Well, there's my boat that I made with my two hands. I keep her under the white rock. If the worst come to the worst, we might try that after dark. Aye, he broke out. What's that? For just then... 
Although the sun had still an hour or two to run, all the echoes of the island awoke and bellowed to the thunder of a cannon. They've begun to fight, I cried. Follow me. And I began to run towards the anchorage, my terrors all forgotten, while close at my side the maroon man in his goatskins trotted easily and lightly. Left, left, says he. Keep to your left hand, mate Jim, onto the trees with you. There's where I killed my first goat. They don't come down here now. They're all mast added on them mountings for the fear of Benjamin Gunn. <laughs> ah, and there's the cemetery. Cemetery, you must have meant. You see the mounds? I come here and prayed nows and thens when I thought maybe a Sunday would be about due. It weren't quite a chapel, but it seemed more solemn like. And then, says you, Ben Gunn was short handed. No chapling, nor so much as a Bible and the flag, you says. So he kept talking as I ran, neither expecting nor receiving any answer. The cannon shot was followed, after a considerable interval, by a volley of small arms. Another pause, and then, not a quarter of a mile in front of me, I beheld the Union Jack flutter in the air above a wood. Part 4 The Stockade. Chapter 16 Narrative continued by the Doctor. How the ship was abandoned. It was about half past one, three bells in the sea phrase, that the two boats went ashore from the Hispaniola. The captain, the squire, and I were talking matters over in the cabin. Had there been a breath of wind, we should have fallen on the six mutineers who were left aboard with us, slipped our cable, and away to sea. But the wind was wanting. And to complete our helplessness, down came Hunter with the news that Jim Hawkins had slipped into a boat and was gone ashore with the rest. It never occurred to us to doubt Jim Hawkins, but we were alarmed for his safety. With the men in the temper they were in, it seemed an even chance if we should see the lad again. We ran on deck. The pitch was bubbling in the seams. The nasty stench of the place turned me sick. If ever a man smelt fever and dysentery, it was in that abominable anchorage. The six scoundrels were sitting grumbling under a sail in the forecastle. Ashore, we could see the gigs made fast, and a man sitting in each, hard by where the river runs in. One of them was whistling Lily Bolero. Waiting was a strain, and it was decided that Hunter and I should go ashore with the jolly boat in quest of information. The gigs had leaned to their right, but Hunter and I pulled straight in, in the direction of the stockade upon the chart. The two who were left guarding their boats seemed in a bustle at our appearance. Lily Bolero stopped off, and I could see the pair discussing what they ought to do. Had they gone and told Silver, all might have turned out differently, but they had their orders, I suppose, and decided to sit quietly where they were and hark back again to Lily Bolero. There was a slight bend in the coast, and I steered so as to put it between us. Even before we landed, we had thus lost sight of the gigs. I jumped out and came as near running as I durst, with a big silk handkerchief under my hat for coolness sake, and a brace of pistols ready primed for safety. I had not gone a hundred yards when I reached the stockade. This was how it was. A spring of clear water rose almost at the top of a knoll, well, on the knoll and enclosing the spring, they had clapped a stout log house, fit to hold two score of people on a pinch, and loopholed for musketry on either side. All round this they had cleared a wide space, and then the thing was completed by a paling six feet high, without door or opening, too strong to pull down without time and labour, and too open to shelter the besiegers. The people in the log house had them in every way. They stood quiet in shelter and shot the others like partridges. All they wanted was a good watch and food, for, short of a complete surprise, they might have held the place against a regiment. What particularly took my fancy was the spring, for though we had a good enough place of it in the cabin of the Hispaniola, with plenty of arms and ammunition and things to eat and excellent wines, there had been one thing overlooked. We had no water. I was thinking this over, when there came ringing over the island the cry of a man at the point of death. 
I was not new to violent death. I've served His Royal Highness the Duke of Cumberland and got a wound myself at Fontenoy. But I know my pulse went dot and carry one. Jim Hawkins is gone, was my first thought. It is something to have been an old soldier, but more still to have been a doctor. There is no time to dilly-dally in our work. And so now I made up my mind instantly, and with no time lost, returned to the shore and jumped on board the jolly boat. By good fortune, Hunter pulled a good oar. We made the water fly, and the boat was soon alongside, and I aboard the schooner. I found them all shaken, as was natural. The squire was sitting down as white as a sheet, thinking of the harm he had led us to, the good soul. And one of the six forecastle hands was little better. There's a man, says Captain Smollett, nodding towards him, new to this work. He came nigh hand fainting, Doctor, when he heard the cry. Another touch of the rudder and that man would join us. I told my plan to the Captain, and between us we settled on the details of its accomplishment. We put old Redruth in the gallery between the cabin and the forecastle, with three or four loaded muskets and a mattress for protection. Hunter brought the boat round under the stern port, and Joyce and I set to work loading her with powder tins, muskets, bags of biscuits, kegs of pork, a cask of cognac, and my invaluable medicine chest. In the meantime, the squire and the captain stayed on deck, and the latter hailed the coxswain, who was the principal man aboard. Mr. Hands, he said, here are two of us with a brace of pistols each. If any one of you six make a signal of any description, that man's dead. They were a good deal taken aback, and after a little consultation, one and all tumbled down the fore companion, thinking no doubt to take us on the rear. But when they saw Redruth waiting for them in the sparred gallery, they went about ship at once, and a head popped out again on deck. Down, dog! cries the captain, and the head popped back again, and we heard no more for the time of these six very faint-hearted seamen. By this time, tumbling things in as they came, we had the jolly boat loaded as much as we dared. Joyce and I got out through the stern port, and we made for shore again as fast as oars could take us. This second trip fairly aroused the watchers along shore. Lily Balera was dropped again, and just before we lost sight of them behind the little point, one of them whipped ashore and disappeared. I had half a mind to change my plan and destroy their boats, but I feared that Silver and the others might be close at hand and all might very well be lost by trying for too much. We'd soon touched land in the same place as before and set to provision the blockhouse. All three made the first journey, heavily laden, and tossed our stores over the palisade. Then, leaving Joyce to guard them, one man, to be sure, but with half a dozen muskets, Hunter and I returned to the jolly boat and loaded ourselves once more. So we proceeded without pausing to take breath till the whole cargo was bestowed when the two servants took up their position in the blockhouse and I, with all my power, sculled back to the Hispaniola. That we should have risked a second boatload seems more daring than it really was. They had the advantage of numbers, of course, but we had the advantage of arms. Not one of the men ashore had a musket, and before they could get within range for pistol shooting, we flattered ourselves we should be able to give a good account of half a dozen at least. The squire was waiting for me at the stern window, all his faintness gone from him. He caught the painter and made it fast, and we fell to loading the boat for our very lives. Pork, powder and biscuit was the cargo, with only a musket and cutlass apiece for the squire and me and Red Ruth and the captain. The rest of the arms and powder we dropped overboard in two fathoms and a half of water, so that we could see the bright steel shining far below us in the sun on the clean sandy bottom. By this time, the tide was beginning to ebb, and the ship was swinging round to her anchor. Voices were heard faintly hallowing in the direction of the two gigs, and though this reassured us for Joyce and Hunter, who were well to the eastward, it warned our party to be off. Red Ruth retreated from his place in the gallery and dropped into the boat, which we then brought round to the ship's counter, to be handier for Captain Smollett. Now, men, said he, you hear me? There was no answer from the forecastle. It's to you, Abraham Gray. It's to you I'm speaking. Still no reply. Gray, 
resumed Mr. Smollett a little louder. I am leaving this ship, and I order you to follow your captain. I know you are a good man at bottom, and I dare say not one of the lot of you is as bad as he makes out. I have my watch here in my hand. I give you 30 seconds to join me in. There was a pause. Come, my fine fellow, continued the captain. Don't hang so long in stays. I'm risking my life and the lives of these good gentlemen every second. There was a sudden scuffle, the sound of blows, and out burst Abraham Gray with a knife cut on the side of the cheek and came running to the captain like a dog to the whistle. I'm with you, sir, said he. And the next moment, he and the captain had dropped aboard of us and we had shoved off and given way. We were clear out of the ship, but not yet ashore in our stockade. Chapter 17. Narrative continued by the doctor. The Jolly Boat's last trip. This fifth trip was quite different from any of the others. In the first place, the little galley pot of a boat was gravely overloaded. Five grown men, and three of them, Trelawney, Redruth, and the captain, over six feet high, was already more than she was meant to carry. Add to that the powder, pork, and bread bags. The gunnel was lipping astern. Several times we shipped a little water, and my breeches and the tails of my coat were all soaking wet before we'd gone a hundred yards. The captain made us trim the boat, and we got her to lie a little more evenly. All the same, we were afraid to breathe. In the second place, the ebb was now making, a strong rippling current running westward through the basin, and then southward and seaward down the straits by which we'd entered in the morning. Even the ripples were a danger to our overloaded craft, but the worst of it was that we were swept out of our true course and away from our proper landing place behind the point. If we let the current have its way, we should come ashore beside the gigs where the pirates might appear at any moment. I cannot keep her head for the stockade, sir, said I to the captain. I was steering while he and Redruth, two fresh men, were at the oars. The tide keeps washing her down. Could you pull a little stronger? Not without swamping the boat, said he. You must bear up, sir, if you please. Bear up until you see you're gaining. I tried and found by experiment that the tide kept sweeping us westward until I'd laid her head due east, or just about right angles to the way we ought to go. We'll never get ashore at this rate, said I. It's the only course that we can lie, sir. We must even lie it, returned the captain. We must keep upstream. You see, sir, he went on, if once we drop to leeward of the landing place, it's hard to say where we should get ashore, besides the chance of being boarded by the gigs. Whereas the way we go, the current must slacken. Then we can dodge back along the shore. The current's less already, sir said the man Grey, who was sitting in the foresheets. You can ease her off a bit. Thank you, my man, said I, quite as if nothing had happened, for we had all quietly made up our minds to treat him like one of ourselves. Suddenly the captain spoke up again, and I thought his voice was a little changed. The gun, said he. I've thought of that, said I, for I made sure he was thinking of a bombardment of the fort. They could never get the gun ashore, and if they did, they could never haul it through the woods. Look astern, Doctor, replied the captain. We had entirely forgotten the long nine. And there, to our horror, were the five rogues busy about her, getting off her jacket, as they called the stout tarpaulin cover under which she sailed. Not only that, but it flashed into my mind at the same moment that the round shot and the powder for the gun had been left behind, and a stroke with an axe would put it all into the possession of the evil ones aboard. Israel was Flint's gunner, said Grey hoarsely. At any risk, we put the boat's head direct for the landing place. By this time, we got so far out of the run of the current that we kept steerage way, even at our necessarily gentle rate of rowing, and I could keep her steady for the goal. But the worst of it was that with the course I now held, we turned our broadside instead of our stern to the Hispaniola and offered a target like a barn door. I could hear, as well as see, that brandy-faced rascal Israel Hands plumping down a round shot on the deck. Who's the best shot? asked the captain. Mr. Trelawney, out and away, said I. Mr. Trelawney, will you please pick me off one of these men, sir? Hands, if possible, said the captain. Trelawney was as cool as steel. 
he looked at the priming of his gun. Now, cried the captain, easy with that gun, sir, or you'll swamp the boat. All hands stand by to trimmer when he aims. The squire raised his gun, the rowing ceased, and we leaned over to the other side to keep the balance, and all was so nicely contrived that we did not ship a drop. They had the gun by this time slewed round upon the swivel, and Hans, who was at the muzzle with the rammer, was in consequence the most exposed. However, we had no luck, for just as Trelawney fired, down he stooped, the ball whistled over him, and it was one of the other four who fell. The cry he gave was echoed not only by his companions on board, but by a great number of voices from the shore, and looking in that direction, I saw the other pirates trooping out from among the trees and tumbling into their places in the boats. Here come the gigs, sir, said I. Give way, then, cried the captain. We mustn't mind if we swamp her now. If we can't get ashore, all's up. Only one of the gigs is being manned, sir, I added. The crew of the other most likely going round by shore to cut us off. They'll have a hot run, sir, returned the captain. Jack ashore, you know. It's not them I mind, it's the round shot. Carpet bowls. My lady's maid couldn't miss. Tell us, squire, when you see the match, and we'll hold water. In the meantime, we'd been making headway at a good pace for a boat so overloaded, and we'd shipped but little water in the process. We were now close in, thirty or forty strokes, and we should beach her, for the air had already disclosed a narrow belt of sand below the clustering trees. The gig was no longer to be feared. The little point had already concealed it from our eyes. The ebb tide, which had so cruelly delayed us, was now making reparation and delaying our assailants. The one source of danger was the gun. If I durst, said the captain, I'd stop and pick off another man. But it was plain that they meant nothing should delay their shot. They had never so much as looked at their fallen comrade, though he was not dead and I could see him trying to crawl away. Ready, cried the squire. Hold, cried the captain, quick as an echo. And he and Red Ruth backed with a great heave that sent her stern bodily under water. The report fell in at the same instant of time. This was the first that Jim heard, the sound of the squire's shot not having reached him. Where the ball passed, not one of us precisely knew, but I fancy it must have been over our heads, and that the wind of it may have contributed to our disaster. At any rate, the boat sank by the stern, quite gently in three feet of water, leaving the captain and myself facing each other on our feet. The other three took complete headers, and came up again, drenched and bubbling. So far there was no great harm. No lives were lost, and we could wade ashore in safety. But there were all our stores at the bottom. And to make things worse, only two guns out of five remained in a state for service. Mine I'd snatched from my knees and held over my head by a sort of instinct. As for the captain, he'd carried his over his shoulder by a bandolier, and, like a wise man, lock uppermost. The other three had gone down with the boat. To add to our concern, we heard voices already drawing near us in the woods along shore. And we had not only the danger of being cut off from the stockade in our half-crippled state, but the fear before us whether, if Hunter and Joyce were attacked by half a dozen, they would have the sense and conduct to stand firm. Hunter was steady, that we knew. Joyce was a doubtful case. A pleasant, polite man for a valet and to brush one's clothes, but not entirely fitted for a man of war. With all this in our minds, we waded ashore as fast as we could, leaving behind us the poor jolly boat and a good half of all our powder and provisions. Chapter 18. Narrative continued by the Doctor. End of the first day's fighting. We made our best speed across the strip of wood that now divided us from the stockade, and at every step we took, voices of the buccaneers rang nearer. Soon we could hear their footfalls as they ran, and the cracking of the branches as they breasted across a bit of thicket. I began to see we should have a brush for it in earnest, and looked to my priming. Captain, said I, Trelawney is the dead shot. Give him your gun. His own is useless. They exchanged guns, and Trelawney, silent and cool as he had been since the beginning of the bustle, hung a moment on his heel to see that all was fit for service. At the same time, observing Grey to be unarmed, I handed him my cutlass. It did all our hearts good to see him spit in his hand, knit his brows, and make the blade sing through the air. It was plain from every line of his body that our new hand was worth his salt. Forty paces farther, we came to the edge of the wood, 
and saw the stockade in front of us. We struck the enclosure about the middle of the south side, and almost at the same time, seven mutineers, Joe Banders and the bosun at their head, appeared in full cry at the southwestern corner. They paused as if taken aback, and before they recovered, not only the squire and I, but Hunter and Joyce from the blockhouse had time to fire. The four shots came in rather a scattering volley, but they did the business. One of the enemy actually fell, and the rest, without hesitation, turned and plunged into the trees. After reloading, we walked down the outside of the palisade to see the fallen enemy. He was stone dead, shot through the heart. We began to rejoice over our good success when, just at that moment, a pistol cracked in the bush, a ball whistled close past my ear, and poor Tom Redruth stumbled and fell his length on the ground. Both the squire and I returned the shot, but as we had nothing to aim at, it is probable we only wasted powder. Then we reloaded and turned our attention to poor Tom. The captain and Gray were already examining him, and I saw with half an eye that all was over. I believe the readiness of our return volley had scattered the mutineers once more, for we were suffered without further molestation to get the poor old gamekeeper hoisted over the stockade and carried groaning and bleeding into the log house. Poor old fellow, he had not uttered one word of surprise, complaint, fear, or even acquiescence from the very beginning of our troubles till now, when we'd laid him down in the log house to die. He had lain like a Trojan behind his mattress in the gallery. He had followed every order silently, doggedly, and well. He was the oldest of our party by a score of years. And now, sullen, old, serviceable servant, it was he that was to die. The squire dropped down beside him on his knees and kissed his hand, crying like a child. Be I going, doctor? he asked. Tom, my man, said I, you're going home. I wish I'd had a lick at them with the gun first, he replied. Tom, said the squire, say you forgive me, won't you? Would that be respectful like from me to you, squire, was the answer. Howsoever, so be it. Amen. After a little while of silence, he said he thought somebody might read a prayer. It's the custom, sir, he added apologetically. And not long after, without another word, he passed away. In the meantime, the captain, whom I had observed to be wonderfully swollen about the chest and pockets, had turned out a great many various stores. The British colours, a Bible, a coil of stoutish rope, pen, ink, the log book, and pounds of tobacco. He had found a longish fir tree lying felled and trimmed in the enclosure, and with the help of Hunter, he had set it up at the corner of the log house, where the trunks crossed and made an angle. Then, climbing on the roof, he had with his own hand bent and run up the colours. This seemed mightily to relieve him. He re-entered the log house and set about counting up the stores as if nothing else existed. But he had an eye on Tom's passage for all that, and as soon as all was over, came forward with another flag and reverently spread it on the body. Don't you take on, sir, he said, shaking the squire's hand. All's well with him. No fear for a hand that's been shot down in his duty to Captain Ramona. It mayn't be good divinity, but it's a fact. Then he pulled me aside. Dr. Livesey, he said, in how many weeks do you and squire expect the consort? I told him it was a question not of weeks, but of months, that if we were not back by the end of August, Brandley was to send to find us, but neither sooner nor later. You can calculate for yourself, I said. Why, yes, returned the captain, scratching his head, and making a large allowance, sir, for all the gifts of Providence. I should say we were pretty close hauled. How do you mean, I asked. It's a pity, sir, we lost that second load. That's what I mean, replied the captain. As for powder and shot, we'll do. But the rations are short, very short. So short, Dr. Livesey, that we're perhaps as well without that extra mouth. And he pointed to the dead body under the flag. Just then, with a roar and a whistle, a round shot passed high above the roof of the log house and plumped far beyond us into the wood. 
Ho, oh, oh, ho, said the captain. Blaze away. You little enough powder already, my lads. At the second trial, the aim was better, and the ball descended inside the stockade, scattering a cloud of sand, but doing no further damage. Captain, said the squire, the house is quite invisible from the ship. It must be the flag that they're aiming at. Would it not be wiser to take it in? Strike my colours, cried the captain. No, sir, not I. And as soon as he'd said the words, I think we all agreed with him. For it was not only a piece of stout, seemingly good feeling, it was good policy besides, and showed our enemies that we despised their cannonade. All through the evening, they kept thundering away. Ball after ball flew over, or fell short, or kicked up the sand in the enclosure. But they had to fire so high that the shot fell dead and buried itself in the soft sand. We had no ricochet to fear, and though one popped in through the roof of the log house and out again through the floor, we soon got used to that sort of horseplay and minded it no more than cricket. There is one good thing about all this, observed the captain. The wood in front of us is likely clear. The ebb has made a good while. Our stores should be uncovered. Volunteers to go and bring in pork. Gray and Hunter were the first to come forward. Well armed, they stole out of the stockade, but it proved a useless mission. The mutineers were bolder than we fancied, or they put more trust in Israel's gunnery. For four or five of them were busy carrying off our stores and wading out with them to one of the gigs that lay close by, pulling an oar or so to hold her steady against the current. Silver was in the stern sheets in command, and every man of them was now provided with a musket from some secret magazine their own. The captain sat down to his log, and here is the beginning of the entry. Alexander Smollett, master. David Livesey, ship's doctor. Abraham Gray, carpenter's mate. John Trelawney, owner. John Hunter and Richard Joyce, owner's servants, landsmen. Being all that is left faithful of the ship's company, with stores for ten days at short rations. Came ashore this day, and flew British colours on the log house in Treasure Island. Thomas Redruth, owner's servant, landsman, shot by the mutineers. James Hawkins, cabin boy. And at the same time, I was wondering over poor Jim Hawkins' fate. A hail on the land side. Somebody hailing us, said Hunter, who was on guard. Doctor? Squire? Captain? Hello, Hunter, is that you? came the cries. And I ran to the door in time to see Jim Hawkins, safe and sound, come climbing over the stockade. Chapter 19. Narrative resumed by Jim Hawkins. The garrison in the stockade. As soon as Ben Gunn saw the colours, he came to a halt, stopped me by the arm, and sat down. No, said he. There's your friends. Sure enough. Far more likely it's the mutineers, I answered. That? He cried. Ah, in a place like this, where nobody puts in but gentlemen of fortune. Silver would fly the Jolly Roger. You don't make no doubt of that. No, that's your friends. There's been blows, too. And I reckon your friends has had the best of it. And here they are ashore, in the old stockade, as was made years and years ago by Flint. Uh, he was the man to have a headpiece, was Flint. Bar and rum, his match were never seen. He were afraid of none, not he. Only silver. Silver was that genteel. Well, said I, that may be so, and so be it. All the more reason why I should hurry on and join my friends. Nay, mate, returned Ben. Not you. You're a good boy, or I'm a stuck, but you're only a boy, all told. Now, Ben Gunn is fly. Rum wouldn't bring me there where you're going. <laughs> Not rum wouldn't, till I see your born gentleman, and gets it on his word of honour. And you won't forget my words. A precious sight, that's what you'll say. A precious sight, more confidence. And then nips him. And he pinched me the third time with the same air of cleverness. And when Ben Gunn is wanted, you know where to find him, Jim. Just where you find him today. 
And then as comes is to have a white thing in his hand and he's to come alone. Oh, and you'll say this. Ben Gunn, says you, has reasons of his own. Well, said I, I believe I understand. You have something to propose and you wish to see the squire or the doctor and you're to be found where I found you. Is that all? And when, says you, he added, why from about noon observation to about six bells? Good, said I. And now may I go? You won't forget, he inquired anxiously. Precious sight and reasons of his own, says you. Reasons of his own, that's the mainstay. That's between man and man. Well then, still holding me, I reckon you can go, Jim. And, Jim, if you was to see silver, you wouldn't go for to sell Ben Gunn. Wild horses wouldn't draw it from you? No, says you. And if them pirates come for sure, Jim, what would you say but there'd be widders in the morning? Here he was interrupted by a loud report, and a cannonball came tearing through the trees and pitched in the sand not a hundred yards from where we two were talking. The next moment, each of us had taken to his heels in a different direction. For a good hour to come, frequent reports shook the island, and balls kept crashing through the woods. I moved from hiding place to hiding place, always pursued, or so it seemed to me, by these terrifying missiles. But towards the end of the bombardment, though still I durst not venture in the direction of the stockade where the balls fell oftenest, I had begun in a manner to pluck up my heart again, and after a long detour to the east, crept down among the shoreside trees. The sun had just set, the sea breeze was rustling and tumbling in the woods and ruffling the grey surface of the anchorage. The tide too was far out, and great tracts of sand lay uncovered. The air after the heat of the day, chilled me through my jacket. The Hispaniola still lay where she'd anchored, but sure enough, there was the Jolly Roger, the black flag of piracy flying from her peak. Even as I looked, there came another red flash and another report that sent the echoes clattering, and one more round shot whistled through the air. It was the last of the cannonade. I lay for some time watching the bustle which succeeded the attack. Men were demolishing something with axes on the beach near the stockade. The poor jolly boat, I afterwards discovered. Away near the mouth of the river, a great fire was glowing among the trees. And between that point and the ship, one of the gigs kept coming and going. The men, whom I'd seen so gloomy, shouting at the oars like children. But there was a sound in their voices which suggested rum. At length I thought I might return towards the stockade. I was pretty far down on the low, sandy spit that encloses the anchorage to the east and is joined at half water to Skeleton Island. And now, as I rose to my feet, I saw some distance further down the spit and rising from among low bushes, an isolated rock, pretty high and peculiarly white in colour. It occurred to me that this might be the white rock of which Ben Gunn had spoken and that some day or other a boat might be wanted I should know where to look for one. Then I skirted among the woods until I had regained the rear or shoreward side of the stockade and was soon warmly welcomed by the faithful party. I had soon told my story and began to look about me. The log house was made of unsquared trunks of pine, roof, walls and floor. The latter stood in several places as much as a foot or a foot and a half above the surface of the sand. There was a porch at the door, and under this porch, the little spring welled up into an artificial basin of a rather odd kind, no other than the great ship's kettle of iron with the bottom knocked out and sunk to her bearings, as the captain said, among the sand. Little had been left besides the framework of the house, but in one corner there was a stone slab laid down by way of hearth and an old rusty iron basket to contain the fire. The slopes of the knoll and all the inside of the stockade had been cleared of timber to build the house, and we could see by the stumps what a fine and lofty grove had been destroyed. Most of the soil had been washed away or buried in drift after the removal of the trees, 
only where the streamlet ran down from the kettle, a thick bed of moss and some ferns and little creeping bushes were still green among the sand. Very close around the stockade, too close for defence, they said, the wood still flourished high and dense, all of fir on the land side, but towards the sea with a large admixture of live oaks. The cold evening breeze of which I have spoken whistled through every chink of the road building and sprinkled the floor with a continual rain of fine sand. There was sand in our eyes, sand in our teeth, sand in our suppers, sand dancing in the spring at the bottom of the kettle, for all the world like porridge beginning to boil. Our chimney was a square hole in the roof. It was but a little part of the smoke that found its way out, and the rest eddied about the house and kept us coughing and piping the eye. Add to this that Gray, the new man, had his face tied up in a bandage for a cut he had got in breaking away from the mutineers, and that poor old Tom Redruth, still unburied, lay along the wall, stiff and stark under the Union Jack. If we'd been allowed to sit idle, we should all have fallen in the blues, but Captain Smollett was never the man for that. All hands were called up before him, and he divided us into watches. The Doctor and Gray and I for one, the Squire, Hunter and Joyce upon the other. Tired though we all were, two were sent out for firewood. Two more were set to dig a grave for Redruth. The Doctor was named Cook. I was put sentry at the door and the captain himself went from one to another, keeping up our spirits and lending a hand wherever it was wanted. From time to time, the doctor came to the door for a little air and to rest his eyes, which were almost smoked out of his head, and whenever he did so, he had a word for me. That man Smollett, he said at once, is a better man than I am, and when I say that, it means a deal, Jim. Another time he came and was silent for a while, then he put his head on one side and looked at me. Is this Ben Gunn a man? he asked. I do not know, sir, said I. I am not very sure whether he's sane. If there is any doubt about the matter, he is, returned the doctor. A man who has been three years biting his nails on a desert island, Jim, can't expect to appear as sane as you or me. It doesn't lie in human nature. Was it? Cheese, you said he had a fancy for? Yes, sir, cheese, I answered. Well, Jim, says he, just see the good that comes of being dainty in your food. You've seen my snuff box, haven't you? And you never saw me take snuff. The reason being that in my snuff box I carry a piece of parmesan cheese, a cheese made in Italy, very nutritious. Well, that's for Ben Gunn. Before supper was eaten, we buried old Tom in the sand and stood round him for a while, bareheaded in the breeze. A good deal of firewood had been got in, but not enough for the captain's fancy, and he shook his head over it and told us we must get back to this tomorrow rather livelier. Then, when we'd eaten our pork and each had a good stiff glass of brandy grog, the three chiefs got together in a corner to discuss our prospects. It appears they were at their wits end what to do, stores being so low that we must have been starved into surrender long before help came. But our best hope, it was decided, was to kill off the buccaneers until they either hauled down their flag or ran away with the Hispaniola. From 19, they were already reduced to 15. Two others were wounded, and one at least, the man shot beside the gun, severely wounded if he were not dead. Every time we had a crack at them, we were to take it, saving our own lives, with the extremest care. And besides that, we had two able allies, rum and the climate. As for the first, though we were about half a mile away, we could hear them roaring and singing late into the night. And as for the second, the doctor staked his wig that camped where they were in the marsh and unprovided with remedies, the half of them would be on their backs for a week. So, he added, if we are not all shot down first, they'll be glad to be packing in the schooner. It's always a ship, and they can get to buccaneering again, I suppose. First ship that I ever lost, said Captain Smollett. 
I was dead tired, as you may fancy. And when I got to sleep, which was not till after a great deal of tossing, I slept like a log of wood. The rest had long been up and had already breakfasted and increased the pile of firewood by about half as much again, when I was wakened by a bustle and the sound of voices. Flag of truce, I heard someone say. And then, immediately after, with a cry of surprise, Silver himself! And at that, up I jumped and, rubbing my eyes, ran to a loophole in the wall. Chapter 20. Silver's Embassy. Sure enough, there were two men just outside the stockade, one of them waving a white cloth, the other, no less a person than Silver himself, standing placidly by. It was still quite early, and the coldest morning that I think I ever was abroad in, a chill that pierced into the marrow. The sky was bright and cloudless overhead, and the tops of the trees shone rosily in the sun. But where Silver stood with his lieutenant, all was in shadow, and they waded knee-deep in a low white vapour that had crawled during the night out of the morass. The chill and the vapour, taken together, told a poor tale of the island. It was, plainly, a damp, feverish, unhealthy spot. Keep indoors, men, said the captain. Ten to one, this is a trick. Then he hailed the buccaneer. Who goes? Stand or we fire? Flag of truce, cried Silver. The captain was in the porch, keeping himself carefully out of the way of a treacherous shot, should any be intended. He turned and spoke to us. Doctors watch on the lookout. Dr. Livesey, take the north side, if you please. Jim, the east. Gray, west. Watch below, all hands to load muskets. Lively men and careful. And then he turned again to the mutineers. And what do you want with your flag of truce? he cried. This time it was the other man who replied. Captain Silver, sir, to come on board and make terms, he shouted. Captain Silver? Don't know him. Who's he? cried the captain. And we could hear him adding to himself, Captain, is it? My heart and his promotion. Long John answered for himself. Me, sir. These poor lads have chosen me, Captain. After your desertion, sir, laying a particular emphasis on the word desertion, we're willing to submit if we can come to terms, and no bones about it. All I ask is your word, Captain Smollett, to let me safe and sound out of this here stockade, and one minute to get out a shot before a gun is fired. My man, said Captain Smollett, I have not the slightest desire to talk to you. If you wish to talk to me, you can come, that's all. If there's any treachery, it'll be on your side, and the Lord help you. That's enough, Captain, shouted Long John cheerily. A word from you is enough. I know a gentleman, and you may lay to that. We could see the man who carried the flag of truce attempting to hold Silver back. Nor was that wonderful, seeing how cavalier had been the Captain's answer. But Silver laughed at him aloud and slapped him on the back as if the idea of alarm had been absurd. Then he advanced to the stockade, threw over his crutch, got a leg up, and with great vigour and skill, succeeded in surmounting the fence and dropping safely to the other side. I will confess that I was far too much taken up with what was going on to be of the slightest use as sentry. Indeed, I had already deserted my eastern loophole and crept up behind the captain who had now seated himself on the threshold with his elbows on his knees, his head in his hands, and his eyes fixed on the water as it bubbled out of the old iron kettle in the sand. He was whistling, come lasses and lads. Silver had terrible hard work getting up the knoll. What with the steepness of the incline, the thick tree stumps and the soft sand, he and his crutch were as helpless as a ship in stays. But he stuck to it like a man in silence, and at last arrived before the captain, whom he saluted in the handsomest style. He was tricked out in his best. An immense blue coat, thick with brass buttons, hung as low as to his knees, and a fine laced hat was set on the back of his head. Here you are, my man, said the captain, raising his head. You'd better sit down. You ain't a going to let me inside, captain, complained Long John. 
It's a main coat warning, to be sure, sir, to sit outside upon the sand. Why, Silver, said the captain, if you'd pleased to be an honest man, you might have been sitting in your galley. It's your own doing. You're either my ship's cook, and then you were treated handsome, or Captain Silver, a common mutineer and pirate, and then you can go hang. Well, well, Captain, returned the sea cook, sitting down as he was bitten on the sand. You'll have to give me a hand up again, that's all. A sweet, pretty place you have of it here. Ah, there's Jim. The top of the morning to you, Jim. Doctor is my service. Why, there you all are together like a happy family, in a manner of speaking. If you have anything to say, my man, better say it, said the captain. Right you were, Captain Smollett, replied Silver. Duty is duty, to be sure. Well, now, you look here. That was a good lay of yours last night. I don't deny it was a good lay. Some of you pretty handy with a handspike end. And I'll not deny neither, but what some of my people were shook. Maybe all was shook. Maybe I was shook myself. Maybe that's why I'm here for terms. But you mark me, Captain. It won't do twice, by thunder. We'll have to do sentry go and ease off a point or so on the rum. Maybe you think we were all a sheet in the wind's eye, but I'll tell you I was sober. I was only dog tired, and if I'd awoke a second sooner, I'd have caught you at the act, I would. He wasn't dead when I got round to him, not he. Well, says Captain Smollett, as cool as can be. All that Silver said was a riddle to him, but you would never have guessed it from his tone. As for me, I began to have an inkling. Ben Gunn's last words came back to my mind. I began to suppose that he had paid the buccaneers a visit while they all lay drunk together round their fire, and I reckoned up with glee that we had only fourteen enemies to deal with. Well, here it is, said Silver. We want that treasure, and we'll have it. That's our point. You would just as soon save your lives, I reckon, and that's yours. You have a chart, haven't you? That's as maybe, replied the captain. Oh, well, you have, I know that, returned Long John. You needn't be so husky with a man. There ain't a particle of service in that, and you may lay to it. What I mean is, we want your chart. Now, I never meant you no harm myself. That won't do with me, my man interrupted the captain. We know exactly what you meant to do, and we don't care. For now, you see, you can't do it. And the captain looked at him calmly and proceeded to fill a pipe. If Abe Gray, Silver broke out. Avast there, cried Mr. Smollett. Gray told me nothing and I asked him nothing. And what's more, I would see you and him and this whole island blown clean out of the water into blazes first. So there's my mind for you, my man, on that. This little whiff of temper seemed to cool Silver down. He'd been growing nettled before, but now he pulled himself together. Like enough, said he. I would set no limits to what gentlemen might consider ship shape, or might not, as the case were. And seeing as how you're about to take a pipe, Captain, I'll make so free as to do likewise. And he filled the pipe and lighted it. And the two men sat silently smoking for quite a while. Now looking each other in the face, now stopping their tobacco, now leaning forward to spit. It was as good as the play to see them. Now, resumed Silver, here it is. You give us the chart to get the treasure by, and drop shooting poor seamen and stoving of their heads in while asleep. You do that, and we'll offer you a choice. Either you come aboard, along of us, once the treasure shipped, and then I give you my affidavit upon my word of honor to clap you somewhere safe ashore. Or, if that ain't your fancy, some of my hands being rough and having old scores on account of hazing, then you can stay here, you can. We'll divide stores with you, man for man, and I'll give my affidavit as before to speak the first ship I sight and send them here to pick you up. Now, you know. That's talking. Handsomer you couldn't look to get, not you. 
And I hope, raising his voice, that all hands in this here blockhouse will overhaul my words. What is spoke to one is spoke to all. Captain Smollett rose from his seat and knocked out the ashes of his pipe in the palm of his left hand. Is that all? he asked. Every last word by thunder, answered John. Refuse that, and you've seen the last of me but musket balls. Very good, said the captain. Now you'll hear me. If you'll come up one by one unarmed, I'll engage to clap you all in irons and take you home to a fair trial in England. If you won't, my name is Alexander Smollett, I've flown my sovereign's colours, and I'll see you all to David Jones. You can't find the treasure, you can't sail the ship, there's not a man among you fit to sail the ship. You can't fight us. Grey there got away from five of you. Your ship's in irons, Master Silver. You're on a lee shore, and so you'll find. I stand here and tell you so. And they're the last good words you'll get from me, for in the name of heaven, I'll put a bullet in your back when I next meet you. Tramp, my lad, bundle out of this, please. Hand over hand and double quick. Silver's face was a picture. His eyes started in his head with wrath. He shook the fire out of his pipe. Give me a hand up, he cried. Not I, returned the captain. All give me a hand up, he roared. Not a man among us moved. Growling the foulest imprecations, he crawled along the sand till he got hold of the porch and could hoist himself again upon his crutch. Then he spat into the spring. There, he cried. That's what I think of you. Before an hour is out, I'll stove in your old blockhouse like a rum puncheon. Laugh, by thunder, laugh. Before an hour is out, you'll laugh upon the other side. Them that die will be the lucky ones. And with a dreadful oath, he stumbled off, ploughed down the sand, and was helped across the stockade after four or five failures by the man with the flag of truce, and disappeared in an instant afterwards among the trees. Chapter 21 the attack. As soon as Silver disappeared, the captain, who had been closely watching him, turned towards the interior of the house and found not a man of us at his post but Gray. It was the first time we had ever seen him angry. Quarters, he roared. And then, as we all slunk back to our places, Gray, he said, I'll put your name in the log. You stood by your duty like a seaman. Mr. Trelawney, I'm surprised at you, sir. Doctor, I thought you'd worn the king's coat. If that was how you served at Fontenoy, sir, you'd have been better in your berth. The doctor's watch were all back at their loopholes. The rest were busy loading the spare muskets, and everyone with a red face, you may be certain, and a flea in his ear, as the saying is. The captain looked on for a while in silence. Then he spoke. My lads, said he, I've given Silver a broadside. I pitched it in red hot on purpose. And before the hour's out, as he said, we shall be boarded. We're outnumbered, I needn't tell you that. But we fight in shelter, and a minute ago I should have said we fought with discipline. I've no manner of doubt that we can drop them if you choose. And he went the rounds and saw, as he said, that all was clear. On the two short sides of the house, east and west, there were only two loopholes. On the south side, where the porch was, two again. And on the north side, five. There was a round score of muskets for the seven of us. The firewood had been built into four piles, tables you might say, one about the middle of each side, and on each of these tables some ammunition and four loaded muskets were laid ready to the hand of the defenders. In the middle, the cutlasses lay ranged. Toss out the fire, said the captain. The chill is past and we mustn't have smoke in our eyes. The iron fire basket was carried bodily out by Mr. Trelawney and the embers smothered them in sand. Hawkins hasn't had his breakfast. Hawkins, help yourself and back to your post to eat it, continued Captain Smollett. Lively now, my lad. You'll want it before you're done. Hunter, serve out a round of brandy to all hands. And while this was going on, the captain completed in his own mind the plan of the defence. Doctor, you will take the door, he resumed. See, and don't expose yourself. Keep within and fire through the porch. Hunter, take the east side, there. Joyce, you stand by the west, my man. Mr. Trelawney, you're the best shot. You and Gray will take this long north side with the five loopholes. It's there the danger is. If they can get up to it and fire in upon us through our own ports, things will begin to look dirty. 
Hawkins, neither you or I are much account of the shooting. We'll stand by to load and bear a hand. As the captain had said, the chill was past. As soon as the sun had climbed above our girdle of trees, it fell with all its force upon the clearing and drank up the vapours at a draught. Soon the sand was baking and the resin melting in the logs of the blockhouse. Jackets and coats were flung aside, shirts thrown open at the neck and rolled up to the shoulders, and we stood there, each at his post, in a fever of heat and anxiety. An hour passed away. Hang them, said the captain. This is a dull of the doldrums. Grey, whistle for a win. And just at that moment came the first news of the attack. If you please, sir, said Joyce, if I see anyone, am I to fire? I told you so, cried the captain. Thank you, sir, returned Joyce with the same quiet civility. Nothing followed for a time, but the remark had set us all on the alert, straining ears and eyes. Musketeers with their pieces balanced in their hands, the captain out in the middle of the blockhouse with his mouth very tight and a frown on his face. So some seconds passed, till suddenly Joyce whipped up his musket and fired. The report had scarcely died away ere it was repeated and repeated from without in a scattering volley, shot behind shot like a string of geese from every side of the enclosure. Several bullets struck the log house, but not one entered, and as the smoke cleared away and vanished, the stockade and the woods around it looked as quiet and empty as before. Not a bough waved, not the gleam of a musket barrel betrayed the presence of our foes. Did you hit your man? asked the captain. No, sir, replied Joyce. I believe not, sir. Next best thing to tell the truth, muttered Captain Swallow. Load his gun, Hawkins. How many should you say there were on your side, Doctor? I know precisely, said Dr. Livesey. Three shots were fired on this side. I saw the three flashes, two close together, one farther to the west. Three, repeated the captain. And how many on yours, Mr. Trelawney? But this was not so easily answered. There had come many from the north. Seven by the squire's computation, eight or nine according to Gray. From the east and west, only a single shot had been fired. It was plain, therefore, that the attack would be developed from the north, and that on the other three sides we were only to be annoyed by a show of hostilities. But Captain Smollett made no change in his arrangements. If the mutineers succeeded in crossing the stockade, he argued, they would take possession of any unprotected loophole and shoot us down like rats in our own stronghold. Nor had we much time left to us for thought. Suddenly, with a loud huzzah, a little cloud of pirates leapt from the woods on the north side and ran straight on the stockade. At the same moment, the fire was once more open from the woods, and a rifle ball sang through the doorway and knocked the doctor's musket into bits. The boarders swarmed over the fence like monkeys. Squire and Gray fired again and yet again. Three men fell, one forwards into the enclosure, two back on the outside. But of these, one was evidently more frightened than hurt, for he was on his feet again in a crack and instantly disappeared among the trees. Two had bit the dust, one had fled. Four had made good their footing inside our defences, while from the shelter of the woods, seven or eight men, each evidently supplied with several muskets, kept up a hot though useless fire on the log house. The four who had boarded made straight before them for the building, shouting as they ran, and the men among the trees shouted back to encourage them. Several shots were fired, but such was the hurry of the marksmen that not one appeared to have taken effect. In a moment, the four pirates had swarmed up the mound and were upon us. The head of Job Anderson, the boatswain, appeared at the middle loophole. At him, all hands, all hands, he roared in a voice of thunder. At the same moment, another pirate grasped Hunter's musket by the muzzle, wrenched it from his hands, plucked it through the loophole, and with one stunning blow laid the poor fellow senseless on the floor. Meanwhile, a third, running unharmed all round the house, appeared suddenly in the doorway and fell with his cutlass on the doctor. Our position was utterly reversed. A moment since, we were firing under cover at an exposed enemy. Now it was we who lay uncovered and could not return a blow. The log house was full of smoke, to which we owed our comparative safety. Cries and confusion, the flashes and reports of pistol shots, and one loud groan rang in my ears. Out, lads, out, and fight them in the open. Cutlasses, cried the captain. I snatched a cutlass from the pile, and someone at the same time snatching another gave me a cut across the knuckles, which I hardly felt. I dashed out of the door into the clear sunlight. 
Someone was close behind, I knew not whom. Right in front, the doctor was pursuing his assailant down the hill, and just as my eyes fell on him, beat down his guard and sent him sprawling on his back with a great slash across the face. Round the house, lads, round the house, cried the captain, and even in the hurly-burly I perceived a change in his voice. Mechanically, I obeyed, turned eastwards, and with my cutlass raised, ran round the corner of the house. Next moment, I was face to face with Anderson. He roared aloud, and his hanger went up above his head, flashing in the sunlight. I had not time to be afraid, but as the blow still hung impending, leapt in a trice upon one side, and missing my foot in the soft sand, rolled headlong down the slope. When I first sallied from the door, the other mutineers had been already swarming up the palisade to make an end of us. One man in a red nightcap, with his cutlass in his mouth, had even got up on the top and thrown a leg across. Well, so short had been the interval that when I found my feet again, all was in the same posture, the fellow with the red nightcap still halfway over, another still showing his head above the top of the stockade. And yet, in this breath of time, the fight was over, and the victory was ours. Gray, following close behind me, had cut down the big boatswain ere he had time to recover from his last blow. Another had been shot at a loophole in the very act of firing into the house, and now lay in agony, the pistol still smoking in his hand. A third, as I'd seen, the doctor had disposed of at a blow. Of the four who had scaled the palisade, one only remained unaccounted for, and he, having left his cutlass on the field, was now clambering out again with the fear of death upon him. Fire! Fire from the house! cried the doctor, and you, lads, back into cover! But his words were unheeded, no shot was fired, and the last boarder made good his escape and disappeared with the rest into the wood. In three seconds, nothing remained of the attacking party but the five who had fallen. Four on the inside and one on the outside of the palisade. The doctor and Gray and I ran full speed for shelter. The survivors would soon be back where they left their muskets, and at any moment the fire might recommence. The house was by this time somewhat cleared of smoke, and we saw at a glance the price we had paid for victory. Hunter lay beside his loophole, stunned. Joyce, by his, shot through the head, never to move again. While right in the centre, the squire was supporting the captain, one as pale as the other. The captain's wounded, said Mr. Trelawney. Have they run? asked Mr. Smollett. All that could you may be bound, returned the doctor, but there's five of them will never run again. Five, cried the captain. Come, that's better. Five against three leaves us four to nine. That's better odds than we had at starting. We were seven to nineteen then, or thought we were, and that's as bad to bear. The mutineers were soon only eight in number, for the man shot by Mr. Trelawney on board the schooner died that same evening of his wound. But this was, of course, not known to laughter by the faithful party. Part 5, My Sea Adventure Chapter 22, How My Sea Adventure Began There was no return of the mutineers, not so much as another shot out of the woods. They had got their rations for that day, as the captain put it, and we had the place to ourselves and the quiet time to overhaul the wounded and get dinner. Squire and I cooked outside, in spite of the danger, and even outside we could hardly tell what we were at, for the horror of the loud groans that reached us from the doctor's patients. Out of the eight men who had fallen in the action, only three still breathed. That one of the pirates who had been shot at the loophole, Hunter and Captain Smollett. And of these, the first two were as good as dead. The mutineer indeed died under the doctor's knife, and Hunter do what we could never regained consciousness in this world. He lingered all day, breathing loudly like the old buccaneer at home in his apoplectic fit. But the bones of his chest had been crushed by the blow, and his skull fractured in falling, and some time in the following night, without sign or sound, he went to his maker. As for the captain, his wounds were grievous indeed, but not dangerous. No organ was fatally injured. Anderson's ball, for it was Job that shot him first, had broken his shoulder blade and touched the lung, not badly. The second had only torn and displaced some muscles in the calf. He was sure to recover, the doctor said, 
But in the meantime, and for weeks to come, he must not walk, nor move his arm, nor so much as speak when he could help it. My own accidental cut across the knuckles was a flea bite. Dr. Livesey patched it up with plaster and pulled my ears for me into the bargain. After dinner, the squire and the doctor sat by the captain's side a while in consultation. And when they'd talked to their heart's content, it being then a little past noon, the doctor took up his hat and pistols, girt on a cutlass, put the chart in his pocket, and with a musket over his shoulder, crossed the palisade on the north side and set off briskly through the trees. Gray and I were sitting together at the far end of the blockhouse to be out of earshot of our officers consulting, and Gray took the pipe out of his mouth and fairly forgot to put it back again. So thunderstruck he was at this occurrence. Why in the name of Davy Jones, said he, is Dr. Livesey mad? Why, no, says I, he's about the last of this crew for that, I take it. Well, shipmate, said Gray, mad he may not be, but if he's not, you mark my words, I am. I take it, replied I, the doctor has his idea, and if I'm right, he's going now to see Ben Gunn. I was right, as appeared later, but in the meantime, the house being stifling hot and the little patch of sand inside the palisade ablaze with midday sun, I began to get another thought into my head, which was not by any means so right. What I began to do was to envy the doctor walking in the cool shadow of the woods with the birds about him and the pleasant smell of the pines, while I sat grilling with my clothes stuck to the hot resin and so much blood about me and so many poor dead bodies lying all around that I took a disgust of the place that was almost as strong as fear. All the time I was washing out the blockhouse and then washing up the things from dinner, this disgust and envy kept growing stronger and stronger till at last, being near a bread bag and no one then observing me, I took the first step towards my escapade and filled both pockets of my coat with biscuit. I was a fool, if you like, and certainly I was going to do a foolish, overbold act, but I was determined to do it with all the precautions in my power. These biscuits, should anything befall me, would keep me at least from starving till far on in the next day. The next thing I laid hold of was a brace of pistols, and as I already had a powder horn and bullets, I felt myself well supplied with arms. As for the scheme I had in my head, there was not a bad one in itself. I was to go down the sandy spit that divides the anchorage on the east from the open sea, find the white rock, observed last evening, and ascertain whether it was there or not that Ben Gunn had hidden his boat. A thing quite worth doing, as I still believe. But as I was certain I should not be allowed to leave the enclosure, my only plan was to take French leave and slip out when nobody was watching, and that was so bad a way of doing it as made the thing itself wrong. But I was only a boy, and I'd made my mind up. Well, as things at last fell out, I found an admirable opportunity. The squire and Gray were busy helping the captain with his bandages. The coast was clear. I made a bolt for it over the stockade and into the thickest of the trees. And before my absence was observed, I was out of cry of my companions. This was my second folly, far worse than the first, as I left but two sound men to guard the house. But, like the first... It was a help towards saving all of us. I took my way straight for the east coast of the island, for I was determined to go down the seaside of the spit to avoid all chance of observation from the anchorage. It was already late in the afternoon, although still warm and sunny. As I continued to thread the tall woods, I could hear from far before me not only the continuous thunder of the surf, but a certain tossing of foliage and grinding of boughs, which showed me the sea breeze had set in higher than usual. Soon cool draughts of air began to reach me, and a few steps farther I came forth into the open borders of the grove, and saw the sea lying blue and sunny to the horizon, and the surf tumbling and tossing its foam along the beach. I have never seen the sea quiet round Treasure Island, the sun might blaze overhead, the air be without a breath, the surface smooth and blue, 
but still these great rollers would be running along all the external coast, thundering and thundering by day and night. And I scarce believe there is one spot in the island where a man would be out of earshot of their noise. I walked along beside the surf with great enjoyment, till, thinking I was now got far enough to the south, I took the cover of some thick bushes and crept warily up to the ridge of the spit. Behind me was the sea, in front the anchorage. The sea breeze, as though it had the sooner blown itself out by its unusual violence, was already at an end. It had been succeeded by light, variable airs from the south and southeast, carrying great banks of fog. And the anchorage, under lee of Skeleton Island, lay still and leaden, as when first we entered it. The Hispaniola, in that unbroken mirror, was exactly portrayed from the truck to the waterline, the Jolly Roger hanging from her peak. Alongside lay one of the gigs. Silver, in the stern sheets, him I could always recognize, while a couple of men were leaning over the stern bulwarks, one of them with a red cap, the very rogue I had seen some hours before, stride legs upon the palisade. Apparently they were talking and laughing, that distance, upwards of a mile, I could, of course, hear no word of what was said. All at once, there began the most horrid, unearthly screaming, which at first startled me badly, though I had soon remembered the voice of Captain Flint, and even thought I could make out the bird by her bright plumage as she sat perched upon her master's wrist. Soon after, the jolly boat shoved off and pulled for shore, and the man with the red cap and his comrade went below by the cabin companion. Just about the same time, the sun had gone down behind the spyglass, and as the fog was collecting rapidly, it began to grow dark in earnest. I saw I must lose no time if I were to find the boat that evening. The white rock, visible enough above the brush, was still some eighth of a mile further down the spit, and it took me a goodish while to get up with it crawling, often on all fours, among the scrub. Night had almost come when I laid my hand on its rough sides. Right below it, there was an exceedingly small hollow of green turf, hidden by banks and a thick underwood about knee-deep that grew there very plentifully. And in the centre of the dell, sure enough, a little tent of goatskins, like what the gypsies carry about with them in England. I dropped into the hollow, lifted the side of the tent, and there was Ben Gunn's boat. Homemade, if ever anything was homemade. A rude, lopsided framework of tough wood, and stretched upon that a covering of goatskin, with the hair inside. The thing was extremely small, even for me, and I can hardly imagine that it could have floated with a full-sized man. There was one thwart, set as low as possible, a kind of stretcher in the bows, and a double paddle for propulsion. I had not then seen a coracle, such as the ancient Britons made, but I have seen one since, and I can give you no fairer idea of Ben Gunn's boat than by saying it was like the first and worst coracle ever made by man. But the great advantage of the coracle it certainly possessed, for it was exceedingly light and portable. Well, now that I'd found the boat, you would have thought that I'd had enough of truantry for once. But in the meantime, I had taken another notion and become so obstinately fond of it that I would have carried it out, I believe, in the teeth of Captain Smollett himself. This was to slip out under cover of the night, cut the Hispaniola adrift, and let her go ashore where she fancied. I had quite made up my mind that the mutineers, after their repulse of the morning, had nothing nearer their hearts than to up anchor and away to sea. This, I thought, would be a fine thing to prevent. And now that I'd seen how they left their watchman unprovided with a boat, I thought it might be done with little risk. Down I sat to wait for darkness, and made a hearty meal of biscuit. It was a night out of ten thousand for my purpose. The fog had now buried all heaven. As the last rays of daylight dwindled and disappeared, Absolute blackness settled down on Treasure Island, and when, at last, I shouldered the coracle and groped my way stumblingly out of the hollow where I'd supped, 
there were but two points visible on the whole anchorage. One was the great fire on shore, by which the defeated pirates lay carousing in the swamp. The other, a mere blur of light upon the darkness, indicated the position of the anchored ship. She had swung round to the ebb. Her bow was now towards me. The only lights on board were in the cabin, and what I saw was merely a reflection on the fog of the strong rays that flowed from the stern window. The ebb had already run some time, and I had to wade through a long belt of swampy sand where I sank several times above the ankle before I came to the edge of the retreating water and wading a little way in with some strength and dexterity set my coracle keel downwards on the surface. Chapter 23 The Ebb Tide Runs The coracle, as I had ample reason to know before I was done with her, was a very safe boat for a person of my height and weight, both buoyant and clever in a seaway, but she was the most cross-grained, lopsided craft to manage. Do as you please, she always made more leeway than anything else, and turning round and round was the manoeuvre she was best at. Even Ben Gunn himself has admitted that she was queer to handle till you knew her way. Certainly I did not know her way. She turned in every direction but the one I was bound to go. The most part of the time we were broadside on, and I'm very sure I should never have made the ship at all but for the tide. By good fortune, paddle as I pleased, the tide was still sweeping me down, and there lay the Hispaniola right in the fairway, hardly to be missed. First she loomed before me like a blot of something yet blacker than darkness. Then her spars and hull began to take shape, and the next moment, as it seemed, for the farther I went, the brisker grew the current of the ebb, I was alongside of our hawser and had laid hold. The hawser was as taut as a bowstring, and the current so strong she pulled upon her anchor. All round the hull, in the blackness, the rippling current bubbled and chattered like a little mountain stream. One cut with my sea gully, and the Hispaniola would go humming down the tide. So far, so good. But it next occurred to my recollection that a taut hawser suddenly cut is a thing as dangerous as a kicking horse. Ten to one, if I were so foolhardy as to cut the Hispaniola from her anchor, I and the coracle would be knocked clean out of the water. This brought me to a full stop, and if fortune had not again particularly favoured me, I should have had to abandon my design. But the night airs, which had begun blowing from the southeast and south, had hauled round after nightfall into the southwest. Just while I was meditating, a puff came, caught the Hispaniola, and forced her up into the current. And to my great joy, I felt the hawser slacken in my grasp, and the hand by which I held it dip for a second under water. With that, I made my mind up, took out my gully, opened it with my teeth, and cut one strand after another till the vessel swung only by two. Then I lay quiet waiting to sever these last, when the strain should be once more lightened by a breath of wind. All this time I had heard the sound of loud voices from the cabin, but to say truth, my mind had been so entirely taken up with other thoughts that I'd scarcely given an ear. Now, however, when I had nothing else to do, I began to pay more heed. One I recognized for the coxswains, Israel Hands, that had been Flint's gunner in former days. The other was, of course, my friend of the red nightcap. Both men were plainly the worse of drink, and they were still drinking. For even while I was listening, one of them, with a drunken cry, opened the stern window and threw out something which I divined to be an empty bottle. But they were not only tipsy, it was plain that they were furiously angry. Oaths flew like hailstones, and every now and then there came forth such an explosion as I thought was sure to end in blows. But each time, the quarrel passed off, and the voices grumbled lower for a while, until the next crisis came, and in its turn passed away without result. On shore, I could see the glow of the great campfire burning warmly through the shoreside trees. Someone was singing a dull old droning sailor's song, with a droop and a quaver at the end of every verse, and seemingly no end to it at all but the patience of the singer. I had heard it on the voyage more than once, and remembered these words. 
But one man of her crew alive, what put to sea with seventy-five. And I thought it was a ditty rather too dolefully appropriate for a company that had met such cruel losses in the morning. But indeed, from what I saw, all these buccaneers were as callous as the sea they sailed on. At last, the breeze came. The schooner sidled and drew nearer in the dark. I felt the hawser slacken once more, and with a good, tough effort, cut the last fibres through. The breeze had but little action on the coracle, and I was almost instantly swept against the bows of the Hispaniola. At the same time, the schooner began to turn upon her heel, spinning slowly end for end across the current. I roared like a fiend, for I expected every moment to be swamped, and since I found I could not push the coracle directly off, I now shoved straight astern. At length, I was clear of my dangerous neighbour, and just as I gave the last impulsion, my hands came across a light cord that was trailing overboard across the stern bulwarks. Instantly I grasped it. Why I should have done so, I can hardly say. It was at first mere instinct, but once I had it in my hands and found it fast, curiosity began to get the upper hand, and I determined I should have one look through the cabin window. I pulled in, hand over hand, on the cord, and when I judged myself near enough, rose at infinite risk to about half my height, and thus commanded the roof and a slice of the interior. By this time, the schooner and her little consort were gliding pretty swiftly through the water. Indeed, we'd already fetched up level with the campfire. The ship was talking, as sailors say, loudly, treading the innumerable ripples with an incessant weltering splash. And until I got my eye above the windowsill, I could not comprehend why the watchman had taken no alarm. One glance, however, was sufficient, and it was only one glance that I durst take from that unsteady skiff. It showed me Hans and his companion locked together in deadly wrestle, each with a hand upon the other's throat. I dropped upon the thwart again, none too soon, for I was near overboard. I could see nothing for the moment but these two furious, in crimson faces swaying together under the smoky lamp, and I shut my eyes to let them grow once more familiar with the darkness. The endless ballad had come to an end at last, and the whole diminished company about the campfire had broken into the chorus I had heard so often. Fifteen men on the dead man's chest. Yo ho ho and a bottle of rum. Drink and the devil had done for the rest. Yo ho ho and a bottle of rum. I was just thinking how busy drink and the devil were at that very moment in the cabin of the Hispaniola when I was surprised by a sudden lurch of the coracle. At the same moment, she yawed sharply and seemed to change her course. The speed in the meantime had strangely increased. I opened my eyes at once. All around me were little ripples, combing over with a sharp, bristling sound and slightly phosphorescent. The Hispaniola herself, a few yards in whose wake I was still being whirled along, seemed to stagger in her course, and I saw her spars toss a little against the blackness of the night. Nay, as I looked longer, I made sure she also was wheeling to the southward. I glanced over my shoulder, and my heart jumped against my ribs. There, right behind me, was the glow of the campfire. The current had turned at right angles, sweeping round along with it the tall schooner and the little dancing coracle. Ever quickening, ever bubbling higher, ever muttering louder, it went spinning through the narrows for the open sea. Suddenly the schooner in front of me gave a violent yaw turning perhaps through twenty degrees, and almost at the same moment, one shout followed another from on board. I could hear feet pounding on the companion ladder, and I knew that the two drunkards had at last been interrupted in their quarrel, and awakened to a sense of their disaster. I lay down flat in the bottom of that wretched skiff, and devoutly recommended my spirit to its maker. At the end of the straits, I made sure we must fall into some bar of raging breakers where all my troubles would be ended speedily. And though I could perhaps bear to die, I could not bear to look upon my fate as it approached. So I must have lain for hours, continually beaten to and fro upon the billows, now and again wetted with flying sprays and never ceasing to expect death at the next plunge. Gradually, weariness grew upon me 
a numbness, an occasional stupor fell upon my mind, even in the midst of my terrors, until sleep at last supervened, and in my sea-tossed coracle, I lay and dreamed of home and the old Admiral Benbow. Chapter 24 the cruise of the coracle. It was broad day when I awoke and found myself tossing at the southwest end of Treasure Island. The sun was up, but was still hid from me behind the great bulk of the spyglass, which on this side descended almost to the sea in formidable cliffs. All Bolin Head and Mizzenmast Hill were at my elbow, the hill bare and dark, the head bound with cliffs forty or fifty feet high and fringed with great masses of fallen rock. I was scarce a quarter of a mile to seaward, and it was my first thought to paddle in and land. That notion was soon given over. Among the fallen rocks the breakers spouted and bellowed. Loud reverberations, heavy sprays flying and falling, succeeded one another from second to second, and I saw myself, if I ventured nearer, dashed to death upon the rough shore, or spending my strength in vain to scale the beetling crags. Nor was that all, for crawling together on flat tables of rock, or letting themselves drop into the sea with loud reports, I beheld huge slimy monsters, soft snails as it were, of incredible bigness, two or three score of them together, making the rocks to echo with their barkings. I've understood since that they were sea lions and entirely harmless. But the look of them, added to the difficulty of the shore and the high running of the surf, was more than enough to disgust me of that landing place. I felt willing rather to starve at sea than to confront such perils. In the meantime, I had a better chance, as I supposed, before me. North of Hall Boland Head, the land runs in a long way, leaving at low tide a long stretch of yellow sand. To the north of that again, there comes another cape. Cape of the Woods, as it was marked upon the chart, buried in tall green pines which descended to the margin of the sea. I remembered what Silver had said about the current that sets northward along the whole west coast of Treasure Island, and seeing from my position that I was already under its influence, I preferred to leave Hall Bolin Head behind me and reserve my strength for an attempt to land upon the kindlier-looking Cape of the Woods. There was a great smooth swell upon the sea. The wind blowing steady and gentle from the south, there was no contrariety between that and the current, and the billows rose and fell unbroken. Had it been otherwise, I must long ago have perished. But as it was, it is surprising how easily and securely my little and light boat could ride. Often, as I lay at the bottom and kept no more than an eye above the gunwale, I would see a big blue summit heaving close above me. Yet the coracle would but bounce a little, dance as if on springs, and subside on the other side into the trough as lightly as a bird. I began, after a little, to grow very bold, and sat up to try my skill at paddling. But even a small change in the disposition of the weight will produce violent changes in the behavior of a coracle. And I had hardly moved before the boat, giving up at once her gentle dancing movement, ran straight down a slope of water so steep that it made me giddy, and struck her nose with a spout of spray deep into the side of the next wave. I was drenched and terrified, and fell instantly back into my old position, whereupon the coracle seemed to find her head again and led me as softly as before among the billows. It was plain that she was not to be interfered with, and at that rate, since I could in no way influence her course, what hope had I left of reaching land? I began to be horribly frightened, but I kept my head for all that. First, moving with all care, I gradually bailed out the coracle with my sea cap, then, getting my eye once more above the gunwale, I set myself to study how it was she managed to slip so quietly through the rolls. I found each wave, instead of the big, smooth, glossy mountain that looks from the shore or from a vessel's deck, was for all the world like any range of hills on dry land, full of peaks and smooth places and valleys. 
The coracle left to herself, turning from side to side, threaded, so to speak, her way through these lower parts and avoided the steep slopes and higher toppling summits of the wave. Well now, thought I to myself, it is plain I must lie where I am and not disturb the balance. But it is plain also that I can put the paddle over the side and from time to time in smooth places give her a shove or two towards land. No sooner thought upon than done. There I lay on my elbows in the most trying attitude and every now and again gave a weak stroke or two to turn her head to shore. It was very tiring and slow work, yet I did visibly gain ground, and as we drew near the Cape of the Woods, though I saw I must infallibly miss that point, I had still made some hundred yards of easting. I was indeed close in. I could see the cool green treetops swaying together in the breeze, and felt sure I could make the next promontory without fail. It was high time, for I now began to be tortured with thirst. The glow of the sun from above, its thousandfold reflection from the waves, the seawater that fell and dried upon me, caking my very lips with salt, combined to make my throat burn and my brain ache. The sight of the trees so near at hand had made me almost sick with longing, but the current had soon carried me past the point, and as the next reach of sea opened out, I beheld a sight that changed the nature of my thoughts. Right in front of me, not half a mile away, I beheld the Hispaniola under sail. I made sure, of course, that I should be taken, but I was so distressed for want of water that I scarce knew whether to be glad or sorry at the thought, and long before I'd come to a conclusion, surprise had taken entire possession of my mind, and I could do nothing but stare and wonder. The Hispaniola was under her mainsail and two jibs, and the beautiful white canvas shone in the sun like snow or silver. When I first sighted her, all her sails were drawing. She was lying a course about northwest, and I presumed the men on board were going round the island on their way back to the anchorage. Presently she began to fetch more and more to the westward, so that I thought they'd sighted me and were going about in chase. At last, however, she fell right into the wind's eye, was taken dead aback, and stood there a while helpless, with her sails shivering. Clumsy fellows, said I. They must still be drunk as owls. And I thought how Captain Smollett would have sent them skipping. Meanwhile, the schooner gradually fell off and filled again upon another tack, sailed swiftly for a minute or so, and brought up once more dead in the wind's eye. Again and again this was repeated. To and fro, up and down, north, south, east and west, the Hispaniola sailed by swoops and dashes, and at each repetition ended as she'd begun with idly flapping canvas. It became plain to me that nobody was steering, and if so, where were the men? Either they were dead drunk or had deserted her, I thought, and perhaps if I could get on board, I might return the vessel to her captain. The current was bearing coracle and schooner southward at an equal rate. As for the latter sailing, it was so wild and intermittent, and she hung each time so long in irons, that she certainly gained nothing if she did not even lose. If only I dared to sit up and paddle, I made sure that I could overhaul her. The scheme had an air of adventure that inspired me, and the thought of the water breaker beside the four companion doubled my growing courage. Up I got, was welcomed almost instantly by another cloud of spray, but this time stuck to my purpose and set myself with all my strength and caution to paddle after the unsteered Hispaniola. Once I shipped a sea so heavy that I had to stop and bail with my heart fluttering like a bird, but gradually I got into the way of the thing and guided my coracle among the waves with only now and then a blow upon her bows and a dash of foam in my face. I was now gaining rapidly on the schooner. I could see the brass glisten on the tiller as it banged about, and still no soul appeared upon her decks. I could not choose but suppose she was deserted. If not, the men were lying drunk below, where I might batten them down, perhaps, and do what I chose with the ship. For some time she had been doing the worst thing possible for me, standing still. She headed nearly due south, yawing, of course, all the time, 
Every time she fell off, her sails partly filled, and these brought her in a moment right to the wind again. I said this was the worst thing possible for me, for helpless as she looked in this situation, with the canvas cracking like cannon and the blocks trundling and banging on the deck, she still continued to run away from me. Not only with the speed of the current, but by the whole amount of her leeway, which was naturally great. But now, at last, I had my chance. The breeze fell for some seconds very low. And the current gradually turning her, the Hispaniola revolved slowly round her centre and at last presented me her stern. With the cabin window still gaping open, and the lamp over the table still burning on into the day. The mainsail hung drooped like a banner. She was stuck still, but for the current. For the last little while, I'd even lost. But now, redoubling my efforts, I began once more to overhaul the chase. I was not a hundred yards from her when the wind came again in a clap. She filled on the port tack and was off again, stooping and skimming like a swallow. My first impulse was one of despair, but my second was towards joy. Round she came till she was broadside on to me. Round still till she had covered her half and then two-thirds and then three-quarters of the distance that separated us. I could see the waves boiling white under her forefoot. Immensely tall she looked to me from my low station in the coracle. And then, of a sudden, I began to comprehend. I had scarce time to think, scarce time to act and save myself. I was on the summit of one swell when the schooner came stooping over the next. The bowsprit was over my head. I sprung to my feet and leapt, stamping the coracle underwater. With one hand, I caught the jibboom, while my foot was lodged between the stay and the brace. And as I still clung there, panting, a dull blow told me that the schooner had charged down upon and struck the coracle, and that I was left without retreat on the Hispaniola. Chapter 25. I Strike the Jolly Roger. I'd scarce gained a position on the bowsprit when the flying jib flapped and filled upon the other tack with a report like a gun. The schooner trembled to her keel under the reverse, but next moment, the other sail still drawing, the jib flapped back again and hung idle. This had nearly tossed me off into the sea, and now I lost no time, crawled back along the bowsprit and tumbled head foremost on the deck. I was on the lee side of the forecastle, and the mainsail, which was still drawing, concealed from me a certain portion of the after deck. Not a soul was to be seen. Planks, which had not been swabbed since the mutiny, bore the print of many feet, and an empty bottle, broken by the neck, tumbled to and fro like a live thing in the scuppers. Suddenly, the Hispaniola came right into the wind. The jibs behind me cracked aloud, the rudder slammed to, the whole ship gave a sickening heave and shudder, and at the same moment, the main boom swung inboard, the sheet groaning in the blocks, and showed me the lee after deck. There were the two watchmen, sure enough. Red cap on his back, as stiff as a handspike, with his arms stretched out like those of a crucifix, and his teeth showing through his open lips. Israel hands, propped against the bulwarks, his head on his chest, his hands lying open before him on the deck, his face as white under its tan as a tallow candle. For a while the ship kept bucking and sidling like a vicious horse, the sails filling now on one tack, now on another, and the boom swinging to and fro till the mast groaned aloud under the strain. Now and then, too, there would come a cloud of light sprays over the bulwark, and a heavy blow of the ship's bows against the swell. So much heavier weather was made of it by this great rigged ship than by my homemade lopsided coracle now gone to the bottom of the sea. At every jump of the schooner, Redcap slipped to and fro, but what was ghastly to behold, neither his attitude nor his fixed teeth-disclosing grin was any way disturbed by this rough usage. At every jump, too, hands appeared still more to sink into himself and settle down upon the deck, his feet sliding ever the farther out, and the whole body canting towards the stern, so that his face became little by little hid from me. And at last I could see nothing beyond his ear and the frayed ringlet of one whisker. 
At the same time, I observed, around both of them, splashes of dark blood upon the planks, and began to feel sure that they had killed each other in their drunken wrath. While I was thus looking and wondering, in a calm moment when the ship was still, Israel hands turned partly round, and with a low moan, writhed himself back to the position in which I had seen him first. The moan, which told of pain and deadly weakness, and the way in which his jaw hung open, went right to my heart. But when I remembered the talk I had overheard from the apple barrel, all pity left me. I walked out until I reached the mainmast. Come aboard, Mr. Hands, I said ironically. He rolled his eyes round heavily, but he was too far gone to express surprise. All he could do was to utter one word. Brandy. It occurred to me there was no time to lose, and dodging the boom as it once more lurched across the deck, I slipped out and down the companion stairs into the cabin. It was such a scene of confusion as you can hardly fancy. All the lockfast places had been broken open in quest of the chart. The floor was thick with mud, where ruffians had sat down to drink or consult after wading in the marshes round their camp. The bulkheads, all painted in clear white and beaded round with gilt, bore a pattern of dirty hands. Dozens of empty bottles clinked together in corners to the rolling of the ship. One of the doctor's medical books lay open on the table. Half of the leaves gutted out, I suppose for pipe lights. In the midst of all this, the lamp still cast a smoky glow, obscure and brown as umber. I went into the cellar. All the barrels were gone, and of the bottles, a most surprising number had been drunk out and thrown away. Certainly since the mutiny began, not a man of them could ever have been sober. Foraging about, I found a bottle with some brandy left for hands, and for myself I routed out some biscuit, some pickled fruits, a great bunch of raisins, and a piece of cheese. With these I came on deck, put down my own stock behind the rudder head, and well out of the coxswain's reach, went forward to the water breaker, and had a good deep drink of water. And then, and not till then, gave hands the brandy. He must have drunk a gill before he took the bottle from his mouth. Aye, said he. By thunder, but I wanted some of that. I had sat down already in my own corner and began to eat. Much hurt? I asked him. He grunted, or rather, I might say, he barked. If that doctor was aboard, he said, I'd be right enough in a couple of turns. But I don't have no manner of luck, you see. And that's what's the matter with me. As for that swab, he's good and dead, he is, he added, indicating the man with the red cap. He weren't no seaman, anyhow. And where might you have come from? Well, said I, I've come aboard to take possession of this ship, Mr. Hans, and you'll please regard me as your captain until further notice. Sourly enough, but said nothing. Some of the colour had come back into his cheeks, though he still looked very sick and still continued to slip out and settle down as the ship banged about. By the way, I continued, I can't have these colours, Mr. Hans, and by your leave I'll strike them. Better none than these. And again, dodging the boom, I ran to the colour lines handed down their cursed black flag and chucked it overboard. God save the king, said I, waving my cap. And there's an end to Captain Silver. He watched me keenly and slyly, his chin all the while on his breast. I reckon, he said at last, I reckon, Captain Hawkins, you'll kind of want to get to shore now. Suppose we talks. Yes, says I, with all my heart, Mr. Hands, say on. And I went back to my meal with a good appetite. This man, he began, nodding feebly at the corpse. O'Brien was his name, a rank islander. This man and me got the canvas on her, 
meaningful to sail their back. Well, he's dead now, he is. As dead as Bilge. And who's to sail this ship, I don't see. Without I gives you a hint. You ain't that man, as far as I can tell. Now, look here. You gives me food and drink and an old scarf or handkerchief to tie my wound up, you do. And I'll tell you how to sail her. And that's about square all round, I take it. I tell you one thing, says I. I'm not going back to Captain Kidd's anchorage. I mean to get into North Inlet and beat her quietly there. To be sure you did, he cried. Why, I ain't such an infernal lubber after all. I can see, can't I? I've tried my fling, I have, and I've lost. And it's you who has the wind of me. North Inlet? Why, I've no choice, not I. I'd help you sail her up to execution dock by thunder. So I would. Well, as it seemed to me, there was some sense in this. We struck our bargain on the spot. In three minutes, I had the Hispaniola sailing easily before the wind along the coast of Treasure Island, with good hopes of turning the northern point ere noon and beating down again as far as North Inlet before high water, when we might beach her safely and wait till the subsiding tide permitted us to land. Then I lashed the tiller and went below to my own chest, where I got a soft silk handkerchief from my mother's. With this, and with my aid, Hans bound up the great bleeding stab he'd received in the thigh, and after he had eaten a little and had a swallow or two more of the brandy, he began to pick up visibly, sat straighter up, spoke louder and clearer, and looked in every way another man. The breeze served us admirably. We skimmed before it like a bird, the coast of the island flashing by, and the view changing every minute. Soon we were past the highlands and bowling beside low, sandy country, sparsely dotted with dwarf pines. And soon we were beyond that again, and had turned the corner of the rocky hill that ends the island on the north. I was greatly elated with my new command, and pleased with the bright, sunshiny weather and these different prospects of the coast. I had now plenty of water and good things to eat, and my conscience, which had smitten me hard for my desertion, was quieted by the great conquest I had made. I should, I think, have had nothing left me to desire, but for the eyes of the coxswain, as they followed me derisively about the deck, and the odd smile that appeared continually on his face. It was a smile that had in it something both of pain and weakness, a haggard old man's smile, but there was, besides that, a grain of derision, a shadow of treachery in his expression, as he craftily watched and watched and watched me at my work. Chapter 26 Israel Hands The wind, serving us to a desire, now hauled into the west, we could run so much the easier from the northeast corner of the island to the mouth of the north inlet. Only as we had no power to anchor, and dared not beach her until the tide had flowed a good deal farther, time hung on our hands. The coxswain told me how to lay the ship too. After a good many trials I succeeded, and we both sat in silence over another meal. Captain said he at length in that same uncomfortable smile is my old shipmate O'Brien suppose you was to heave him overboard I in particular as a rule and I don't take no blame for settling his hash but I don't reckon him ornamental now do you I'm not strong enough and I don't like the job and there he lies for me said I this year's an unlucky ship this Hispaniola, Jim, he went on, blinking. There's a power of men being killed in this Hispaniola. A sight of poor seamen dead and gone since you and me took ship to Bristol. I've never seen such dirty luck, not I. 
There was this here O'Brien now. He's dead, ain't he? Well now, I'm no scholar, and you're a lad as can read and figure. And to put it straight, do you take it as a dead man is dead for good? Or do he come alive again? You can kill the body, Mr. Hans, but not the spirit. You must know that already, I replied. O'Brien there is in another world, and maybe watching us. Ah, says he. Well, that's unfortunate. Appears as if killing parties was a waste of time. No, some of spirits don't reckon for much by what I've seen. I'll chance it with the spirits, Jim. And now, you spoke up free. And I'd take it kind if you'd step down into that there cabin and get me a... Well, a shiver my timbers. I can't hit the name on it. Well, you get me a bottle of wine, Jim. You see, a brandy's too strong for my head. Now, the coxswain's hesitation seemed to me unnatural, and as for the notion of his preferring wine to brandy, I entirely disbelieved it. The whole story was a pretext. He wanted me to leave the deck, so much was plain. But with what purpose, I could in no way imagine. His eyes never met mine. They kept wandering to and fro, up and down, now with a look to the sky, now with a flitting glance upon the dead O'Brien. All the time he kept smiling and putting his tongue out in the most guilty, embarrassed manner, so that a child could have told he was bent on some deception. I was prompt with my answer, however, for I saw where my advantage lay, and that with a fellow so densely stupid, I could easily conceal my suspicions to the end. Some wine, I said. Far better. Will you have white or red? Well, I reckon it's about the blessed same to me, shipmate, he replied. So it's strong and plenty of it. What's the odds? All right, I answered. I'll bring you port, Mr. Hans. But I'll have to dig for it. With that, I scuttled down the companion with all the noise I could, slipped off my shoes, ran quietly along the sparred gallery, mounted the forecastle ladder, and popped my head out of the fore companion. I knew he would not expect to see me there, yet I took every precaution possible, and certainly the worst of my suspicions proved too true. He had risen from his position to his hands and knees, and though his leg obviously hurt him pretty sharply when he moved, for I could hear him stifle a groan, yet it was at a good rattling rate that he trailed himself across the deck. In half a minute he reached the port scuppers and picked out of a coil of rope a long knife, or rather a short dirk, discoloured to the hilt with blood. He looked upon it for a moment, thrusting forth his under jaw, tried the point upon his hand, and then, hastily concealing it in the bosom of his jacket, trundled back again into his old place against the bulwark. That was all that I required to know. Israel could move about, he was now armed, and if he had been at so much trouble to get rid of me, it was plain that I was meant to be the victim. What he would do afterwards, whether he would try to crawl right across the island from the north inlet to the camp among the swamps, or whether he would fire Long Tom, trusting that his own comrades might come first to help him, was, of course, more than I could say. Yet I felt sure that I could trust him in one point, since in that our interests jumped together, and that was in the disposition of the schooner. We both desired to have her stranded safe enough in a sheltered place, and so that when the time came, she could be got off again with as little labor and danger as might be. And until that was done, I considered that my life would certainly be spared. While I was thus turning the business over in my mind, I had not been idle with my body. I had stolen back to the cabin, slipped once more into my shoes, and laid my hand at random on a bottle of wine. And now, with this for an excuse, I made my reappearance on the deck. Hans lay as I'd left him, all fallen together in a bundle, with his eyelids lowered, 
as though he were too weak to bear the light. He looked up, however, at my coming, knocked the neck off the bottle like a man who'd done the same thing often, and took a good swig with his favorite toast of, here's luck. Then he lay quiet for a little, and then, pulling out a stick of tobacco, begged me to cut him a quid. Cut me a junk of that, says he, for I haven't no knife and hardly strength enough so be as I had. Ah, Jim, Jim, I reckon I've missed stays. Cut me a quid as will likely be the last lad, for I'm from our long home and no mistake. Well, said I, I'll cut you some tobacco, but if I was you and thought myself so badly, I would go to my prayers like a Christian man. Why? said he. Now, you tell me why. Why? I cried. You were asking me just now about the dead. You've broken your trust. You've lived in sin and lies and blood. There's a man you killed lying at your feet at this moment. And you ask me why. For God's mercy, Mr. Hans, that's why. I spoke with a little heat, thinking of the bloody dirk he had hidden in his pocket and designed in his ill thoughts to end me with. He, for his part, took a great draught of the wine and spoke with the most unusual solemnity. For thirty years, he said, I've sailed the seas and seen good and bad, better and worse, fair weather and foul, provisions running out, knives going and what not. Well now, I tell you, i never seen good come of goodness yet. Emma strikes first is my fancy. Dead men don't bite. Them's my views. Amen, so be it. And now, you look here, he added, suddenly changing his tone. We've had about enough of this foolery. The tide's made good enough by now. You just take my orders, Captain Hawkins, and we'll sail slapping and be done with it. All told, we had scarce two miles to run, but the navigation was delicate. The entrance to this northern anchorage was not only narrow and shoal, but lay east and west, so that the schooner must be nicely handled to be got in. I think I was a good, prompt subaltern, and I'm very sure that Hans was an excellent pilot, for we went about and about and dodged in, shaving the banks with a certainty and a neatness that were a pleasure to behold. Scarcely had we passed the heads before the land closed around us. The shores of North Inlet were as thickly wooded as those of the southern anchorage, but the space was longer and narrower, and more like, what in truth it was, the estuary of a river. Right before us, at the southern end, we saw the wreck of a ship in the last stages of dilapidation. It had been a great vessel of three masts, but had lain so long exposed to the injuries of the weather that it was hung about with great webs of dripping seaweed. And on the deck of it, shore bushes had taken root and now flourished thick with flowers. It was a sad sight, but it showed us that the anchorage was calm. Now, said Hans, look there. There's a pet pit for to beach a ship in. Fine flat sand, never a cat's paw. Trees all around of it, and flowers are blowing like a garden on that old ship. And once beached, I inquired, how should we get her off again? Why so, he replied. You take a line ashore there on the other side at low water, take a turn about one of them big pines, bring it back, take a turn around the capstan, and lie to for the time. Come I water, all hands take a pull upon the line, and off she comes, as sweet as nature. And now, boy, you stand by. We're near the bit now, and she's too much way on her. Starboard a little. So, steady. Starboard. Larboard a little. Steady. Steady. So he issued his commands, which I breathlessly obeyed. Till all of a sudden he cried, Now, my hearty, luff! 
and I put the helm hard up, and the Hispaniola swung round rapidly and ran stem on for the low wooded shore. The excitement of these last manoeuvres had somewhat interfered with the watch I had kept hitherto sharply enough upon the coxswain. Even then I was still so much interested, waiting for the ship to touch, that I had quite forgot the peril that hung over my head, and stood craning over the starboard bulwarks, and watching the ripples spreading wide before the bows. I might have fallen without a struggle for my life, had not a sudden disquietude seized upon me and made me turn my head. Perhaps I'd heard a creak, or seen his shadow moving with the tail of my eye. Perhaps it was an instinct like a cat's. But, sure enough, when I looked round, there was Hans already halfway towards me with the dirk in his right hand. We must both have cried out aloud when our eyes met, but while mine was the shrill cry of terror, his was a roar of fury like a charging bull's. At the same instant, he threw himself forward and I leapt sideways towards the bows. As I did so, I let go of the tiller, which sprang sharp to leeward, and I think this saved my life, for it struck hands across the chest and stopped him for the moment dead. Before he could recover, I was safe out of the corner where he had me trapped, with all the deck to dodge about. Just forward of the mainmast, I stopped, drew a pistol from my pocket, took a cool aim, though he had already turned and was once more coming directly after me, and drew the trigger. The hammer fell, but there followed neither flash nor sound. The priming was useless with seawater. I cursed myself for my neglect. Why had I not long before reprimed and reloaded my only weapons? Then I should not have been, as now, a mere fleeing sheep before this butcher. Wounded as he was, it was wonderful how fast he could move. His grizzled hair tumbling over his face, and his face itself as red as a red ensign with his haste and fury. I had no time to try my other pistol, or nor indeed much inclination, for I was sure it would be useless. One thing I saw plainly, I must not simply retreat before him, or he would speedily hold me boxed into the bows, as a moment since he caught me so nearly boxed in the stern. Once so caught, and nine or ten inches of the blood-stained dirk would be my last experience on this side of eternity. I placed my palms against the mainmast, which was of goodish bigness, and waited every nerve upon the stretch. Seeing that I meant to dodge, he also paused, and a moment or two passed in feints on his part and corresponding movements upon mine. It was such a game as I'd often played at home about the rocks of Black Hill Cove, but never before, you may be sure, with such a wildly beating heart as now. Still, as I say, it was a boy's game, and I thought I could hold my own at it against an elderly seaman with a wounded thigh. Indeed, my courage had begun to rise so high that I allowed myself a few darting thoughts on what would be the end of the affair, and while I saw certainly that I could spin it out for long, I saw no hope of any ultimate escape. Well, while things stood thus, suddenly the Hispaniola struck, staggered, ground for an instant in the sand, and then, swift as a blow, canted over to the port side till the deck stood at an angle of 45 degrees and about a puncheon of water splashed into the scupper holes and lay in a pool between the deck and bulwark. We were both of us capsized in a second, and both of us rolled almost together into the scuppers, the dead red cap with his arms still spread out, tumbling stiffly after us. So near were we indeed that my head came against the coxswain's foot with a crack that made my teeth rattle. Blow and all, I was the first afoot again, for Hans had got involved with the dead body. The sudden canting of the ship had made the deck no place for running on. I had to find some new way of escape, and that upon the instant, for my foe was almost touching me. Quick as thought, I sprang into the mizzen shrouds, rattled up hand over hand, and did not draw a breath till I was seated on the cross trees. I had been saved by being prompt. The dirk had struck not half a foot below me as I pursued my upward flight. And there stood Israel Hans, with his mouth open and his face upturned to mine, a perfect statue of surprise and disappointment. Now that I had a moment to myself, I lost no time in changing the priming of my pistol. And then, having one ready for service, and to make assurance doubly sure, I proceeded to draw the load of the other, and recharge it afresh from the beginning. My new employment struck hands all of a heap. He began to see the dice going against him. And after an obvious hesitation, 
he also hauled himself heavily into the shrouds, and with the dirk in his teeth, began slowly and painfully to mount. It cost him no end of time and groans to haul his wounded leg behind him, and I had quietly finished my arrangements before he was much more than a third of the way up. Then, with a pistol in either hand, I addressed him. One more step, Mr. Hands, said I, and I'll blow your brains out. Dead men don't bite, you know, I added with a chuckle. He stopped instantly. I could see by the working of his face that he was trying to think, and the process was so slow and laborious that in my newfound security I laughed aloud. At last, with a swallow or two, he spoke his face still wearing the same expression of extreme perplexity. In order to speak, he had to take the dagger from his mouth, but in all else, he remained unmoved. Jim, says he, I reckon we're fouled, you and me, and we'll have to sign articles. I'd have had you, but for that there lurch, but I don't have no luck, not I. And I reckon I'll have to strike. Which comes hard, you see, for a master mariner to a ship's yunker like you, Jim. I was drinking in his words and smiling away, as conceited as a cock up on a wall. When all in a breath, back went his right hand over his shoulder. Something sang like an arrow through the air. I felt a blow and then a sharp pang. And there I was, pinned by the shoulder to the mast. In the horrid pain and surprise of the moment, I scarce can say it was by my own volition, and I'm sure it was without a conscious aim. Both my pistols went off, and both escaped out of my hands. They did not fall alone. With a choked cry, the coxswain loosed his grasp upon the shrouds and plunged headfirst into the water. Chapter 27 Pieces of Eight Oh, into the cant of the vessel, the masts hung far out over the water, and from my perch on the cross trees, I had nothing below me but the surface of the bay. Hans, who was not so far up, was in consequence nearer to the ship and fell between me and the bulwarks. He rose once to the surface in a lather of foam and blood, and then sank again for good. As the water settled, I could see him lying huddled together in the clean, bright sand in the shadow of the vessel's sides. A fish or two whipped past his body. Sometimes, by the quivering of the water, he appeared to move a little, as if he were trying to rise. But he was dead enough for all that, being both shot and drowned, and was food for fish in the very place where he had designed my slaughter. I was no sooner certain of this than I began to feel sick, faint, and terrified. The hot blood was running over my back and chest. The dirk, where it had pinned my shoulder to the mast, seemed to burn like a hot iron. Yet it was not so much these real sufferings that distressed me, for these it seemed to me I could bear without a murmur. It was the horror I had upon my mind of falling from the cross trees into that still green water beside the body of the coxswain. I clung with both hands till my nails ached, and I shut my eyes as if to cover up the peril. Gradually, my mind came back again, my pulses quietened down to a more natural time, and I was once more in possession of myself. It was my first thought to pluck forth the dirk, but either it stuck too hard or my nerve failed me, for I desisted with a violent shudder. Oddly enough, that very shudder did the business. The knife, in fact, had come the nearest in the world to missing me altogether. It held me by a mere pinch of skin, and this the shudder tore away. The blood ran down the faster, to be sure, but I was my own master again, and only tacked to the mast by my coat and shirt. These last I broke through with a sudden jerk, and then regained the deck by the starboard shrouds. For nothing in the world would I have again ventured, shaken as I was, upon the overhanging port shrouds, from which Israel had so lately fallen. I went below and did what I could for my wound. It pained me a good deal and still bled freely, but it was neither deep nor dangerous, nor did it greatly gall me when I used my arm. Then I looked around me 
and as the ship was now in a sense my own, I began to think of clearing it from its last passenger, the dead man O'Brien. He had pitched, as I've said, against the bulwarks, where he lay like some horrible, ungainly sort of puppet, life-size indeed, but how different from life's colour or life's comeliness. In that position, I could easily have my way with him, and as the habit of tragical adventures had worn off almost all my terror for the dead, I took him by the waist as if he'd be a sack of bran, and with one good heave, tumbled him overboard. He went in with a sounding plunge. The red cap came off and remained floating on the surface, and as soon as the splash subsided, I could see him and Israel lying side by side both wavering with the tremulous movement of the water. O'Brien, though still quite a young man, was very bald. There he lay with that bald head across the knees of the man who had killed him, and the quick fishes steering to and fro over both. I was now alone upon the ship. The tide had just turned. The sun was within so few degrees of setting that already the shadow of the pines upon the western shore began to reach right across the anchorage and fall in patterns on the deck. The evening breeze had sprung up, and though it was well warded off by the hill with the two peaks upon the east, the cordage had begun to sing a little softly to itself, and the idle sails to rattle to and fro. I began to see a danger to the ship. The jibs I speedily doused and brought tumbling to the deck, but the mainsail was a harder matter. Of course, when the schooner canted over, the boom had swung outboard, and the cap of it and a foot or two of sail hung even under water. I thought this made it still more dangerous, yet the strain was so heavy that I half feared to meddle. At last, I got my knife and cut the halyards. The peak dropped instantly. A great belly of loose canvas floated broad upon the water, and since, pull as I liked, I could not budge the downhaul, that was the extent of what I could accomplish. For the rest, the Hispaniola must trust to luck, like myself. By this time, the whole anchorage had fallen into shadow. The last rays, I remember, falling through a glade of the wood and shining bright as jewels on the flowery mantle of the wreck. It began to be chill. The tide was rapidly fleeting seaward the schooner settling more and more on her beam ends. I scrambled forward and looked over. It seemed shallow enough, and holding the cut hawser in both hands for a last security, I let myself drop softly overboard. The water scarcely reached my waist, the sand was firm and covered with ripple marks, and I waded ashore in great spirits, leaving the Hispaniola on her side with the mainsail trailing wide upon the surface of the bay. About the same time, the sun went fairly down, and the breeze whistled low in the dusk among the tossing pines. At least, and at last, I was off the sea. Nor had I returned thence empty-handed. There lay the schooner, clear at last from buccaneers, and ready for our own men to board and get to sea again. I had nothing nearer my fancy than to get home to the stockade and boast of my achievements. Possibly I might be blamed a bit for my truantry, but the recapture of the Hispaniola was a clenching answer, and I hoped that even Captain Smollett would confess that I had not lost my time. So thinking, and in famous spirits, I began to set my face homeward for the blockhouse and my companions. I remembered that the most easterly of the rivers which drain into Captain Kidd's anchorage ran from the two-peaked hill upon my left, and I bent my course in that direction that I might pass the stream while it was still small. The wood was pretty open, and keeping along the lower spurs, I had soon turned the corner of that hill, and not long after, waded to the mid-calf across the watercourse. This brought me near to where I'd encountered Ben Gunn, the maroon, and I walked more circumspectly, keeping an eye on every side. The dusk had come nigh hand completely, and as I opened out the cleft between the two peaks, I became aware of a wavering glow against the sky, where, as I judged, the man of the island was cooking his supper before a roaring fire. And 
Yet I wondered in my heart that he should show himself so careless. For if I could see his radiance, might it not reach the eyes of Silver himself, where he camped upon the shore among the marshes? Gradually, the night felt blacker. It was all I could do to guide myself even roughly towards my destination. The double hill behind me and the spyglass on my right hand loomed fainter and fainter. The stars were few and pale. And in the low ground where I wandered, I kept tripping among bushes and rolling into sandy pits. Suddenly, a kind of brightness fell about me. I looked up. A pale glimmer of moonbeams had alighted on the summit of the spyglass. And soon after, I saw something broad and silvery moving low down behind the trees and knew the moon had risen. With this to help me, I passed rapidly over what remained to me of my journey and, sometimes walking, sometimes running, impatiently drew near to the blockade. Yet, as I began to thread the grove that lies before it, I was not so thoughtless but that I slacked my pace and went a trifle warily. It would have been a poor end of my adventures to get shot down by my own party in mistake. The moon was climbing higher and higher. Its light began to fall here and there in masses through the more open districts of the wood, and right in front of me, a glow of a different colour appeared among the trees. It was red and hot, and now and again it was a little darkened, as it were the embers of a bonfire smoking. For the life of me, I could not think what it might be. At last, I came down upon the borders of the clearing. The western end was already steeped in moonshine. The rest, and the blockhouse itself, still lay in a black shadow, checkered with long silvery streaks of light. On the other side of the house, an immense fire had burned itself into clear embers and shed a steady red reverberation, contrasted strongly with the mellow paleness of the moon. There was not a soul stirring, nor a sound beside the noises of the breeze. I stopped with much wonder in my heart and perhaps a little terror also. It had not been our way to build great fires. We were indeed, by the captain's orders, somewhat niggardly of firewood, and I began to fear that something had gone wrong while I was absent. I stole round by the eastern end, keeping close in shadow, and at a convenient place where the darkness was thickest, crossed the palisade. To make assurance surer, I got upon my hands and knees and crawled without a sound towards the corner of the house. As I drew nearer, my heart was suddenly and greatly lightened. It is not a pleasant noise in itself, and I've often complained of it at other times, but just then it was like music to hear my friends snoring together, so loud and peaceful in their sleep. The sea cry of the watch, that beautiful all's well, never fell more reassuringly on my ear. In the meantime, there was no doubt of one thing. They kept an infamous bad watch. If it had been Silver and his lads that were now creeping in on them, not a soul would have seen daybreak. That was what it was, thought I, to have the captain wounded. And again I blamed myself sharply for leaving them in that danger with so few to mount guard. By this time I got to the door and stood up. All was dark within, so that I could distinguish nothing by the eye. As for sounds, there was the steady drone of the snorers, and a small occasional noise, a flickering or pecking that I could in no way account for. With my arms before me, I walked steadily in. I should lie down in my own place, I thought, with a silent chuckle, and enjoy their faces when they found me in the morning. My foot struck something yielding. It was a sleeper's leg, and he turned and groaned, but without awaking. And then, all of a sudden, a shrill voice broke forth out of the darkness. Pieces of eight! 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 And so forth, without pause or change, like the clacking of a tiny mill. Silver's green parrot, Captain Flint. It was she whom I'd heard pecking at a piece of bark. It was she, keeping better watch than any human being, who thus announced my arrival with her wearisome refrain. I had no time left me to recover. At the sharp, clipping tone of the parrot, the sleepers awoke and sprang up, and with a mighty oath, the voice of Silver cried, Who goes? 
I turned to run, struck violently against one person, recoiled and ran full into the arms of a second, who for his part closed upon and held me tight. Bring a torch, Dick, said Silver, when my capture was thus assured. And one of the men left the log house and presently returned with a lighted brand. Part 6. Captain Silver. Chapter 28. In the enemy's camp. The red glare of the torch, lighting up the interior of the blockhouse, showed me the worst of my apprehensions realized. The pirates were in possession of the house and stores. There was the cask of cognac, there were the pork and bread, as before, and what tenfold increased my horror, not a sign of any prisoner. I could only judge that all had perished, and my heart smote me sorely that I had not been there to perish with them. There were six of the buccaneers, all told. Not another man was left alive. Five of them were on their feet, flushed and swollen, suddenly called out of the first sleep of drunkenness. The sixth had only risen upon his elbow. He was deadly pale, and the blood-stained bandage round his head told that he had recently been wounded, and still more recently dressed. I remembered the man who had been shot and had run back among the woods in the great attack, and doubted not that this was he. The parrot sat preening her plumage on Long John's shoulder. He himself, I thought, looked somewhat paler and more stern than I was used to. He still wore the fine broadcloth suit in which he had fulfilled his mission, but it was bitterly the worse for wear, daubed with clay and torn with the sharp briars of the wood. So, said he, here's Jim Hawkins, shiver my timbers. Dropped in like hay. Well, come, I take that friendly. And thereupon he sat down across the brandy cask and began to fill a pipe. Give me a loan of the link, Dick, said he. And then, when he'd had a good light, that'll do, lad, he added. Stick the glim in the wood heap. And you gentlemen, bring yourselves too. You needn't stand up for Mr. Hawkins. He'll excuse you, you may lay to that. And so, Jim, stopping the tobacco, here you were. And quite a pleasant surprise for poor old John. I see you were smart when I first set my eyes on you. But this year gets away from me clean, it do. To all this, as may be well supposed, I made no answer. They had me set with my back against the wall, and I stood there, looking silver in the face, pluckily enough, I hope, to all outward appearance, but with black despair in my heart. Silver took a whiff or two of his pipe with great composure, and then ran on again. No, you see, Jim, so be as you are here, says he. I'll give you a piece of my mind. I've always liked you, I have. For a lad of spirit, and the picture of my own self when I was young and handsome. I always wanted you to join and take your share, and die a gentleman. And now, my cock, you've got to. Captain Smollett's a fine seaman, as I'll own up to any day, but stiff on discipline. Duty is duty, says he, and right he is. Just you keep clear of the captain. The doctor himself is gone dead against you. Ungrateful scamp was what he said. And the short and the long of the whole story is about you. You can't go back to your own lot, for they won't have you. And without you start a third ship's company all by yourself, which might be lonely, you'll have to join with Captain Silver. So far, so good. My friends then were still alive. And though I partly believed the truth of Silver's statement that the cabin party were incensed at me for my desertion, I was more relieved than distressed by what I heard. I don't say nothing as to your being in our hands, continued Silver, though there you are and you may lay to it. I'm all for argument. I never seen good come out of threatening. If you like the service, well, you'll join. And if you don't, Jim, why, you're free to answer no. Free and welcome, shipmate. And if fairer can be said, by mortal seamen, shiver my sides. 
Am I to answer then? I asked with a very tremulous voice. Through all this sneering talk, I was made to feel the threat of death that overhung me, and my cheeks burned, my heart beat painfully in my breast. Lad, said Silver, no one's oppressive of you. Take your bearings. None of us won't hurry you, mate. Time goes so pleasant in your company, you see. Well, says I, growing a bit bolder, if I'm to choose, I declare I have a right to know what's what, and why you're here, and where my friends are. What's what? repeated one of the buccaneers in a deep growl. Ah, he'd be a lucky one as knowed that. You'll perhaps batten down your hatches till you're spoke to, my friend, cried Silver truculently to this speaker. And then, in his first gracious tones, he replied to me. Yesterday morning, Mr. Hawkins, said he, in the dog watch, down came Dr. Livesey with a flag of truce. Says he, Captain Silver, you're sold out. Ship's gone. Well, maybe we'd been taking a glass and a song to help it round, I won't say no. Leastways, none of us had looked out. We looked out, and by thunder, the old ship was gone. I never seen a pack of fools look fishier. And you may lay to that if I tells you that look the fishiest. Well, says the doctor, let's bargain. We bargained, him and I, and here we are. Stores, brandy, blockhouse, the firewood you was thoughtful enough to cut, and in a manner of speaking, the old blessed boat from cross trees to Kelson. As for them, they've trapped. I don't know where they are. He drew again quietly at his pipe. Unless you should take it into that head of yours, he went on, that you was included in the treaty, here's the last word that was said. How many are you, says I, to leave? Four, says he. Four and one of us wounded. As for that boy, I don't know where he is, confound him, says he. Nor I don't much care. We're about sick of him. Those were his words. Is that all? I asked. Well, it's all that you're to hear, my son, returned Silver. And now I am to choose. And now you are to choose, and you may lay to that, said Silver. Well, said I, I'm not such a fool, but I know pretty well what I have to look for. Let the worst come to the worst, it's little I care. I've seen too many die since I fell in with you. But there's a thing or two I have to tell you, I said, and by this time I was quite excited. And the first is this. Here you are, in a bad way. Ship lost, treasure lost, men lost, your old business gone to wreck. And if you want to know who did it, it was I. I was in the apple barrel the night we sighted land, and I heard you, John, and you, Dick Johnson, and Hans, who was now at the bottom of the sea, and told every word you said before the hour was out. And as for the schooner, it was I who cut her cable, and it was I that killed the men you had aboard of her, and it was I who brought her where you never see her more, not one of you. The laugh's on my side. I've had the top of this business from the first. I no more fear you than I fear a fly. Kill me if you please, or spare me. But one thing I'll say, and no more. If you spare me, Bygones are bygones, and when you fellows are in court for piracy, I'll save you all I can. It is for you to choose. Kill another and do yourselves no good, or spare me and keep a witness to save you from the gallows. I stopped, for I tell you, I was out of breath, and to my wonder, not a man of them moved, but all sat staring at me like as many sheep. And while they were still staring, I broke out again. And now, Mr. Silver, I said, I believe you're the best man here. And if things go the worst, I'll take it kind of you to let the doctor know the way I took it. I'll bear it in mind, said Silver, with an accent so curious that I could not for the life of me decide whether he were laughing at my request or had been favorably affected by my courage. I'll put one to that 
cried the old mahogany-faced seaman, Morgan by name, whom I had seen in Long John's public house upon the quays of Bristol. It was him that knowed Black Dog. Well, and see here, added the sea cook, I'll put another again to that by thunder, for it was this same boy that faked the chart from Billy Bones. First and last we've spit upon Jim Hawkins. Then here goes, said Morgan with an oath, and he sprang up, drawing his knife as if he'd been twenty. Avast there, cried Silver. Who are you, Tom Morgan? Maybe you thought you was captain here, perhaps. By the powers, but I'll teach you better. Cross me and you'll go where many a good man's gone before you, first and last, these thirty year back. Some to the yard arm, shiver my timbers, and some by the board, and all to feed the fishes. There's never a man look me between the eyes and seen a good day afterwards, Tom Morgan. You may lay to that. Morgan paused, but a hoarse murmur arose from the others. Tom's right, said one. I stood hazing long enough from one, added another. I'll be hanged if I be hazed by you, John Silver. Did any of you gentlemen want to have it out with me? roared Silver, bending far forward from his position on the keg, with his pipe still glowing in his right hand. Put a name on what you're at. You ain't dumb, I reckon. Him that wants shall get it. Have I lived these many years and a son of a rum punch and cock his hat to thwart my halls at the latter end of it? You know the way. You're all gentlemen of fortune by your account. Well, I'm ready. Take a cutlass, him that dares, and I'll see the color of his inside, crutch and all, before that pipe's empty. Not a man stirred. Not a man answered. That's your sword, is it? He added, returning his pipe to his mouth. Well, you're a gay lot to look at, anyway. Not much worth to fight, you ain't. Perhaps you can understand King George's English. I'm captain here by election. I'm captain here because I'm the best man by a long sea mile. You won't fight as gentlemen of fortune should, then by thunder you'll obey, and you may lay to it. I like that boy now. I never seen a better boy than that. He's more a man than any pair of rats of you in this here house. And what I say is this. Let me see him that'll lay a hand upon him. That's what I say, and you may lead to it. There was a long pause after this. I stood straight up against the wall, my heart still going like a sledgehammer, but with a ray of hope now shining in my bosom. Silver leant back against the wall, his arms crossed, his pipe in the corner of his mouth, as calm as though he'd been in church. Yet his eye kept wandering furtively, and he kept the tail of it on his unruly followers. They, on their part, drew gradually together towards the far end of the blockhouse, and the low hiss of the whispering sounded in my ear continuously like a stream. One after another, they would look up, and the red light of the torch would fall for a second on their nervous faces. But it was not towards me, it was towards Silver that they turned their eyes. You seem to have a lot to say, remarked Silver, spitting far into the air. Pipe up and let me hear it, or lay to. Ax your pardon, sir, returned one of the men. You're pretty free with some of the rules. Maybe you'll kindly keep an eye upon the rest. This crew's dissatisfied. This crew don't valley bullying a marlin spike. This crew has its rights like other crews, I'll make so free as that. And by your own rules, I take it we can talk together. I ask your pardon, sir, acknowledging you for to be captain at this present. But I claim my right and steps outside for a council. And with an elaborate sea salute, this fellow, a long, ill-looking, yellow-eyed man of five and thirty, stepped coolly towards the door and disappeared out of the house. One after another, the rest followed his example, each making a salute as he passed, each adding some apology. According to rules, said one. Folks will counsel, said Morgan. And so, with one remark or another, all marched out and left Silver and me alone with the torch. The sea cook instantly removed his pipe. Now, look you here, Jim Hawkins, he said in a steady whisper that was no more than audible. 
you're within half a plank of death. And what's alongside worse? Of torture. They're going to throw me off. But you, Mark, I stand by you through thick and thin. I didn't mean to. No, not till you spoke up. I was about desperate to lose that much blunt and be hanged into the bargain. But I see you was the right sort. I says to myself, you stand by Hawkins, John, and Hawkins will stand by you. You're his last card, and by the living thunder, John, he's yours. Back to back, says I, you save your witness, and he'll save your neck. I began dimly to understand. You mean, all's lost? I asked. Aye, by gum I do, he answered. Ship gone, neck gone, that's the size of it. Once I looked into that bay, Jim Hawkins, and seen no schooner. Well, I'm tough, but I gave out. As for that lot and their counsel, mark me their outright fools and cowards. I'll save your life, so be as I can, from them. But see here, Jim, tit for tat, you save Long John from swinging. I was bewildered. It seemed a thing so hopeless he was asking. He, the old buccaneer, the ringleader throughout? What I can do? That I'll do, I said. It's a bargain, cried Long John. You speak up plucky, and by thunder I've a chance. He hobbled to the torch, where it stood propped among the firewood, and took a fresh light to his pipe. Understand me, Jim, he said, returning. I've a head on my shoulders, I have. I'm on Squire's side now. I know you got that ship safe somewheres. How you done it, I don't know. But safe it is. I guess Hans and O'Brien turned soft. I never much believed in neither of them. Now you mark me. I ask no questions. Nor I won't let others. I know when a game's up, I do. And I know a lad that's staunch. Ah, you that's young. You and me might have done a power of good together. He drew some cognac from a cask into a tin cannon. Will you taste, messmate? He asked. And when I'd refused, Well, I'll take a drain myself, Jim, said he. I need a corker, for there's trouble on hand. And talking of trouble, why did that doctor give me the chart, Jim? My face expressed a wonder so unaffected that he saw the needlessness of further questions. Ah, well, he did go, said he. And there's something under that, no doubt. Something surely under that, Jim, bad or good. And he took another swallow of brandy, shaking his great fair head like a man who looks forward to the worst. Chapter 29, The Black Spot Again. The council of buccaneers had lasted some time. When one of them re-entered the house, and with a repetition of the same salute, which had in my eyes an ironical air, begged for a moment's loan of the torch. Silver briefly agreed, and this emissary retired again, leaving us together in the dark. There's a breeze coming, Jim, said Silver, who had by this time adopted quite a friendly and familiar tone. I turned to the loophole nearest me and looked out. The embers of the great fire had so far burned themselves out, and now glowed so low and duskily that I understood why these conspirators desired a torch. About halfway down the slope to the stockade, they were collected in a group. One held the light, another was on his knees in their midst, and I saw the blade of an open knife shine in his hand, with varying colours, in the moon and torchlight. The rest were all somewhat stooping, as though watching the manoeuvres of this last. I could just make out that he had a book as well as a knife in his hand, and was still wondering how anything so incongruous had come in their possession, when the kneeling figure rose once more to his feet, and the whole party began to move together toward the house. Here they come, said I, and I returned to my former position, for it seemed beneath my dignity that they should find me watching them. Well, let them come, lad, 
Let him come, said Silver cheerily. I've still a shot in my locker. The door opened, and the five men, standing huddled together just inside, pushed one of their number forward. In any other circumstances, it would have been comical to see his slow advance, hesitating as he set down each foot, but holding his closed right hand in front of him. Step up, lad, cried Silver. I won't eat you. Hand it over, lover. I know the rules, I do. I won't hurt a deputation. Thus encouraged, the buccaneer stepped forth more briskly, and having passed something to Silver from hand to hand, slipped yet more smartly back again to his companions. The sea cook looked at what had been given him. The black spot. I thought so, he observed. Where might you have got the paper? Why, hello. Look here now, this ain't lucky. You gone and cut this out of a Bible. What fools cut a Bible? Ah, there, said Morgan. There, what did I say? No good'll come of that, I said. Well, you've about fixed it now, among you, continued Silver. You'll all swing now, I reckon. What soft-headed lubber had a Bible? It was Dick, said one. Dick, was it? Then Dick can get to prayers, said Silver. He's seen his slice of luck as Dick, and you may lay to that. But here the long man with the yellow eyes struck in. Belay that talk, John Silver, he said. This crew has tipped you the black spot in full council as in duty bound. Just you turn it over as in duty bound and see what's wrote there. Then you can talk. Thank you, George, replied the sea cook. You always was brisk for business and has the rules by heart, George, as I'm pleased to see. Well... What is it, anyway? Ah, deposed. That's it, is it? Very pretty rope, to be sure. Like print, I swear. Your hand are right, George? Why, you was getting quite a leading man in this here crew. You'll be captain next, I shouldn't wonder. Just oblige me with that torch again, will you? This pipe don't draw. Come now, said George. You don't fool this crew no more. You're a funny man by your account, but you're over now, and you'll maybe step down off that barrel and help vote. I thought you said you know the rules, returned Silver contemptuously. Leastways, if you don't, I do. And I wait here, and I'm still your captain, mind, till you outs with your grievances, and I reply. In the meantime, your black spot ain't worth a biscuit. After all, we'll see. Oh, replied George. You don't be under no kind of apprehension. We're all square, we are. First, you've made a hash of this cruise. You'd be a bold man to say no to that. Second, you let the enemy out of this here trap for nothing. Why did they want out? I don't know, but it's pretty plain they wanted it. Third, you wouldn't let us go at them upon the march. Oh, we see through you, John Silver. You want to play booty. That's what's wrong with you. And then fourth... There's this here boy. Is that all? Asked Silver quietly. Enough too, retorted George. We'll all swing and sun drive for your bungling. Well now, look here. I'll answer these four points. One after another I'll answer them. I made a hash of this cruise, did I? Well now, you all know what I wanted. And you all know that if that had been done, we'd have been aboard the Hispaniola this night as ever was, every man of us alive and fit and full of good plum duff and the treasure in the hold of her by thunder. Well, who crossed me? Who forced my hand, as was the lawful captain? Who tipped me the black spot the day we landed and began this dance? Aha, it's a fine dance. I'm with you there. It looks mighty like a hornpipe at a rope's end at execution dock by London Town, it does. But who done it? Why, it was Anderson. And Hans. And you, George Merry. And you're the last above board of that same meddling crew. And you have the Davy Jones's insolence to up and stand for captain over me. You that sank the lot of us. By the powers, but this tops the stiffest yarn to nothing. Silver paused, and I could see by the faces of George and his late comrades that these words had not been said in vain. That's for number one. 
cried the accused, wiping the sweat from his brow, for he'd been talking with a vehemence that shook the house. Why, I give you my word, I'm sick to speak to you. You've neither sense nor memory, and I leave it to fancy where your mother's was that let you come to see. See, gentlemen of fortune, I reckon tailors is your trade. Go on, John, said Morgan. Speak up to the others. Ah, the others, returned John. They're a nice lot, ain't they? You say this cruise is bungled. Ah, by gum, if you could understand how bad it's bungled, you would see. Were that near the gibbet that my neck stiff with thinking on it. You've seen them, maybe, hanged in chains, birds about them, seamen pointing them out as they go down with the tide. Who's that, says one? That? Why, that's John Silver. I knowed him well, says another. And you can hear the chains and jangle as you go about and reach for the other boy. Now, that's about where we are. Every mother's son of us, thanks to him, and Hans, and Anderson, and other ruination fools of you. And if you want to know about number four, and that boy, why shiver my timbers, isn't he a hostage? Are we going to waste a hostage? No, not us. He might be our last chance, and I shouldn't wonder. Kill that boy, not me, mates. And number three. Ah, well, there's a deal to say to number three. Maybe you don't count it nothing to have a real college doctor come to see you every day. You, John, with your head broke. Or you, George Mary, that had the ague shakes upon you not six hours agone and has your eyes the color of lemon peel to this same moment on the clock. And maybe, perhaps, you didn't know there was a consort coming, either. But there is, and not so long till then. And we'll see you'll be glad to have a hostage when it comes to that. And as for number two, and why I made a bargain, well, you came crawling on your knees to me to make it. On your knees you came. You was that downhearted. And you'd have starved too if I hadn't. But that's a trifle. You look here. That's why. And he cast down upon the floor a paper that I instantly recognized. None other than the chart on yellow paper with the three red crosses that I'd found in the oilcloth at the bottom of the captain's chest. Why the doctor had given it to him was more than I can fancy. But if it were inexplicable to me, the appearance of the chart was incredible to the surviving mutineers. They leapt upon it like cats upon a mouse. They went from hand to hand, one tearing it from another, and by the oaths and the cries and the childish laughter with which they accompanied their examination, you would have thought not only were they fingering the very gold, but were at sea with it, besides in safety. Yes, said one. That's friend, sure enough. J.F. and a score below with a clove hitch to it. So he done, ever. Mighty pretty, said George. But how are we to get away with it, and us no ship? Silver suddenly sprang up, and supporting himself with a hand against the wall. Now I give you warning, George, he cried. One more word of your sauce, and I'll call you down and fight you. How? Well, how do I know? You'd ought to tell me that. You and the rest that lost me my schooner with your interference burn you. But not you. You can't. You ain't got the invention of a cockroach. But civil you can speak. And shall, George Merry. You may lay to that. That's fair enough, said the old man Morgan. Fair? I reckon so, said the sea cook. You lost the ship. I found the treasure. Who's the better man at that? And now I resign, I thunder. Elect whom you please to be your captain now. I'm done with it. Silver, they cried. Barbecue forever. Barbecue for captain. So, that's the two, is it? Cried the cook. George, I reckon you'll have to wait another turn, friend. I'm lucky for you, as I'm not a revengeful man. But that was never my way. And now, shipmates, this black spot. It ain't much good now, is it? Dick's crossed his luck and spoiled his Bible, and that's about all. It'll do to kiss the book on still, won't it? 
growled Dick, who was evidently uneasy at the curse he had brought upon himself. A Bible with a bit cut out, returned Silver derisively. Not it. It don't bind more than a ballad book. Don't it, though? cried Dick with a sort of joy. Well, I reckon that's worth having, too. Here, Jim, here's a curiosity for you, said Silver, and he tossed me the paper. It was about the size of a crown piece. One side was blank, for it had been the last leaf. The other contained a verse or two of revelation. These words among the rest, which struck sharply home upon my mind. Without our dogs and murderers. The printed side had been blackened with wood ash, which already began to come off and soil my fingers. On the blank side had been written with the same material, the one word, deposed. I have that curiosity beside me at this moment. But not a trace of writing now remains beyond a single scratch, such as a man might make with his thumbnail. That was the end of the night's business. Soon after, with a drink all round, we lay down to sleep. And the outside of Silver's vengeance was to put George Merry up for sentinel and threaten him with death if he should prove unfaithful. It was long ere I could close an eye, and heaven knows I had matter enough for thought in the man whom I'd slain that afternoon, in my own most perilous position, and above all, in the remarkable game that I saw Silver now engaged upon, keeping the mutineers together with one hand, and grasping with the other after every means possible and impossible to make his peace and save his miserable life. He himself slept peacefully and snored aloud. Yet my heart was sore for him, wicked as he was, to think on the dark perils that environed and the shameful gibbet that awaited him. Chapter 30. On Parole. I was wakened. Indeed, we were all wakened, for I could see even the sentinel shake himself together from where he had fallen against the doorpost by a clear, hearty voice hailing us from the margin of the wood. Blockhouse ahoy! it cried. Here's the doctor! And the doctor it was. Although I was glad to hear the sound, yet my gladness was not without admixture. I remembered with confusion my insubordinate and stealthy conduct, and when I saw where it had brought me, among what companions and surrounded by what dangers, I felt ashamed to look him in the face. He must have risen in the dark, for the day had hardly come. And when I ran to a loophole and looked out, I saw him standing, like the silver once before, up to the mid-leg in creeping vapour. You, doctor, top of the morning to you, sir, cried Silver, broad awake and beaming with good nature in a moment. Bright and early, to be sure, and it's an early bird, as the saying goes, that gets the rations. George, shake up your timbers, son, and help Dr. Livesey over the ship's side. All are doing well, your patience was. All well and merry. So he patted on, standing on the hilltop with his crutch under his elbow and one hand upon the side of the log house. Quite the old John in voice, manner, and expression. We're quite a surprise for you, too, sir, he continued. We've a little stranger here, hee <laughs> hee. A new boarder and lodger, sir, and looking fit and taut as a fiddler. Slept like a supercargo, we did, right alongside of John. Stem to stem we was all night. Dr. Livesey was by this time across the stockade and pretty near the cook, and I could hear the alteration in his voice as he said, Not Jim? The same Jim as ever was, says Silver. The doctor stopped outright, though he did not speak and it was some seconds before he seemed able to move on. Well, well, he said at last. Duty first and pleasure afterwards, as you might have said yourself, Silver. Let us overhaul these patients of yours. A moment afterwards, he'd entered the blockhouse, and with one grim nod to me, proceeded with his work among the sick. He seemed under no apprehension, though he must have known that his life among these treacherous demons depended on a hair, and he rattled on to his patients as if he were paying an ordinary professional visit in a quiet English family. 
His manner, I suppose, reacted on the men, for they behaved to him as if nothing had occurred, as if he were still ship's doctor and they still faithful hands before the mast. You're doing well, my friend, he said to the fellow with the bandaged head, and if ever any person had a close shave, it was you. Your head must be as hard as iron. Well, George, how goes it? You're in a pretty colour, certainly. Why, your liver man is upside down. Did you take that medicine? Did he take that medicine, men? Aye, aye, sir, he took it, sure enough, returned Morgan. Because, you see, since I am mutineer's doctor, or prison doctor, as I prefer to call it, says Dr. Livesey in his pleasantest way, I make it a point of honour not to lose a man for King George, God bless him, and the gallows. The rogues looked at each other, but swallowed the home thrust in silence. Dick don't feel well, sir, said one. Don't he, replied the doctor. Well, step up here, Dick, and let me see your tongue. No, I should be surprised if he did. The man's tongue is fit to frighten the French. Another fever? Ah, there, said Morgan. That come to spoiling Bibles. That come, as you call it, of being arrant asses, retorted the doctor. And not having sense enough to know honest air from poison and the dry land from a vile pestiferous slough. I think it most probable, though of course it's only an opinion, that you'll all have the deuce to pay before you get that malaria out of your systems. Camp in a bog, would you? Silver, I'm surprised at you. You're less of a fool than many take you all round, but you don't appear to me to have the rudiments of a notion of the rules of health. Well, he added, after he'd dosed them round, and they'd taken his prescriptions with really laughable humility, more like charity school children than blood-guilty mutineers and pirates. Well, that's done for today. And now I'd wish to have a talk with that boy, please. And he nodded his head in my direction carelessly. George Merry was at the door, spitting and spluttering over some bad-tasted medicine, but at the first word of the doctor's proposal, he swung round with a deep flush and cried, No! and swore. Silver struck the barrel with his open hand. Silence! he roared, and looked about him positively like a lion. Doctor, he went on, in his usual tones, I was thinking of that, knowing as how you had a fancy for the boy. We're all humbly grateful for your kindness, and as you see, he puts faith in you and takes the drugs down like that much grog. And I take it I found a way as'll suit all. Hawkins, will you give me your word of honor as a young gentleman? For a young gentleman you are, though poor boy. Your word of honor not to slip your cable. I readily gave the pledge required. Then, doctor, said Silver, you just step outside of that stockade, and once you're there, I'll bring the boy down on the inside, and I reckon you can yarn through the spars. Good day to you, sir, and all our duties to the squire and Captain Smollett. The explosion of disapproval which nothing but Silver's black looks had restrained broke out immediately the doctor had left the house. Silver was roundly accused of playing double, of trying to make a separate peace for himself, of sacrificing the interests of his accomplices and victims, and, in one word, of the identical exact thing that he was doing. It seemed to me so obvious in this case that I could not imagine how he was to turn their anger. But he was twice the man the rest were, and his last night's victory had given him a huge preponderance on their minds. He called them all the fools and dolts you could imagine, said it was necessary I should talk to the doctor, fluttered the chart in their faces, asked them if they could afford to break the treaty the very day they were bound to treasure hunting. No, by thunder, he cried. It's us must break the treaty when the time comes. Until then, I'll gammon that doctor if I have to aisle his boots with brandy. And then he bade them get the fire lit and stalked out upon his crutch with his hand upon my shoulder, leaving them in a disarray and silenced by his volubility rather than convinced. Slow, lad, slow, he said. They might round upon us in a twinkle of an eye if we were seen to hurry. Very deliberately, then, did we advance across the sand to where the doctor awaited us on the other side of the stockade. And as soon as we were within easy speaking distance, Silver stopped. You'll make a note of this here also, doctor, says he. 
And the boy will tell you how I saved his life. And we're deposed for it, too. And you may late to that. Doctor, when a man's steering as near the wind as me, playing chuck farthing with the last breath in his body, like, you wouldn't think it too much, mayhap, to give him one good word. You'll please bear in mind, it's not my life only now. It's that boy's into the bargain. And you'll speak me fair, Doctor. Give me a bit of hope to go on, for the sake of mercy. Silver was a changed man once he was out there and had his back to his friends in the blockhouse. His cheeks seemed to have fallen in. His voice trembled. And never was a soul more dead in earnest. Why, John, you're not afraid? asked Dr. Livesey. Doctor, I am no coward. No, not I, not so much. And he snapped his fingers. If I was, I wouldn't say it. But I'll own up fairly. I've the shakes upon me for the gallows. You're a good man and a true. I never seen a better man. And you not forget what I done good. Not any more than you forget the bad, I know. And I step aside, see here, and leave you and Jem alone. And you put that down for me, too. For it's a long stretch, is that? So saying, he stepped back a little way, till he was out of earshot, and there sat down upon a tree stump and began to whistle, spinning round now and again upon his seat so as to command a sight, sometimes of me and the doctor, and sometimes of his unruly ruffians as they went to and fro in the sand between the fire, which they were busy rekindling, and the house from which they brought forth pork and bread to make the breakfast. So, Jim, said the doctor sadly, here you are. As you have brewed, so shall you drink, my boy. Heaven knows I cannot find it in my heart to blame you, but this much I will say, be it kind or unkind. When Captain Smollett was well, you dared not have gone off. And when he was ill and couldn't help it, by George, it was downright cowardly. I will own that I here began to weep. Doctor, I said, you might spare me. I blame myself enough. My life's forfeit anyway. And I should have been dead by now if Silver hadn't stood for me. And, Doctor, believe this. I can die. And I dare say I deserve it. But what I fear is torture. If they come to torture me... Jim, the doctor interrupted, and his voice was quite changed. Jim, I can't have this. Whip over and we'll run for it. Doctor, said I, I pass my word. I know, I know, he cried. We can't help that, Jim, now. I'll take it on my shoulders, holus bolus, blame and shame, my boy, but stay here, I cannot let you. Jump. One jump and you're out, and we'll run for it like antelopes. No, I replied. You know right well you wouldn't do the thing yourself. Neither you nor squire nor captain, and no more will I. Silver trusted me. I passed my word, and back I go. But, doctor, you do not let me finish. If they come to torture me, I might let slip a word of where the ship is. For I got the ship, part by luck and part by risking. And she lies in North Inlet, on the southern beach, and just below high water. At half-tide she must be high and dry. The ship! exclaimed the doctor. Rapidly I described to him my adventures, and he heard me out in silence. There is a kind of fate in this, he observed when I had done. Every step... It's you that saves our lives. And do you suppose by any chance that we're going to let you lose yours? That would be a poor return, my boy. You found out the plot. You found Ben Gunn. The best deed that ever you did or will do, though you live to ninety. Oh, by Jupiter, and talking of Ben Gunn. Why, this is the mischief in person. Silver, he cried. Silver! I'll give you a piece of advice, he continued as the cook drew near again. Don't you be in any great hurry after that treasure. Why, sir, I do my possible, which that ain't, said Silver. I can only, asking your pardon, save my life and the boys by seeking for that treasure. You may lay to that. Well, Silver, replied the doctor, if that is so, 
I'll go one step further. Look out for squalls when you find it. Sir, said Silver, ask between man and man. That's too much and too little. What you're after? Why you left the blockhouse? Why you given me that there chart? I don't know now, do I? And yet I done your bidding with my eyes shut and never a word of hope. But no, this here's too much. If you won't tell me what you mean, plain out, just say so and I'll leave the helm. No, said the doctor musingly. I've no right to say more. It's not my secret, you see, Silver, or I'd give you my word, I'd tell it you. But I'll go so far with you as I dare go. And a step beyond, for I'll have my wig sorted by the captain, or I'm mistaken. And first, I'll give you a bit of hope, Silver. If we both get alive out of this wolf trap, I'll do my best to save you, short of perjury. Silver's face was radiant. You couldn't say more, I'm sure, sir. Not if you was my mother, he cried. Well, that's my first concession, added the doctor. My second is a piece of advice. Keep the boy close beside you, and when you need help, hello. I'm off to seek it for you, and that itself will show you if I speak at random. Goodbye, Jim. And Dr. Livesey shook hands with me through the stockade, nodded to Silver, and set off at a brisk pace into the wood. Chapter 31 The Treasure Hunt Flint's Pointer Jim, said Silver, when we were alone, if I saved your life, you saved mine, and I'll not forget it. I seen the doctor waving you to run for it, with the tail of my eye I did, and I seen you say no, as plain as hearing. Jim, that's one to you. This is the first glint of hope I had since the attack failed, and I owe it you. And now, Jim... We're to go in for this here treasure hunting, the sealed orders too, and I don't like it. And you and me must stick close, back to back like, and we'll save our necks in spite of fate and fortune. Just then a man hailed us from the fire, the breakfast was ready, and we were soon seated here and there about the sand over biscuit and fried junk. They lit a fire fit to roast an ox, and it was now grown so hot that they could only approach it from the windward. And even there, not without precaution. In the same wasteful spirit, they had cooked, I suppose, three times more than we could eat. And one of them, with an empty laugh, threw what was left into the fire, which blazed and roared again over this unusual fuel. I never in my life saw men so careless of the morrow. Hand to mouth is the only word that can describe their way of doing. And what with wasted food and sleeping sentries, Though they were bold enough for a brush and be done with it, I could see their entire unfitness for anything like a prolonged campaign. Even Silver, leading away with Captain Flint upon his shoulder, had not a word of blame for their recklessness. And this the more surprised me, for I thought he had never shown himself so cunning as he did then. Aye, mates, said he. It's lucky you have barbecue to think for you with his ear head. I got what I wanted, I did. Sure enough, they have the ship. Where they have it, I don't know yet, but once we hit the treasure, we'll have to jump about and find out. And then, mates, us that has the boats, I reckon, has the upper hand. Thus he kept running on, with his mouth full of the hot bacon. Thus he restored their hope and confidence, and, I more than suspect, repaired his own at the same time. As for hostage, he continued, that's his last talk, I guess, with them he loves so dear. I got my piece of news, and thank you to him for that, but it's over and done. I'll take him in a line when we go treasure hunting, for we'll keep him like so much gold in case of accidents, you mark. And in the meantime, once we got the ship and the treasure both, and off to sea like jolly companions, why then we'll talk Mr. Hawkins over, we will. And we'll give him his share, to be sure, for all his kindness. It was no wonder the men were in a good humor now. For my part, I was horribly cast down. Should the scheme he had now sketched prove feasible, 
Silver, already doubly a traitor, would not hesitate to adopt it. He had still a foot in either camp. And there was no doubt he would prefer wealth and freedom with the pirates to a bare escape from hanging, which was the best he had to hope on our side. Nay, and even if things so fell out that he was forced to keep his faith with Dr. Livesey, even then, what danger lay before us? What a moment that would be when the suspicions of his followers turned to certainty. And he and I should have to fight for dear life, he a cripple and I a boy, against five strong and active seamen. Add to this double apprehension the mystery that still hung over the behavior of my friends, their unexplained desertion of the stockade, their inexplicable session of the chart, or, harder still to understand, the doctor's last warning to Silver. Look out for squalls when you find it. And you will readily believe how little taste I found in my breakfast. And with how uneasy a heart I set forth behind my captors on the quest for treasure. We made a curious figure. Had anyone been there to see us? All in soiled sailor clothes, and all but me, armed to the teeth. Silver had two guns slung about him, one before and one behind, besides the great cutlass at his waist and a pistol in each pocket of his square-tailed coat. To complete his strange appearance, Captain Flint sat perched upon his shoulder and gabbling odds and ends of purposeless sea talk. I had a line about my waist and followed obediently after the sea cook, who held the loose end of the rope, now in his free hand, now between his powerful teeth. For all the world, I was led like a dancing bear. The other men were variously burdened, some carrying picks and shovels, for that had been the very first necessary they brought ashore from the Hispaniola, others laden with pork, bread and brandy for the midday meal. All the stores, I observed, came from our stock, and I could see the truth of Silver's words of the night before. Had he not struck a bargain with the doctor, he and his mutineers, deserted by the ship, must have been driven to subsist on clear water and the proceeds of their hunting. Water would have been little to their taste. A sailor is not usually a good shot. And besides all that, when they were so short of eatables, it was not likely that they'd be very flush with powder. Well, thus equipped, we all set out. Even the fellow with the broken head, who should certainly have kept in shadow and straggled, one after another, to the beach, where the two gigs awaited us. Even these bore trace of the drunken folly of the pirates, one in a broken thwart, and both in their muddy and unbailed condition. Both were to be carried along with us for the sake of safety, and so, with our numbers divided between them, we set forth upon the bosom of the anchorage. As we pulled over, there was some discussion on the chart, the Red Cross was, of course, far too large to be a guide, and the terms of the note on the back, as you will hear, admitted of some ambiguity. They ran, the reader may remember, thus. Tall tree, spyglass shoulder, bearing a point to the north of nor nor east. Skeleton Island, east-southeast and by east. Ten feet. A tall tree was thus the principal mark. Now, right before us, the anchorage was bounded by a plateau from two to three hundred feet high, adjoining on the north the sloping southern shoulder of the spyglass, and rising again towards the south, into the rough cliffy eminence called the Mizzenmast Hill. The top of the plateau was dotted thickly with pine trees of varying height. Every here and there, one of a different species rose forty or fifty feet clear above its neighbours, and which of these was the particular tall tree of Captain Flint could only be decided on the spot and by the readings of the compass. Yet, although that was the case, every man on board the boats had picked a favourite of his own ere we were halfway over. Long John alone shrugging his shoulders and bidding them wait till they were there. We pulled easily by Silver's directions, not to weary the hands prematurely, and after quite a long passage, landed at the mouth of the second river, that which runs down a woody cleft of the spyglass. Thence, bending to our left, we began to ascend the slope towards the plateau. At the first outset, 
heavy, miry ground and a matted, marish vegetation greatly delayed our progress. But by little and little, the hill began to steepen and become stony underfoot, and the wood to change its character and to grow in a more open order. It was indeed a most pleasant portion of the island that we were now approaching. A heavy scented broom and many flowering shrubs had almost taken the place of grass. Thickets of green nutmeg trees were dotted here and there, with the red columns and the broad shadow of the pines, and the first mingled their spice with the aroma of the others. The air besides was fresh and stirring, and this, under the sheer sunbeams, was a wonderful refreshment to our senses. The party spread itself abroad in a fan shape, shouting and leaping to and fro. About the centre, and a good way behind the rest, Silver and I followed, I tethered by my rope, he ploughing with deep pants among the sliding gravel. From time to time, indeed, I had to lend him a hand, or he must have missed his footing and fallen backward down the hill. We had thus proceeded for about half a mile, and were approaching the brow of the plateau, when the man upon the farthest left began to cry aloud as if in terror. Shout after shout came from him, and the others began to run in his direction. He can't have found the treasure, said old Morgan, hurrying past us from the right, for that's clean at top. Indeed, as we found when we also reached the spot, it was something very different. At the foot of a pretty big pine, and involved in a green creeper which had even partly lifted some of the smaller bones, a human skeleton lay, with a few shreds of clothing on the ground. I believe a chill struck for a moment to every heart. It was a seaman, said George Merry, who, bolder than the rest, had gone up close and was examining the rags of clothing. Leastways, this is good sea cloth. Aye, aye, said Silver. Like enough, you wouldn't look to find a bishop here, I reckon. But what sort of a way is that for bones to lie? Tainted nature. Indeed. On the second glance, it seemed impossible to fancy that the body was in a natural position. But for some disarray, the work perhaps of the birds that had fed upon him, or the slow-growing creeper that had gradually enveloped his remains, the man lay perfectly straight, his feet pointing in one direction, his hands raised above his head like a diver's, pointing directly in the opposite. I've taken a notion into my old numbskull, observed Silver. Here's the compass. There's the tip-top point of Skeleton Island sticking out like a tooth. Just take a bearing, will you, along the line of them bones. It was done. The body pointed straight in the direction of the island, and the compass read duly east, south, east, and by east. I thought so, cried the cook. This here is a pointer. Right up there is our line for the pool star and the jolly dollars. But by thunder, if it don't make me cold inside to think of Flint. This is one of his jokes, and no mistake. Him and these six was alone here. He killed them, every man. And this one, he hauled here and laid down by compass, shiver my tempers. They're long bones, and the hair's been yellow. Aye, that would be Allardyce. You mind Allardyce, Tom Morgan? Aye, aye, returned Morgan. I mind him. He owed me money, he did, and took my knife ashore with him. Speaking of knives, said another, why don't we find Isn lying around? Flint weren't the man to pick a seaman's pocket, and the birds, I guess, would leave it be. By the powers, and that's true, cried Silver. There ain't a thing left here, said Mary still feeling round among the bones. Not a copper dolt nor a backy box. They don't look natural to me. No, by gum, it don't, agreed Silver. Not natural, nor not nice, says you. Great guns, Miss Mates, but if Flint was living, this would be a hot spot for you and me. Six they were, and six are we. And bones is what they are now. I saw him dead with these here deadlights, said Morgan. Billy took me in. There he laid with penny pieces on his eyes. 
dead? Aye, sure enough, he's dead and gone below, said the fellow with the bandage. But if ever spirit walked, it would be Flint's. Dear heart, but he died bad, dear Flint. Aye, that he did, observed another. Now he raged, and now he hollered for the rum, and now he sang. Fifteen men were his only song mates. And I tell you true, I never rightly liked to hear it since. It was main hot, and the windy was open, and I hear that old song coming out as clear as clear, and the death hall on the man already. Come, come, said Silver, stow this talk. He's dead and he don't walk, that I know. Leastways he won't walk by day, and you may lay to that. Care killed a cat. Fetch a head for the doubloons. We started, certainly. But in spite of the hot sun and the staring daylight, the pirates no longer ran separate and shouting through the wood, but kept side by side and spoke with bated breath. The terror of the dead buccaneer had fallen on their spirits. Chapter 32 The Treasure Hunt The Voice Among the Trees Partly from the damping influence of this alarm, partly to rest silver in the sick folk, the whole party sat down as soon as they'd gained the brow of the ascent. The plateau being somewhat tilted towards the west, this spot on which we'd paused commanded a wide prospect on either hand. Before us, over the treetops, we beheld the Cape of the Woods, fringed with surf. Behind, we not only looked down upon the anchorage and skeleton island, but saw, clear across the spit and the eastern lowlands, a great field of open sea upon the east. Sheer above us rose the spyglass, here dotted with single pines, there black with precipices. There was no sound but that of the distant breakers, mounting from all around and the chirp of countless insects in the brush. Not a man, not a sail upon the sea. The very largeness of the view increased the sense of solitude. Silver, as he sat, took certain bearings with his compass. There are three tall trees, said he, about in the right line from Skeleton Island. Spyglass shoulder, I take it, means that lower point there. It's child's play to find the stuff now. I've half a mind to dine first. I don't feel sharp, growled Morgan. Thinking of Flint, I think it were, has done me. Ah, well, my son, you praise your stars, he's dead, said Silver. He was an ugly devil, cried a third pirate with a shudder. That blew in the face, too. That was how the rum took him, added Mary. Blue. Well, I reckon he was blue. That's a true word. Ever since they'd found the skeleton and got upon this train of thought, they'd spoken lower and lower, and they'd almost got to whispering by now, so that the sound of their talk hardly interrupted the silence of the wood. All of a sudden, out of the middle of the trees in front of us, a thin, high, trembling voice struck up the well-known air and words. Fifteen men on the dead man's chest. Yo ho ho and a bottle of rum. I've never seen men more dreadfully affected than the pirates. The colour went from their six faces like enchantment. Some leapt to their feet, some clawed hold of others. Morgan groveled on the ground. It's flint by cried Mary. The song had stopped as suddenly as it began. Broken off, you would have said, in the middle of a note, as though someone had laid his hand upon the singer's mouth. Coming so far through the clear, sunny atmosphere among the green treetops, I thought it had sounded airily and sweetly, and the effect on my companions was the stranger. Come, said Silver, struggling with his ashen lips to get the word out. This won't do. <laughs> Stand by to go about. This is a rum start, and I can't name the voice, but it's someone skylarking. Someone that's flesh and blood, and you may lay to that. His courage had come back as he spoke, and some of the colour to his face along with it. 
Already the others had begun to lend an ear to this encouragement and were coming a little to themselves, when the same voice broke out again, not this time singing, but in a faint, distant hail that echoed yet fainter among the clefts of the spyglass. Darby McGraw! It wailed, for that is the word that best describes the sound. Darby McGraw! Darby McGraw! Again and again and again, and then rising a little higher and with an oath that I leave out. Fetch off the rum, Darby! The buccaneers remained rooted to the ground, their eyes starting from their heads. Long after the voice had died away, they still stared in silence, dreadfully before them. That fixes it, gasped one. Let's go! They was his last words, moaned Morgan. His last words above board. Dick had his Bible out and was praying volubly. He'd been well brought up, had Dick, before he came to sea and fell among bad companions. Still, Silver was unconquered. They could hear his teeth rattle in his head, but he had not yet surrendered. Nobody in this here island ever heard of Darby, he muttered. Not one but us that's here. And then, making a great effort, Shipmates, he cried, I'm here to get that stuff, and I'll not be beat by man or devil. I never was feared of Flint in his life, and by the powers I'll face him dead. There's seven hundred thousand pound, not a quarter of a mile from here. When did ever a gentleman of fortune show his stern to that much dollars for a boozy old seaman with a blue mug, and him dead too? But there was no sign of reawakening courage in his followers, rather indeed of growing terror at the irreverence of his words. Delay there, John, said Mary. Don't you cross a spirit. And the rest were all too terrified to reply. They would have run away severally had they dared, but fear kept them together and kept them close by John, as if his daring helped them. He, on his part, had pretty well fought his weakness down. Spirit? Well, maybe, he said. But there's one thing not clear to me. There was an echo. Now, no man ever seen a spirit with a shadow. Well then, what's he doing with an echo to him, I should like to know. That ain't in nature, surely. This argument seemed weak enough to me, but you can never tell what will affect the superstitious. And to my wonder, George Merry was greatly relieved. Well, that's so, he said. You've a head upon your shoulders, John, and no mistake. About shipmates. This here crew is on a wrong tack, I do believe. And come to think on it, it was like Flint's voice, I grant you. But not so clear a way like it, after all. It was like a somebody else's voice now. It was like a... By the powers, Ben Gunn, roared Silver. Aye, and so it were, cried Morgan, springing on his knees. Ben Gunn it were. It don't make much odds, do it, now? asked Dick. Ben Gunn's not here in the body any more than Flint. But the older hands greeted this remark with scorn. Why, nobody minds Ben Gunn, said Mary. Dead or alive, nobody minds him. It was extraordinary how their spirits had returned and how the natural colour had revived in their faces. Soon they were chatting together with intervals of listening and not long after, hearing no further sound, they shouldered the tools and set forth again. Mary walking first, with Silver's compass to keep them on the right line with Skeleton Island. He had said the truth. Dead or alive, nobody minded Ben Gunn. Dick alone still held his Bible and looked around him as he went with fearful glances. But he found no sympathy, and Silver even joked him on his precautions. I told you, said he, I told you you'd spoiled your Bible. If it ain't no good to swear by, what do you suppose a spirit would give for it? Not that. And he snapped his big fingers, halting a moment on his crutch. But Dick was not to be comforted. Indeed, it was soon plain to me that the lad was falling sick. Hastened by heat, exhaustion, and the shock of his alarm, the fever predicted by Dr. Livesey was evidently growing swiftly higher. 
It was fine, open walking here, upon the summit. Our way lay a little downhill, for as I've said, the plateau tilted towards the west. The pines, great and small, grew wide apart. And even between the clumps of nutmeg and azalea, wide open spaces baked in the hot sunshine. Striking as we did pretty near northwest across the island, we drew on the one hand ever nearer under the shoulders of the spyglass, and on the other looked ever wider over that western bay where I had once tossed and trembled in the corco. The first of the tall trees was reached, and by the bearings proved the wrong one. So with the second. The third rose nearly 200 feet in the air, above a clump of underwood, a giant of a vegetable, with a red column as big as a cottage, and a wide shadow around, in which a company could have manoeuvred. It was conspicuous, far to see, both on the east and west, and might have been entered as a sailing mark upon the chart. But it was not its size that now impressed my companions. It was the knowledge that 700,000 pounds in gold lay somewhere buried below its spreading shadow. The thought of the money as they drew nearer swallowed up their previous terrors. Their eyes burned in their heads, their feet grew speedier and lighter. Their whole soul was bound up in that fortune, that whole lifetime of extravagance and pleasure that lay waiting there for each of them. Silver hobbled, grunting on his crutch. His nostrils stood out and quivered. He cursed like a madman when the flies settled on his hot and shiny countenance. He plucked furiously at the line that held me to him, and from time to time turned his eyes on me with a deadly look. Certainly he took no pains to hide his thoughts, and certainly I read them like print. In the immediate nearness of the gold, all else had been forgotten. His promise and the doctor's warning were both things of the past. And I could not doubt that he hoped to seize upon the treasure, find and board the Hispaniola under cover of night, cut every honest throat about that island, and sail away as he had first intended, laden with crimes and riches. Shaken as I was with these alarms, it was hard for me to keep up with the rapid pace of the treasure hunters. Now and again I stumbled, and it was then that Silver plucked so roughly at the rope and launched at me his murderous glances. Dick, who had dropped behind us and now brought up the rear, was babbling to himself both prayers and curses as his fever kept rising. This also added to my wretchedness, and to crown all, I was haunted by the thought of the tragedy that had once been acted on that plateau, when that ungodly buccaneer with the blue face, he who died at Savannah singing and shouting for drink, had there, with his own hand, cut down his six accomplices. This grove, that was now so peaceful, must then have rung with cries, I thought. And even with the thought, I could believe I heard it ringing still. We were now at the margin of the thicket. As our mates all together, shouted Mary, and the foremost broke into a run. And suddenly, not ten yards further, we beheld them stop. A low cry arose. Silver doubled his pace, digging away with the foot of his crutch like one possessed, and the next moment he and I had come also to a dead halt. Before us was a great excavation, not very recent, for the sides had fallen in, and grass had sprouted on the bottom. In this were the shaft of a pick, broken in two, and the boards of several packing cases strewn around. On one of these boards I saw, branded with a hot iron, the name Walrus, the name of Flint's ship. All was clear to probation. Their cash had been found and rifled. The 700,000 pounds were gone. Chapter 33, The Fall of a Chieftain. There never was such an overturn in this world. Each of these six men was as though he had been struck. But with Silver, the blow passed almost instantly. Every thought of his soul had been set full stretch like a racer on that money. Well, he was brought up in a single second dead. And he kept his head, found his temper, and changed his plan before the others had had time to realize the disappointment. 
Jim, he whispered, take that and stand by for trouble. And he passed me a double-barreled pistol. At the same time, he began quietly moving northward, and in a few steps had put the hollow between us two and the other five. Then he looked at me and nodded, as much as to say, here is a narrow corner, as indeed I thought it was. His looks were not quite friendly, and I was so revolted at these constant changes that I could not forbear whispering, so you've changed sides again. There was no time left for him to answer him. The buccaneers, with oaths and cries, began to leap one after another into the pit and to dig with their fingers, throwing the boards aside as they did so. Morgan found a piece of gold. He held it up with a perfect spout of oaths. It was a two-guinea piece, and it went from hand to hand among them for a quarter of a minute. Two guineas, roared Mary, shaking it at silver. That's your 700,000 pounds, is it? You're the man for bargains, ain't you? You're him that never bungled nothing, you wooden-headed lubber. Dig away, boys, said Silver, with the coolest insolence. You'll find some pig nuts, and I shouldn't wonder. Pig nuts, repeated Mary in a scream. Mates, did you hear that? I tell you now, that man there knew it all along. Look in the face of him and you'll see it rode there. Ah, Mary, remarked Silver. Stand in for captain again. You're a pushy lad, to be sure. By this time, everyone was entirely in Mary's favour. They began to scramble out of the excavation, darting furious glances behind them. One thing I observed, which looked well for us, they all got out on the opposite side from Silver. Well, there we stood, two on one side, five on the other, the pit between us, and nobody screwed up high enough to offer the first blow. Silver never moved. He watched them, very upright on his crutch, and looked as cool as ever I saw him. He was brave and no mistake. At last, Mary seemed to think a speech might help matters. Mates, says he, there's two of them alone there. One's the old cripple that brought us all here and blundered us down to this. The other's that cub that I mean to have the heart of. Now, mates, he was raising his arm and his voice and plainly meant to lead a charge. But just then, crack, crack, crack. Three musket shots flashed out of the thicket. Mary tumbled head foremost into the excavation. The man with the bandage spun round like a Tito Tum and fell all his length upon his side, where he lay dead but still twitching. And the other three turned and ran for it with all their might. Before you could wink, Long John had fired two barrels of a pistol into the struggling Mary. And as the man rolled up his eyes at him in the last agony, George, said he, I reckon I settled you. At the same moment, the doctor, Gray, and Ben Gunn joined us with smoking muskets from among the nutmeg trees. Forward, cried the doctor. Double quick, my lads. We must head them off the boats. And we set off at a great pace, sometimes plunging through the bushes to the chest. I tell you what Silver was anxious to keep up with us. The work that man went through, leaping on his crutch till the muscles of his chest were fit to burst, was work no sound man ever equaled. And so thinks the doctor. As it was, he was already thirty yards behind us, and on the verge of strangling, when we reached the brow of the slope. Doctor, he hailed, see there, no hurry. Sure enough, there was no hurry. In a more open part of the plateau, we could see the three survivors still running in the same direction as they'd started, right for Mizzenmast Hill. We were already between them and the boats. So we four sat down to breathe, while Long John, mopping his face, came slowly up with us. Thank you kindly, Doctor, says he. You came in about the nick, I guess, for me and Hawkins. And so it's you, Ben Gunn, he added. Well, you're a nice one, to be sure. I'm Ben Gunn, I am, replied the Maroon, wriggling like an eel in his embarrassment. And, he added, after a long pause, I'll do, Mr. Silver. Pretty well, I thank you, says you. <laughs> ben, Ben, murmured Silver, to think as you've done me. 
The doctor sent back Gray for one of the pickaxes, deserted in their flight by the mutineers, and then, as we proceeded leisurely downhill to where the boats were lying, related in a few words what had taken place. It was a story that profoundly interested Silver. And Ben Gunn, the half-idiot maroon, was the hero from beginning to end. Ben, in his long, lonely wanderings about the island, had found the skeleton. It was he that had rifled it. He'd found the treasure. He had dug it up. It was the shaft of his pickaxe that lay broken in the excavation. He had carried it on his back in many weary journeys from the foot of the tall pine to a cave he had on the two-pointed hill at the northeast angle of the island. And there it had lain, stored in safety since two months before the arrival of the Hispaniola. When the doctor had burned this secret from him on the afternoon of the attack, and when next morning he saw the anchorage deserted, he had gone to Silver, given him the chart, which was now useless, given him the stores, for Ben Gunn's cave was well supplied with goat's meat salted by himself, given anything and everything to get a chance of moving in safety from the stockade to the two-pointed hill, there to be clear of malaria, and to keep a guard upon the money. As for you, Jim, he said, it went against my heart, but I did what I thought best for those who had stood by their duty. And if you were not one of these, whose fault was it? That morning, finding that I was to be involved in the horrid disappointment prepared for the mutineers, he had run all the way to the cave and, leaving the squire to guard the captain, had taken Gray and the maroon and started making the diagonal across the island to be at hand beside the pine. Soon, however, he saw that our party had the start of him, and Ben Gunn, being fleet of foot, had been dispatched in front to do his best alone. Then it had occurred to him to work upon the superstitions of his former shipmates. And he was so far successful that Gray and the Doctor had come up and were already ambushed before the arrival of the treasure hunters. Ah, said Silver, it were fortunate for me that I had Hawkins here. You would have let old John be cut to bits and never given it a thought, Doctor. Not a thought, replied Dr. Livesey cheerily. And by this time we had reached the gigs. The Doctor, with the pickaxe, demolished one of them. And then we all got aboard the other and set out to go round by sea for North Inlet. This was a run of eight or nine miles. Silver, though he was almost killed already with fatigue, was set to an oar like the rest of us, and we were soon skimming swiftly over a smooth sea. Soon we passed out of the straits and doubled the southeast corner of the island, round which, four days ago, we had towed the Hispaniola. As we passed the two-pointed hill, we could see the black mouth of Ben Gunn's cave and a figure standing by it, leaning on a musket. It was the squire, and we waved a handkerchief and gave him three cheers, in which the voice of Silver joined as heartily as any. Three miles farther, just inside the mouth of North Inlet, what should we meet but the Hispaniola, cruising by herself? The last flood had lifted her, and had there been much wind or a strong tide current, as in the southern anchorage, we should never have found her more, or found her stranded beyond help. As it was, there was little amiss beyond the wreck of the mainsail. Another anchor was got ready, and dropped in a fathom and a half of water. We all pulled round again to Rum Cove, the nearest point for Ben Gunn's treasure house, and then Gray, single-handed, returned with the gig to the Hispaniola where he was to pass the night on guard. A gentle slope ran up from the beach to the entrance of the cave. At the top, the squire met us. To me, he was cordial and kind, saying nothing of my escapade, either in the way of blame or praise. At Silver's polite salute, he somewhat flushed. John Silver, he said, you're a prodigious villain and imposter, a monstrous imposter, sir. I am told I am not to prosecute you. Well then, I will not. But the dead men, sir, hang about your neck like millstones. Thank you kindly, sir, replied Long John, again saluting. I dare you to thank me, cried the squire. It is a gross dereliction of my duty. Stand back. And thereupon, we all entered the cave. It was a large, airy place 
with a little spring and a pool of clear water overhung with ferns. The floor was sand. Before a big fire lay Captain Smollett, and in a far corner, only duskily flickered over by the blaze, I beheld great heaps of coin and quadrilaterals built of bars of gold. That was Flint's treasure that we had come so far to seek and that had cost already the lives of 17 men from the Hispaniola. How many it had cost in the amassing, what blood and sorrow, what good ships scuttled on the deep, what brave men walking the plank blindfold, what shot of cannon, what shame and lies and cruelty perhaps no man alive could tell. Yet there were still three upon that island, Silver and Old Morgan and Ben Gunn, who had each taken his share in these crimes, as each had hoped in vain to share in the reward. Come in, Jim, said the captain. You're a good boy in your line, Jim, but I don't think you and me'll go to sea again. You're too much of the born favorite for me. Is that you, John Silver? What brings you here, man? Come back to do my duty, sir, returned Silver. Ah, said the captain, and that was all he said. What a supper I had at that night, with all my friends around me. And what a meal it was, with Ben Gunn's salted goat, and some delicacies, and a bottle of old wine from Hispaniola. Never, I'm sure, were people gayer or happier. And there was Silver, sitting back almost out of the firelight, but eating heartily, prompt to spring forward when anything was wanted, even joining quietly in our laughter, the same bland, polite, obsequious scene of the voyage out. Chapter 34 And Last the next morning, we fell early to work, for the transportation of this great mass of gold, near a mile by land to the beach, and then three miles by boat to the Hispaniola, was a considerable task for so small a number of workmen. The three fellows still abroad upon the island did not really trouble us. A single sentry on the shoulder of the hill was sufficient to ensure us against any sudden onslaught, and we thought besides, they'd had more than enough of fighting. Therefore the work was pushed on briskly. Gray and Ben Gunn came and went with the boat, while the rest, during their absences, piled treasure on the beach. Two of the bars, slung on a rope's end, made a good load for a grown man, one that he was glad to walk slowly with. For my part, as I was not much use at carrying, I was kept busy all day in the cave, packing the minted money into bread bags. It was a strange collection, like Billy Bones's hoard for the diversity of coinage, but so much larger and so much more varied that I think I never had more pleasure than in sorting them. English, French, Spanish, Portuguese, Georges and Louises, doubloons and double guineas and moidores and sequins, the pictures of all the kings of Europe for the last hundred years, strange oriental pieces, stamped with what looked like wisps of string or bits of spider's web, round pieces and square pieces, and pieces bored through their middle as if to wear them round your neck. Nearly every variety of money in the world must, I think, have found a place in that collection. And for number, I'm sure they were like autumn leaves, so that my back ached with stooping and my fingers with sorting them out. Day after day this work went on. By every evening, a fortune had been stowed aboard. But there was another fortune waiting for the morrow. And all this time, we heard nothing of the three surviving mutineers. At last, I think it was on the third night, the doctor and I were strolling on the shoulder of the hill where it overlooks the lowlands of the isle, when, from out of the thick darkness below, the wind brought us a noise between shrieking and singing. It was only a snatch that reached our ears, followed by the former silence. Heaven forgive them, said the doctor. It is the mutineers. All drunk, sir, struck in the voice of Silver from behind us. Silver, I should say, was allowed his entire liberty, and in spite of daily rebuffs, seemed to regard himself once more as quite a privileged and friendly dependent. 
Indeed, it was remarkable how well he bore these slights, and with what unwearying politeness he kept on trying to ingratiate himself with all. Yet I think none treated him better than a dog, unless it was Ben Gunn, who was still terribly afraid of his old quartermaster, or myself, who had really something to thank him for. Although for that matter, I suppose, I had reason to think even worse of him than anybody else, for I had seen him meditating a fresh treachery upon the plateau. Accordingly, it was pretty gruffly that the doctor answered him. Drunk or raving, said he. Right you were, sir, replied Silver, and precious little odds which to you and me. I suppose you would hardly ask me to call you a humane man, returned the doctor with a sneer, and so my feelings may surprise you, Master Silver. But if I was sure they were raving, as I'm morally certain one at least of them is down with fever, I should leave this camp and, at whatever risk to my own carcass, take them the assistance of my skill. Ask your pardon, sir. You will be very wrong, quoth Silver. You would lose your precious life, and you may lay to that. I'm on your side now, hand and glove, and I shouldn't wish for to see the party weakened, let alone yourself, as seeing as I know what I owe you. But these men down there, they couldn't keep their word. No, not supposing they wished to. And what's more, they couldn't believe as you could. No, said the doctor. You're the man to keep your word. We know that. Well, that was about the last news we had of the three pirates. Only once we heard a gunshot a great way off and supposed them to be hunting. A council was held and it was decided that we must desert them on the island. To the huge glee, I must say, of Ben Gunn, and with the strong approval of Gray. We left a good stock of powder and shot, the bulk of the salt goat, a few medicines, and some other necessaries, tools, clothing, a spare sail, a fathom or two of rope, and, by the particular desire of the doctor, a handsome present of tobacco. That was about our last doing on the island. Before that, we had got the treasure stowed, and had shipped enough water and the remainder of the goat meat in case of any distress. And at last, one fine morning, we weighed anchor, which was about all that we could manage, and stood out of North Inlet, the same colours flying that the captain had flown and fought under at the Palisade. The three fellows must have been watching us closer than we thought for, as we soon had proved. For coming through the narrows, we had to lie very near the southern point, and there we saw all three of them, kneeling together on a spit of sand, with their arms raised in supplication. It went to all our hearts, I think, to leave them in that wretched state. But we could not risk another mutiny, and to take them home with a gibbet would have been a cruel sort of kindness. The doctor hailed them, and told them of the stores we had left, and where they were to find them. But they continued to call us by name, and appealed to us, for God's sake, to be merciful and not leave them to die in such a place. At last, seeing the ship still bore on her course and was now swiftly drawing out of earshot, one of them, I know not which it was, leapt to his feet with a hoarse cry, whipped his musket to his shoulder and sent a shot whistling over Silver's head and through the mainsail. After that, we kept under cover of the bulwarks, and when next I looked out, they had disappeared from the spit and the spit itself had almost melted out of sight in the growing distance. That was at least the end of that. And before noon, to my inexpressible joy, the highest rock of Treasure Island had sunk into the blue round of sea. We were so short of men that everyone on board had a bare hand. Only the captain, lying on a mattress in the stern and giving his orders, for though greatly recovered, he was still in want of quiet. We laid her ahead for the nearest port in Spanish America, for we could not risk the voyage home without fresh hands. And as it was, what with baffling winds and a couple of fresh gales, we were all worn out before we reached it. It was just at sundown when we cast anchor in a most beautiful landlocked gulf, and were immediately surrounded by shore boats full of Negroes and Mexican Indians and half-bloods selling fruits and vegetables and offering to dive for bits of money. 
the sight of so many good-humoured faces, especially the blacks, the taste of the tropical fruits, and above all the lights that began to shine in the town, made a most charming contrast to our dark and bloody sojourn on the island. And the doctor and the squire, taking me along with them, went ashore to pass the early part of the night. Here they met the captain of an English man-of-war, fell in talk with him, went on board his ship, and in short, had so agreeable a time, that day was breaking when we came alongside the Hispaniola. Ben Gunn was on deck alone, and as soon as we came on board, he began with wonderful contortions to make us a confession. Silver was gone. The Maroon had connived at his escape in a shore boat some hours ago, and he now assured us he had only done so to preserve our lives, which would certainly have been forfeit if that man with one leg had stayed aboard. But this was not all. The sea cook had not gone empty-handed. He had cut through a bulkhead unobserved and had removed one of the sacks of coin worth perhaps three or four hundred guineas to help him on his further wanderings. I think we were all pleased to be so cheaply quit of him. Well, to make a long story short, we got a few hands on board, made a good cruise home, and the Hispaniola reached Bristol just as Mr. Blandley was beginning to think of fitting out her consort. Five men only, those who had sailed returned with her. Drink and the devil had done for the rest with a vengeance. Although, to be sure, we were not quite in so bad a case as that other ship they sang about. With one man of her crew alive, what put to sea with seventy-five? All of us had an ample share of the treasure, and used it wisely or foolishly, according to our natures. Captain Smollett is now retired from the sea, Gray not only saved his money, but being suddenly smit with the desire to rise, also studied his profession, and he is now mate and part owner of a fine full-rigged ship, married besides, and the father of a family. As for Ben Gunn, he got a thousand pounds, which he spent or lost in three weeks, or to be more exact, in nineteen days, for he was back begging on the twentieth. Then he was given a lodge to keep exactly as he had feared upon the island, and he still lives a great favourite, though something of a butt with the country boys, and a notable singer in church on Sundays and saints' days. Of silver we've heard no more. That formidable seafaring man with one leg has at last gone clean out of my life. But I dare say he met his old negress, and perhaps still lives in comfort with her and Captain Flint. It is to be hoped so, I suppose, for his chances of comfort in another world are very small. The bar silver and the arms still lie for all that I know where Flint buried them, and certainly they shall lie there for me. Oxen and wain ropes would not bring me back again to that cursed island. And the worst dreams that ever I have are when I hear the surf booming about its coasts, or start upright in bed with the sharp voice of Captain Flint still ringing in my ears. Pieces of eight! Pieces of eight! Audible hopes you've enjoyed this program.